You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Attention shoppers, Mason's Department Store will close in 10 minutes. This is your last chance for all red tag items in four minutes. Here you are, ma'am. Thank you. Who's next? Just these things, please. One child's bathrobe, pajamas, and a pair of slippers. Will that be all? Yes, thank you. And how would you like to pay? Um, how much does it come to? With tax, your total is $57.63. Oh, is that the sale price? Let me see. Children's wear... Uh, yes, that department's on markdown. The slippers, too? Where did you find them? On the clearance table. There's a red tag. Very good. That'll be an additional 40% off. I I'll just adjust the total. Oh, that's better. Every little bit counts, doesn't it? Children grow so fast. If that's all... Christy? Christy, where are you? Here, Mommy. Time to go, darling. Mommy, look! What have you got there? A dolly. My, isn't she cute? She's the best doll in the whole world. Yeah, well, you better put it back now. Daddy's waiting. Can I have her, please? Uh, you already have a doll. Not like this one. Her name's Tina. Is it? Listen. My name is Talkie Tina, and I love you very much. Oh, please, Mommy. She wants to go home with me. She said so. Maybe next time. But she wants to go now. Uh, shall I add the doll? Well, no, I don't think so. My name is Talkie Tina, and I want to go home with you. See? What will they think of next, hmm? Excuse me. I'm in line here, too, you know? I'm sorry. Just a second. Will that be cash, ma'am? She's just like a real little girl. Aren't you, Tina? My name is Talkie Tina, and you're my new best friend. Oh, for the love of... I'll have someone restock it for you. Will you accept a charge? Certainly. Here's my card. If you'll just sign here, Mrs. Streeter. All right. I'll put everything in one bag. Would you like to carry it, honey? Oh, yes, Mommy. Thank you. Who's next? Well, it's about time. Do you have any more Shake Me Bake Me sets? Oh, I'm afraid not, sir. They sold out this morning. Well, come on. I only came out because of your advertisement. But I, I can give you a rain check. I don't want a rain check. I drove 15 miles to get a Shake Me Bake Me toy kitchen for my daughter, and I'm not going to leave without one. If you'd like to speak to the supervisor, I... You bet I would. I can't believe this. Come along, honey. We're holding up the line. My name is Talkie Tina, and we're going to be... We will, I promise. Yeah, as long as your daddy doesn't find out. Come on, Tina. We're going home. Meet Talkie Tina, the doll that does everything. A lifelike creation of molded plastic with a beautiful painted smile. For an only child named Christy, she's a brand new playmate. For her father, however... This particular doll is about to become a most unwelcome addition to the family. But don't worry, because without Talkie Tina, chances are he would never find his way into the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Living Doll, starring Tim Kazarinski, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. This is where we live, Tina. See? Put her back in the bag with your other things. But Tina wants to see her new house. Just until we get inside. Okay. Come on, Tina. Honey? Yes, Mommy? Why don't you run upstairs with your doll? That way she can see your room. Can't Tina meet Daddy first? No, not yet. He's very busy today, remember? Okay. And a grand total for one month. Oh, I can't believe it. Eric? Hi. Oh, sorry we took so long. It doesn't matter. I'm still working on the taxes. Oh, did you make yourself lunch? Not yet. What'd you buy? 
Oh, nothing much. Just a couple of things Christy needed. Mmm, what kind of things? Uh, go on upstairs, darling. Yes, Mommy. Come on, Tina. Wait a minute. Christy? What do you got there? It's nothing, Eric. No? <laughs> it's just a doll. A doll, huh? Show Daddy, honey. Her name's Tina. She doesn't need another doll. She fell in love with it. What was I supposed to do? Her birthday's not for months. I thought we agreed. She's only a child. She's just like a real live girl, Daddy. For heaven's sake, Annabelle. A doll like that costs... <laughs> it was on sale. Oh, so that means we can afford it, huh? What was it, free? I put it on the account. Tina does everything, don't you, Tina? Her arms move and her eyes open. Watch. She sees you, Daddy, and she can even talk. My name is Talkie Tina, and I love you very much. You have to admit it's adorable. <laughs> See? I just love her already. My name is Talkie Tina, and I want to go home with you. <laughs> Isn't she cute? All right, all right, how much? Well, not that much. I know, it was on sale, you charged it. How much? Eric, that's enough. Christy, go to your room, please. Yes, Mommy. My name is Talkie Tina, and you're my new best friend. Christy, hold on. What, Daddy? Let me see that doll for a minute. Eric, please. Hey, I've been doing the income and expenses while you were out. And now I have to write a check to the IRS. I can almost cover it if we don't go to the movies or eat out for a month. This is hardly the time to talk about... I asked you a question, Annabelle. How much did it cost me? You? I earn the money around here, don't I? I don't think it's the price of the doll that's upsetting you. Uh, here it comes. Here what comes? Some more of that Freudian gibberish you've been getting from her doctor. It is not Dr. Lubin's fault that she feels rejected. My name is Talkie Tina, and I love you very much. Will you shut that thing off? Her name's Tina. Don't yell at her. Give it to me. Daddy, please. She's my dolly. Not until I decide if she's going to stay. Mommy. Go on. It'll be all right. I promise. <laughs> Eric, how could you? <sighs> what would you suggest I do? Start printing money? Charge accounts have to be paid, you know. We'll talk about this later. After you've had a chance to think about what you've just done to that little girl. More toys. More of everything for Christy. That's what she needs. Another doll. One that talks. My name is Talkie Tina, and I don't think I like you. What? My name is Talkie Tina, and I think I could even hate you. What kind of doll is this? Get out of here! What do you say now, huh? You all broken up about it? <laughs> My name is Talkie Tina. You'll be sorry. Why, you... Eric? Yeah? Did you just throw something? What if I did? You broke the base. So I'll get you another one. <sighs> just tell me why. I don't like what it says. The doll? You might be interested to know it has quite a vocabulary. Listen. My name is Talkie Tina, and I love you very much. I suppose that offends you in some way. That's not what it said a minute ago. Eric, I don't know how much more of this I can take. Oh, and exactly what is it you're taking? Your anger toward Christy. I know you're having a difficult time adjusting to her, but I can't let you treat her this way. She's my daughter, Eric. I love her. Oh, you love her, but I don't love her. I'm only your stepfather. I'm incapable of loving children because I can't have any of my own. That's what you're saying, isn't it? No, Eric, believe me, it's not. You could love Christy. I know you could if you'd only give yourself half a chance. Good. Then I'm not the cold, cruel ogre mommy and daughter think I am. Whew. I can't tell you how much I appreciate your faith in me. Eric, please, give us a chance. Christy and me. I know you got more than you bargained for when you married me. Two for the price of one. But we'll do anything to make you happy. Both of us. Daddy? Honey, just a minute. I'm sorry, Daddy. What? I'm sorry if I made you mad. Oh, Christy, I, I wasn't mad at you. Do you understand that? Sure, Daddy. Oh, there you are, Tina. No, 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 don't do that. Why? My name is Talkie Tina, and I 
love you very much. Why not, Daddy? Uh, nothing, uh, nothing at all. Come on, Tina. Let's go upstairs. Almost finished, Christy? Almost, Mommy. We are. Aren't we, Tina? Eat your vegetables so we can have dessert. What kind? Hmm? Tina wants to know what kind of dessert. Oh, your favorite, banana cream pie. Mmm. Be a good girl, Tina, and eat your supper. You eat your own supper, Christy. I am, Daddy. <laughs> I didn't know your doll could laugh. Oh, Daddy, Tina can do everything. Well, tell her not to do it at the table. What's the matter, Eric? Forget it. I didn't hear anybody laugh. Really? I thought I... Uh... You thought what? N nothing. Where'd you buy her? Mason's. It seemed like a good idea. Mm, did it? She'll be a good playmate for Christy. Lacking a brother or sister. Is that what you mean? I didn't say that. But it's what you meant. It's why you bought the doll, isn't it? So I'd have a reminder? It hadn't occurred to me, but if that's what you think... Give me your plate, Christy. Yes, Mommy. Here's Tina's, too. She ate all her food. Did she? Who's that? I'm sure I don't know. Who do you think it is, Tina? Well, stop talking to her like that. It's only a doll. No, she's not, Daddy. She's my new best friend. Can Christy come out and play? Hear that, Tina? It's Linda. Goody! Don't you want your dessert first? Later, Mommy. Can I take Tina? Not outside. But she wants to meet Linda. Well, Linda can meet her later. Okay. How about you? Uh, what? Do you want some dessert? Oh, sure. That'd be fine. Well, I'll bring you a piece of pie. Yeah, you do that. Hey, nobody pulled your string. And I'm beginning to hate you. Yeah? Well, my name's Eric Streeter. And you know what? I think I'm going to get rid of you after all. You wouldn't dare. Wouldn't I? Just watch. Don't pick me up. This is my chair. No, it's not. It's Christie's high chair. Or it was until she grew out of it. But you'll never grow because you're just a piece of plastic. Got that? What's the matter? Cat got your tongue? My name is Talkie Tina, and I think you're a very bad man. My name is Talkie Tina, and I think... Shut up, you little wretch. Here's your pie. Thanks. What are you doing? Just seeing how it works. I thought you didn't like it. I don't, but it's pretty clever for a toy. Is there any coffee? Yeah, in the kitchen. I'll get it. You're nothing, understand? A kid's toy. I could twist your arm off or your leg. Ow! Don't tell me you have feelings, too. Doesn't everything? Oh, I see. Then I could hurt you. Not really. We'll see about that. But I could hurt you. <laughs> Tell me another one. Threats from a doll. Who are you talking to? Well, who do you think? Eric, please be careful with Christie's doll. Here, you can have it. I don't want it. I only meant... It means a lot to her. The game's over. The game? Oh, come on now. How dense do you think I am? I wish I knew what you were talking about. <laughs> Some invention, this thing. I guess I haven't kept up with the times. They must be doing great things with technology now. I didn't know they were putting walkie-talkies in dolls. Walkie-talkies? Voice chips, whatever they are. But there's hardly any technology to it. You've seen these before. Just a, a string that goes into the back of the doll, you pull it, and it plays a little record inside. Come off it, Annabelle. Didn't you think I'd catch on? Catch on to what? Well, all that stuff about hating me and the last bit about feelings. Doesn't everything. That was a nice touch. You should be a regular ventriloquist. Really, Eric, I don't know what... <laughs> Linda wants to see Tina. Can I? Can she, please? All right, dear. My name is Talkie Tina, and I love you very much. <laughs> 
I told you. She's so sweet. You can both play with Tina tomorrow after school, if Linda would like to come over. Oh, yes, Mrs. Streeter. That would be so neat. Oh, come on, Linda. It's the ice cream man. <laughs> that doll is sweeter, right? Especially with a speaker inside. What is it, one of those little transistor receivers? <laughs> think whatever you want, but it isn't true. It doesn't matter what I think. It's what I hear that counts. I have ears. I'm not stupid, you know. I didn't say you are. You don't have to. Nobody's playing tricks on you. Go ahead. Keep it up. I know you got a microphone around here somewhere. You and Christy are getting even with me. Isn't that right? That's ridiculous, Eric, and you know it. Is it? I notice the doll never talks when you're in the room. Of course it does. It just did. Yeah, yeah, the pre-recorded line, sure, but not what it says to me. You're really serious. Sure I am. So tell me, how do you do it? There's nothing to tell. All right, don't tell me. Keep your secret. Play your little games. But I promise you one thing. Keep this up and you'll be sorry. Christy? Christy? My name is Talkie Tina, and you'd better put me down. Or what? What are you going to do about it, huh? Christy's not around to help you, and neither is her mommy. You'll be sorry. Nah, you're the one who's going to be sorry, starting right now. What are you doing? What I should have done the first time you mouthed up. Put you where you belong. In the trash with the rest of the garbage. Where's Tina? I wouldn't know. You had her, Daddy. Go ask your mother. She's already asked me. And what did you tell her? That I don't know where she is. Then I guess that settles it. Do you know, Eric? No, would I? Where is she, Daddy? If your mother can't tell you, neither can I. Tina must be around, Christy. Let's find her. I'll look in the kitchen. What do you think you're doing? Trying to read the evening paper. Is that all right with you? She's not in here. I'll help you look. You should be ashamed of yourself. About what? If anything's happened to her doll... Hello? My name is Talkie Tina, and I'm going to kill you. Say that again. You heard me. How did you get out? Wouldn't you like to know? Who is this? Hello? Hello? Not there. Then where? Annabelle? Annabelle? Yes? Where is she? She's still looking. I'm not talking about Christy! We haven't found the doll, if that's what you mean. That's exactly what I mean. You knew I put it in the trash can outside. You and now what? And now it's gone! Which means somebody took it. More games? Oh, Eric, I can't bear this. Neither can I! I am tired of... I'm tired of all this nonsense. A, a joke's a joke, but you've carried it too far. I have? You and Christy. Will the two of you stop it? <sighs> Eric, I didn't touch the doll. I haven't seen it since dinner. Am I, am I supposed to believe you? I swear. You're telling the truth? Of course I am. You really didn't take it? I didn't take it. Then who? The phone call. What phone call? You were on the extension. You said... What are you talking about now? Didn't you do that either? Do what? No. Of course it couldn't have been you. How could you make the phone ring? You couldn't even call unless it was from an outside line. But you were in the house the whole time. I didn't hear the phone ring. There must be an explanation. Some electronic device that taps into the line. Eric? The phone rang. I answered it. The doll's voice was loud and clear. It said, My name is Talkie Tina, and I'm going to kill you. What? That's what it said. Why would I lie? Oh, Eric, I don't know what to say. 
or what to think. Well, one way or another, the dolls disappeared. If you didn't take it, that leaves Christy. Eric? Christy! Christy, are you awake? Did you... I told you you'd be sorry. Get away from her. Get out of her bed and out of this house. Tina? I'll be back. And when I do, I'll have some questions for you, little girl. Christy, wake up! Daddy? Stay where you are, Christy. I want Tina. Don't worry about that thing. I have to borrow it for a while. But she's mine. Lie back down. Tina belongs to me. Daddy? Daddy? What's happening? Daddy, please! Where are you going with her doll? To do what I should have done. Daddy! Get one thing straight, Christy. I am not your daddy. There, there. He won't hurt her. Tina! Tina! Know where you are now, baby doll? Where? Take a look around, if those eyes of yours can even see. Welcome to my workroom. You don't scare me. This is a garage. Right, and this is my workbench. And these, these are my tools. What kind of tools? Well, let's see what we have here. Know what this is, doll face? A vice. That's what. What are you going to do? What does it look like? I'm going to put your cute little head in it and crack you open like a ripe tomato. You can try. We'll see about that. You better stop. Yeah? Or what? Get ready to die. Don't say I didn't warn you. You're the one who's going to die. <laughs> How's this? What's the matter? Can't finish the job? A big, strong man like you? <clears throat> Why won't it close any tighter? I want to see those plastic eyes of yours pop out of your head. You can't hurt me. I thought you said you had feelings. I can stand it if you can. Mm, something else, then. How about a torch? That's it. A little butane. This will raise your temperature. You'll melt like a rubber band on a hot stove. All we need is a spark to light it. Now we turn the nozzle till we get a nice blue flame. <clears throat> no problem. Just give it a spark one more time. Ah, that's okay. Third time's the charm. Ah, the lighter's empty. <laughs> You're funny. We're wasting time. Time for the big guns. How about a table saw? Diamond tip blade? That'll do the trick. Cuts right through solid steel. <clears throat> now, you lay there. Go on, close your eyes, because this is the last thing you'll ever see. I'll make it a clean cut. Straight through that little pink throat. Say your prayers. Why won't it cut? Why? Eric? Get away from me. What are you doing? Only what I have to. Eric, no. Give me that doll. Leave me alone. So I can't cut you. But you're still done for. You don't stand a chance. Now what, you funny man? Try this on for size. I got a burlap bag somewhere and some rope. Yes! You know what people do with kittens, don't you? Well, let me show you. Say they don't want them around anymore, because they're always in the way. They put them in a sack, and they tie it up real tight. Lots of rope, and they make a knot that nobody can untie. There. Then they cut the rope with a pocket knife, and they take the sack outside and put it in the trash can. Only this time... They put a cinder block on top of the lid to make sure it stays put. Now let me see you get out of that. <laughs> ha, 
What are you doing? What does it look like? You're packing your suitcase. But why? Are you joking? No, I'm not joking. I'm asking you a simple question. I think I deserve an answer. Think about it, Eric. How could I go on living with you after what you've done? Well, I, I had to. Had to? You had to show your hatred for me and for Christy? It's over with. Things will be better now. You'll see. Oh, will they? Listen, Annabelle, that doll... What about that doll, Eric? It's a toy, nothing more. One that means a great deal to her. And you've destroyed it. That was a hateful thing to do. She'll never forgive you, and neither will I. The doll talked to me. It said things that no toy would say. Don't you see? I had to get rid of it. Yeah, I see a great many things now. You've become a stranger to me. A sick, neurotic stranger. You're full of blind, unreasonable hate. Hate? But I did it for us. I love you and Christy. Well, then you've got a strange way of showing it. I don't believe you know what love is anymore. And you're suffering from some very dangerous delusions. You'd better find a good psychiatrist. Delusions? I couldn't have imagined it. You tell that psychiatrist you tried to kill a doll. I, I couldn't have. What did you do with it, by the way? So I can get the remains out of this house before Christy finds what's left. It's still in one piece. I I'll bring the doll inside if that's what you want. I'll give it to Christy myself. How magnanimous of you. Will that make everything right? I don't know, Eric. I honestly don't know. I want things to be right between us. All three of us. It's a little late for that, don't you think? Just let me try. Give me one minute. That's all I'm asking. Oh, Eric. Eric! There. The trash can. Cinder block on top. Same as I left it. No problem. Cut the rope off. Oh, thank God. Good as new. My name is Talkie Tina, and I don't forgive you. Shut up. Shut up. Just until we get inside. Christy, are you awake? Yes. Oh, Christy, honey, listen to me. Where's my dolly? Daddy's bringing her. You'll see. He was mean to her. Oh, honey, he couldn't help it. Sometimes Daddy gets mad. It's not your fault. Why doesn't he like her? He's got a lot on his mind. You know how hard he works, but he's going to be better now. He's going to see a doctor, and this doctor's going to make him well again. Promise? We just have to be patient with him. Dry your eyes now. Christy, look what I've got. Tina! Did you miss her? Well, now she can sleep with you, right next to your pillow, all night long. Is that okay? Oh, Tina, Tina! Thank you, Eric. Uh, satisfied? Yeah, we'll talk about it in the morning. But I, but I did what you wanted. In the morning. Did you hear that? Oh, what is it now? I heard something. Well, I didn't hear anything. Go back to sleep. Well, I haven't been to sleep yet. Oh, Eric, it's late. Now, you heard that, didn't you? It's nothing. Somebody could be in the house. Did you lock up? Of course I did. But somebody could have broken in. It's probably Christy. I'd better see if she's all right. I'll go. No, you stay here. Christy? Christy? Mm. Oh, you're okay. Good, that's good. But, but where's your doll? Tina. Where is it? What? Who's there? Somebody's downstairs. I'm calling the police. Do you hear me? Eric? Shh. Stay there. I'm going downstairs to check it out. What is it? I'm not sure. If I don't come right back, call the police. Maybe I left the door to the garage unlocked. Yeah, that's it. Don't turn on the lights yet. Catch them red-handed. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh. 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 You. <laughs> Hello. What are you? Eric. Oh, don't 
try to move. It was the doll. The doll. I tell you, get it, get it out. Lie still. I'll call the doctor. Out of the house. Do like for me. My neck's broken. You have to promise to get rid of it. No. Eric! My name is Talky Tina. <gasps> you! Get, a get away from him! You'd better be very, very nice to me. No! No! <laughs> of course, we all know that dolls can't talk. Not really. Nor can they lie in wait and trip a man on a dark stairway, because that would be murder. And that's one thing no doll can do. That is, unless her name is Tina, and she happens to have been manufactured in the Twilight Zone. Living Doll, starring Tim Kazarinski with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Jerry Saul. Heard in the cast were Meg Falcon, Christian Stolte, Deb Dotzer, Amy Sparrow, and Paul Patch. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Entry. Fourteenth day, sixth month, year four, I think. Kind of runs together after a while. Got up this morning, same as always. Big deal, huh? I even made my bed. See, it's strictly the honor system up here. Yeah, one more day scratched off the old calendar. First thing I did was, let's see, I made a pot of coffee. That's what they call this stuff. Uh. Next, some breakfast. Fake bacon and eggs. Hear that? Mm-hmm. Kind of makes your mouth water, doesn't it? Got to watch the calories, though. Putting on some pounds around the middle. That's bad for the ticker. Psst. Wouldn't want to check out before my time. I make it 46 more years, give or take a few. Anyway, welcome to my world. At least I'll have something to play back later. Otherwise, I wouldn't have anybody to listen to. Because this way, I know I'm dealing with a higher-class individual. Corey, you did it again. My compliments to the chef. Now, well, let's go outside and take a look around. Don't mind if I do. This is my backyard. And my front yard. It's all my yard now. No footprints in the sand except mine. I never even locked the door. Why should I? Nobody comes calling. Not even a lizard. Just miles and miles of nothing. Anyway, be back in a while. Time to go to work. I got a 1947 pickup truck out there. Been restoring it for years. Gives me something to do, like a hobby, you know? Alan B., he brings me parts a little bit at a time. Wonder how he's gonna get the long block here. Now that's gotta weigh more than a few pounds. Bye for now. This is Corey, signing off. Welcome to the world of Mr. James A. Corey. A shack, a shed, and a yard made up of sand and scrub that stretches to infinity. His work? 
an old truck cobbled together from junkyard parts. He takes his time, for there is a ritual to loneliness. Twice a day, Corey leaves his shack, goes over to his vehicle in progress, and makes a few minor adjustments. Then he sits in the front seat, stares through the windshield that isn't there, and perhaps succumbs to a wishful daydream that he is at the wheel of a moving car, and the car is on a highway and there is some place to go. But this will have to remain a dream, because where this man is, there are no highways, no places to go, and no people to see. For the record, let it be known that James A. Corey is a convicted criminal placed in solitary confinement. And it matters very little that his confinement stretches as far as the eye can see. His sentence is the kind of isolation that can destroy a human mind. It is an exile far worse than a dungeon at the ends of the earth. Because he has been banished to a place well beyond the earth. In just a moment, Mr. Corey will discover that he may not be alone for the rest of his life after all. And with that discovery will come the requisite spark of hope. But a spark is all it takes to fire a man's imagination in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Lonely, starring Mike Starr with Stacy Keach as your narrator. There she is, dead ahead. Got it, Captain. Prepare for planetfall. All systems check. Sir? What is it, Carstairs? I got a question for you. How can we still call it planetfall if it's only an asteroid? <laughs> That's a good one. Well, call it whatever you like, off the record. But we're on the record now. This isn't a training mission. Set the coordinates. Yes, sir. The surface is coming up mighty fast. I don't know how you can tell one sand dune from another. By doing this every four months, year after year, that's how. Corey's shack is just over the rise. I don't see... It's right there. Fire retro rockets. Decreasing speed. Ready to nose up. Nose up. 40 degrees. 60. Keep pulling. 75. 80. 88. 90 degrees, sir. Now angle her down. Tail first. Piece of cake, Captain. What are the numbers? 0400 hours, Earth time. Fuel, 0.87 capacity. Cutting in a little close, sir. Ah, oh, those meteors on the way out. We lost some precious time. Corey won't be very happy. He's not supposed to be happy, is he? You don't know him the way I do, Adams. He waits for these deliveries like a kid on Christmas. Always wants to hear how things are back home. What the women look like, how the world has changed. I'm the only contact he's got. I didn't stop here. I think he'd go stir-crazy. What'd he do, anyway? He stopped caring, that's what. After he lost his wife. Yeah? And he got in a fight. Some say it wasn't his fault. The guy died, and he ended up here. They don't have room for any more criminals back home. The new regime, huh? I read about that. Uh, but he's had a lot of time to think. Nothing to do here but think. Prepare to set her down. I want a three-point landing this time. Yes, sir. Telfin's ready. We're going in. Entry, 15th day, 6th month, year 4. <laughs> I'm even measuring time by this place now. I go on every day like the day before and the day before that. The weeks, the months. But I can't give in. I have to stick it out. There'll be a supply drop coming soon, I think. They're overdue. I hope it's Allenby's ship. Because he's a decent man and he brings me things. Like he sneaked the parts for that antique out there. Few pieces at a time, as much as he could carry. Thank God for that truck and the hours it used up. I can look at it out there and know it's real. And reality is what I need. Because what else is left that I can believe in? The desert? The wind? Myself? Here's a thought. Maybe I'll end up like that truck. Inanimate. Nothing but an object sitting in the sand. I wonder if I'd still feel the loneliness. Would I feel anything? Hey! That's it! The ship! Hear that diary? 
Now I don't have to talk to you. I've got somebody else. Besides myself. Be back later. Hey! Hey! How you doing, Allenby? Corey, how are you? All right. Corey, I, uh... Well, don't just stand there. Come on inside. It's hotter than blazes. What a place you got here. Glad you like it. I didn't say I liked it. I think it stinks. And I guess you think I don't? I don't know what you think. Hey, take it easy, Adams. Well, you don't have to live here now, do you? No. But I've got to come back here four times a year. And that's eight months out of 12, Corey, away from Earth. Sometimes my kids don't even recognize me when I get home. I'm sorry. I'll bet you are. Come on, fellas. Have some coffee. I got some clean cups. That's all right. <clears throat> uh, Corey. Wait, what am I thinking? Let me pour you a real drink. Thanks, Corey. It's real nice of you. Not right now, Carstairs. If you say so, Captain. Hey, this isn't so bad, huh? I like the way you set it up in here. Sure, sure. I have what I need. Most of it anyway. Thanks to the captain there. Yep, you got it made. This is Corey's kingdom, and it never changes. Sit down, everybody. How about a little poker? Four-handed draw, jacks to open. Who's in? Uh, we don't have much of a layover this time. All right, no openers. Joke is wild. Uh, there was some trouble on the way, and we lost time. Deuce is wild. How's that? A blackjack. Anybody want to play blackjack? You can count to 21, can't you, Adams? Listen to this guy. Look, we've only got 15 minutes, guys. So what? Nobody's checking your schedule out here. What's the big deal? I'm sorry, Corey. This isn't an arbitrary decision. If we delay our departure by more than 15 minutes, that places us in a different orbital position. We'd never make it back to Earth on the fuel we've got. We'd have to stay at least 14 days before we're in position again. So? Why not hang out here? I've got some beer put away. I can turn up the generator and get it cold. We'll sit around, talk. It's just not possible. Oh, it's a few lousy days. A few hours, even. A couple of card games, at least. How about you guys? What's the matter? Think I'll murder you or something over a bad hand? Not this time, Corey. All right, all right. Three or four minutes gone already. Better get going. I wouldn't want to foul up your schedule. Not for a lousy game of cards or a few bottles of crummy beer. How's your water supply? Don't worry about it. I got plenty. Well, I'll have a cupful then, if you can spare it. Sure. We've got some fresh on board. I'll have the men bring it over. You do that. Brush a few more things, too. I, uh... Thought you could use them. Thanks. Any news? Not yet. But I told you last time, there's been some pressure back home about this kind of punishment. A lot of people think it's unnecessarily cruel. Well, who knows what'll happen the next couple of years. Well, they may change their minds, rewrite the law, bring you back to a prison on Earth like the old days. Allenby, I have to tell you something. Every morning, every morning when I get up, I tell myself that this is the last time. That I won't be able to live another day alone. Not another day. And by noon, when I can't keep still anymore and the inside of my mouth feels like gunpowder and burnt copper and deep down in my gut, I've got an ache that won't go away and it starts to spread through my body, tearing little chunks out of me. Then I think that I've got to hold out for one more day. Just one more day. But I can't keep doing that forever. You hear me? I swear I'll lose my mind. You're breaking my heart. What do you know about it? That's enough. Let him go. Why should I? What do I have to lose? I said... Take your hands off me, you nutcase. Watch your mouth. Corey. He shouldn't worry about losing his mind. Look at him. He's already lost it. Back off, Adams. Now you and Carstairs go back to the ship and get the supplies. Yes, sir. Go on. Do as I tell you. And the big crate. The one with the red tag. Handle that one gently. How about using the truck out there? Some of the stuff's pretty heavy. It's not running today. <laughs> it isn't, huh? What's the matter, Corey? Out of gas? Lots of places to go around here. There's the country club past the mound over there. And the seashore over that way. And the drive through restaurant. That's around here someplace, isn't it? Knock it off, Adams. Get the supplies. I'm going. I brought you some parts for the truck, eh? set of coil springs. I got some magazines, too. Strictly on my own. 
Some old vintage movies, science fiction. Uh, you'll get a kick out of them. I'm sure I will. I brought you something else. Yeah. It would mean my job if they found out. Look, Alan B., I don't want your gifts. I don't want your tidbits. Makes me feel like an animal in a cage and there's a nice old lady out there who wants to throw peanuts at me. Alan B., I only got one question. What about the pardon? I'm afraid you're still out of luck. That's what I figured. The new regime, huh? The sentence reads 50 years. And they're not even reviewing cases of homicide. Allenby, take a look out there. What do you see? This is 90% of the view I'm going to have for the rest of my life. Did it ever cross your mind? Because it crosses mine every hour of every day. Unfortunately, we don't make the rules. All we do is deliver the supplies and pass on information. Because you're out of position for radio contact. Yeah. That's why they picked this place. Look, Allenby, a pardon. That's the only information I want. I'm not a murderer. I know. It was self-defense. A lot of people believe me, and it happens to be the truth. I killed in self-defense. I remember, Corey. Then why am I here? I doubt if it'll be much consolation to you, but this kind of assignment isn't easy. Stopping here four times a year, having to look at a man suffering? You're right. It's not much consolation. Here they come. I can't bring you freedom, Corey. All I can do, all I can do is try to bring you things to help you keep your sanity. You want this big crate opened up, Captain? Not yet. Stay there, I'll be right out. Okay, I'll bite. What's the big box? You can open it after we're gone. If it's 20 years supply of puzzles, you can take them with you. When I want a problem to solve, all I have to do is look in the mirror. We've got to go now. Did you hear what I said, Corey? Wait till we're gone to open it. And this is important. When you open up the crate, there's nothing you need to do. The item has been vacuum packed. It needs no activator of any kind. The air will do that. There'll be a booklet inside that'll answer any of your questions. You're being awfully mysterious. I don't mean to be. It's just like I told you, though. I'm risking a lot to bring it here. They don't know what it is. So I'd appreciate it if you wait till we get out of sight. No problem. Give my regards to... to Broadway. And every place else while you're at it. Sure, Corey. I'll see you. Allenby! Yes? I don't much care what it is. But for the thought, Allenby, for the, the decency of it, I thank you. You're quite welcome, Corey. Have a good trip! Two minutes, Captain. Go ahead and fire up the rockets. Yes, sir. Cap, just man to man. What did you bring him? What's in the box? I'm not sure, really. Maybe it's an illusion, or maybe it's salvation. Open the hatch. Let's get out of here. What? You are now the proud owner of an XB-1 robot. This model represents the latest in modern technology. Do not think of it as a machine. For all intents and purposes, it functions as a highly sophisticated simulacrum of a human being. Mm. Hello. My name's Alicia. What's yours? Hold on a minute here. Don't I speak clearly enough? No, no, no. You sound fine. Fine. What is this, then? Both physiologically and psychologically, she is comparable to a living human with a full set of emotions, a writable memory track, and the ability to reason and to speak. She is immune to organic illness and under normal circumstances should have a lifespan similar to that of a human being. Caution must be taken against exposure to excessive heat and moisture. She comes complete with a loose-fitting microfiber garment for general use. Would you answer my question, please? What question? What's your name? Um, Corey. My name's Corey. I like that name. Good. Glad to hear it. Now, if you don't mind, what are you doing? What is this place? This is mine. My place. Yours? Where I live. Alone. Alan B. must think I'm pretty far gone. Hey, 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 don't move that. It's my cup. I've still got some water left. Water? 
Do you like water, Cory? Yeah, I like it. Leave it, I told you. Would you like some more water? No, that's okay. Not right now. Very well. Where is your place? Where? On an asteroid, all right? Asteroid. I know that word. 6,000 miles north to south, 4,000 east to west. It's got atmosphere, gravity, the works. Now, why don't you just, just... What, Corey? Stop saying my name! Get out! I don't want some machine in here! I'm not a machine. I'm an XB-1. Go on! Get out! Corey? 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 Blasted coil springs. What's wrong, Corey? Nothing, all right? I brought you some water. Where shall I put it? Just leave it. But it will get warm on the sand. It won't taste as good. You know that, huh? What it tastes like? I can feel thirst. Yeah? What else can you feel? I don't understand. Can you feel heat and cold? The wind? Yes. How about pain? Can you feel pain? That, too. How? How can you? You're a machine. Excuse me. A different kind of machine. Yes. Of course you are. So why didn't they build you to look like a machine? Why aren't you made of metal with nuts and bolts sticking out of you? With wires and electrodes. Would you prefer that? You know, I might. Because then you wouldn't be a lie. A lie? Why do they cover you with stuff that looks like flesh? Why even give you a face in the first place? A face that if I look at it long enough, it almost makes me think... Makes me believe that... Believe what? Stop asking me stupid questions. I didn't mean to. Look at me. Don't hang your head. Corey. Turn that face up. I'm talking to you. Corey, please. Don't give me any of that phony stuff. Somebody program it into you? Why? What's the point? To mock me? I'm not mocking you, Corey. Yes, you are. Every time you talk to me, every time you look at me, like right now, I'm being mocked. You hurt me, Corey. Hurt you? How could I hurt you? This arm, it isn't real. Please, let go of me. There aren't any nerves under there. There aren't any tendons or muscles. There isn't any flesh and blood. But you don't even know what I'm talking about, do you? What are you doing? Oh, just what do you think? I'm looking for the right tool for the job, and you know what that job is? No. I'm going to turn you back into parts the way you should have been in the first place. Maybe I can use some of them in the truck. Corey, that's a hammer. That's right. That's what it is. You know what you are? You're like this broken down heap of iron set in here. Exactly like it. You're just a hunk of metal and plastic and, and, and God knows what with arms and legs instead of wheels. That heap doesn't mock me the way you do doesn't look at me with make-believe eyes and talk to me with a make-believe voice. No. Well, listen, you... you machine. I'm sick of being mocked by some kind of ghost, by the memory of what a woman looks like. Well, I don't need it. I've got enough memories. I don't have to be reminded of anything. And that's all you are. Nothing but a reminder that... that I'm so lonely I'm about to lose my mind. That's right. Close your eyes if you want. I don't care. Corey... What are you... Oh, Corey. Are, are those tears? <laughs> yes. You can cry, too. <laughs> when I have reason. I, I, I can't stand to see that. But why? What are you crying for? <laughs> I'm frightened. Frightened of me? You can feel fear? Yes. The book said with a full set of emotions... What else can you feel? Sadness. You can? And happiness, joy, mystery, wonder, and other things. Such as? Loneliness. I don't believe it. Don't you? There you go again. Listen, it's hot out here. Yes, that's not good for me. We'll go back inside. All right. Yeah, better? Much better. In a little while, maybe we'll... We'll have some dinner or something, okay? 
That would be nice. And we can talk. If you wish. You like to talk, don't you? I mean, sit around, have conversations? Yes, Corey. What would you like to talk about? Anything. Tell me everything you know. Everything? I don't know very many things yet. You'll learn, Alicia. You'll learn. Here you go. Because it's only freeze-dried, but it isn't bad. Uh, you're not a vegetarian, are you? No, Corey. I hope you enjoy it. Me? This is for both of us. It smells wonderful. You haven't touched your wine. I'm fine, thank you. No, no, no. Go ahead. Drink up. I don't require food or drink, Corey. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, of course. What am I thinking? You should have let me prepare the meal. Why? You're not a slave. We're going to be partners from now on. You and me. No. But it means so much to you. I like to see that. It makes me feel happy. It does? Of course, I'm not a true human being as you are. I don't care. I don't care how you were born or made. You're flesh and blood to me. I need you, Alicia. Do you understand? And I need you, Corey. Okay. Now that we got that settled, let's drink up. Here's to us. From now on, we don't need anybody else. Yes, Corey. Drink up. <laughs> Alicia has been with me for 11 months now. Twice when Allenby brought the ship in with supplies, I've hidden her so the others wouldn't see. But each time, I've seen the question in Allenby's eyes. It's a question I have myself. And I don't have the answer. It's difficult to explain the sum total of this relationship. It's strange, all right. Man and machine. But it's also man and woman. There are times when even I know that Alicia is simply an extension of me, a mirror of my needs. I hear my own words coming from her. The things she's learned to love are the things I love. Where do you want to store the magazines and books, Corey? Anywhere, Alicia. Anywhere you'd like. I think I've reached the point now where I won't analyze her any longer. I accept her as a part of my life, an integral part. I don't know how I ever got along without her. Because I'm not lonely anymore. Each day is something I can live with, something new. It's a gift. Nothing else matters. Because I love her. I've been trying to get up the courage to tell her. That's all for now. Alicia? Yes? I think I'll go outside and work on the truck for a while. Shall I go with you? That's all right. No, uh, wait. Why not? You can see how it's coming. Just don't stay in the sun too long. I won't. I haven't done much work on it lately, but it's going to get finished. And it'll be great, I promise. I believe you. Go on, get in the front seat. If you like. Right next to the driver. Are we going somewhere? We sure are. Let's see, uh, how about burgers and a movie? But we have the movies Allenby brought us. Haven't you ever been on a date? First, I pick you up. And we go to the movies, a drive-in. How about that? You don't even have to get out of your car. Then we go to a drive-in restaurant on the way home. We still don't have to get out of the car. Isn't that something? We order burgers and fries, maybe a chocolate shake. Then we drive home real slow. Home? You know, where we live. Where we really live. Where we belong. Mm, sounds wonderful. Sure it does. There's lots of places we could go. Take a drive out to the beach or... A cruise. So I can show off my girl. Would you show me off, Corey? You're darn right I would. Because you're beautiful. Alicia, something I've been wanting to tell you. Corey? Yeah. What star is that? You can't see stars in the daytime. I was going to tell you. But maybe it's a ship. The ship's not due for another month. What is... There. See it flash? It looks like silver. Wait a minute. 
It must be Allenby's. That's the only one that ever comes this close. Corey, what does it mean? I'll find out. You wait here. Just wait, all right? If you say so. Allenby? Hello, Corey. What are you doing here? Have some trouble? No, we had no trouble. What's the matter, Corey? Aren't you glad to see us? But you don't have a scheduled stop for another month. This is a scheduled stop. What are you talking about? We've got good news for you, Corey. Hold on. Let me tell him. Tell me what? Well, Corey... Forget it. Whatever it is, I'm not interested. <laughs> you better hear what it is first. You heard me, Alan B. I'm not interested. Don't you get it? I don't care what happens on Earth. Not anymore. You will this time. I guarantee it. Doesn't make any difference. It's worse. If we'd come back a month from now, I'd have been eating sand or something. I'll see you guys. Leave the supplies by the shack. Corey! Listen to me. It's this way, Corey. All the sentences have been reviewed. They've given you a pardon. We're not here to bring supplies. We're here to take you back home. What? But we've got to take off in exactly... 10 minutes. We can't wait any longer. We're almost out of fuel. Any more than 10 minutes, and the coordinates will be wrong, and then I don't think we'd ever make it. Wait a minute, Allenby. What did you just say? What did you say about... You heard me right. A pardon. It won't do any of us any good unless you pack your stuff and get ready to move, Corey. We've picked up seven men from other asteroids, and we've only got room for about 15 pounds of gear. So grab what you need and leave the rest of it behind. Such as it is. I don't even have 15 pounds of stuff. <laughs> I've got a shirt, a pencil, and a recordable diary. A pair of shoes? The truck you can leave here for the next poor devil. There won't be any next poor devil. There won't be any more exiles. You're the last. Right, we'll leave it here to Russ then. The farthest auto junkyard in the known universe. And Alicia and I will wave to it as we leave. We'll just look out of the porthole and throw it a kiss goodbye. The car, the shack, the salt beds, the sand dunes, the whole works. Alicia and I will just... Who? Who, Corey? Oh, my dear God. I forgot. Allenby, it's Alicia. You remember her. Is he out of his mind? Who's Alicia, Corey? <laughs> Who's Alicia? Adams, you idiot. You brought her here! You brought her in a box with a red tag on it! She's a woman! Well, a robot, technically. But closer to a woman. Much closer. She kept me alive. I swear to you, if it weren't for her... Corey, I don't know what to say. You worried about Alicia? You don't have to be. I tell you, she's just like a woman. And she's gentle and kind and... Without her, I tell you, I'd be finished. I'd have given up. The only reason you'd have to come back would be to bury me. That's what you wouldn't let us look at, huh, Captain? The crate. Sorry if I wasn't supposed to tell them. It doesn't matter now, Corey. But unfortunately, there's another problem. <laughs> problem? There are no problems left on heaven and earth. We'll pack up 15 pounds of stuff and we'll climb in that ship of yours and when we get back to that beautiful green earth, Fifteen pounds? Fifteen pounds? You've got to have room for more than that. Throw out some equipment. Alicia weighs more than fifteen pounds. That's the point, Corey. We're stripped now. We've got room for you and nothing else except that little recorder of yours and the pencil. You'll have to leave the robot here. Allenby, she's not just a robot. You leave it behind. That's murder. I'm sorry, Corey. No, you don't understand. You can't leave her. Alicia! Come here! You'll see. You'll see why you can't leave her. Alicia! Alicia! Where is she, Corey? I don't know. Look, just pack your gear and get out. Captain, we've only got a few more minutes. Come on, Corey. No! I'm not leaving without her. I told you that. I can't leave. This is our last trip. It's off the route now. That means no supplies. That means if you stay here, you die here. And if you make that choice, there'll be a day, Corey, when you'll pray for death to come quickly. I can't help it, Alan B. I can't leave her behind. 
And you won't take her. So that means I stay. Alicia! Come here, Alicia! Let them see you. Don't be afraid. Corey, listen to me. I saw this... this thing get crated, shoved into a box. It's a machine with servo motor and wires and circuits and batteries. She's a woman! Captain Allenby, we've got to take off. How about it, Captain? We better leave him. We can't do that. Sick, mad, or half alive, we've got to bring him back. Those are the orders. Corey, it isn't just you now, it's all of us. So we can't argue anymore, Corey. We have to take you one way or another. I'm sorry, Corey. Grab it. No, no, you don't. Alicia! Stop him. Corey! Come on, Corey. We'll carry you if we have to. There you are. Alicia, talk to them. Tell them you're a woman. Tell them... Corey, is it all right? You said to hide. What are they doing? Are they hurting you, Corey? I have no choice, Corey. No choice at all. Now, Alan B, I tell you, she's a human being. She's... Corey, I'm frightened. Corey! No! No. You see, Corey? There's nothing behind that face except wires and circuits and visual receptors. Alicia! Alicia! Corey? 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 Come along now. It's over. Yeah. It's over. It's gotta be now, Captain. Put it behind you, Corey, like a bad dream. When you wake up, you'll be on Earth. You'll be home. Home? That's right. All you're leaving behind is loneliness. I'll have to remember. Remember to, uh, keep that in mind. Let's go, Corey. Let's go home. Down below, on a microscopic piece of sand that floats through space, is a fragment of a man's life. Left to rust is the place he lived in and the machines he used. Without use, they will disintegrate from the wind and the sand and the years that act upon them. All of Mr. Corey's machines, including the one made in his image and kept alive by love, but now obsolete, in the twilight zone. <laughs> The Lonely, starring Mike Starr with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcheson and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Taylor Miller, Doug James, Carl Van Sickle, and Adam Blaine. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. In the beginning was the Word, and darkness, and light. I have trouble remembering light. Some of it shines through my eyelids, so I know it's there, but all I really see is darkness now. There are pinpoints of light, like holes in the fabric of space. I know they're out there, even if I can't quite see them. When will I? Time no longer has meaning, as if it has stopped for me, closing in, contracting, and I can't move, not a muscle. But in this moment, the mind continues, and I wait. Stansfield, Douglas, scanning vital signs. Life functions, check. Metabolism, stable. Temperature. Constant. No adjustments necessary. 
only the mind. The mind is memory, and I remember things. They remain through it all. There is more than just darkness, the void. The mind does work. I wonder if they know that. The images are constant, ever-present patterns to savor again and again. It's not just the long sleep that comes when the fear has left. It's a time to recollect, sift, and analyze. Try to understand all that's happened in this infinite moment. It may be said with a degree of assurance that not everything is as it appears. Case in point, the scene you're witnessing. You are not in a hospital. You are in the belly of a spaceship. It is currently en route to another galaxy located an incredible distance from the Earth. This is the crux of our story, the truth behind the mystery flight into deep space. For here, distances are so vast that they are marked in light years instead of miles, while a man's life ticks by in the blink of an eye. It is the story of events that might happen to human beings who, with the help of technology, dare to take a step beyond and are unable to anticipate all that awaits them out there. So fasten your safety belts because you're on a spaceship. You're already well on your way on a very long journey from one planet to another. And the vast region between is called the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Long Morrow, starring Kathy Garver with Stacy Keach as your narrator. The cold is felt, but without pain. The loss of feeling is noted and accepted as choice slips away. Now mind is all. Time is distorted, jumbled, telescoped, accordioned. But even so, there is a strong sense of time. And I remember. I remember how it began. I remember the way it was in the beginning. How am I doing? Heart rate 84, 88, 90, and holding. Speed five miles an hour. That's excellent, Commander. Let's see how long I can sustain it. Eh, that's enough treadmill. I can keep going for as long as you want. We know you can. Give it a rest, Commander. You're not a hamster in a cage. I can beat any hamster you've got. I'll bet. We prefer rabbits, though. Why don't you shower up and grab some lunch? What's the schedule this afternoon? Just some blood tests. Again? Uh, You know the routine. Check your cholesterol, blood sugar. Take any more blood and I'll dry up and float away. You know who Dracula was, Sherry? Yep, some guy who worked for NASA. Commander Stansfield to Dr. Pixler's lab. Commander Douglas Stansfield, report to the flight director's lab. Tell them I'm on my way. After you shower. Forget it. I didn't even break a sweat. Come in. Dr. Bixler? Hello, Commander. Glad to meet you, if somewhat belatedly. Please make yourself comfortable. Oh, thanks. A figure of speech, in the sense that there's no need to stand on ceremony. I'm sorry there are no comfortable chairs here. Oh, that's all right. I'd just as soon stand. Even after this morning's workout. But, of course, your cardiovascular rating is superb. So, this is where the commandments come from. Commandments? Mission directives. I've heard much of you, the mysterious Dr. Bixler. And I of you, and that's the reason you're here. I was wondering. I guess this all seems faintly ridiculous to you, the hush-hush aspect. Well, all NASA's projects are secret during the planning stages, but I've been here six months now. In the past, I knew what I was training for. Is there a reason I've been kept in the dark so long? Perhaps so you wouldn't hand in your resignation. (laughs) Not likely. I knew what I signed on for when I joined the agency. You knew some of it, what we've done up to now. I take it on faith. It's work I believe in. 
ever since I was a boy. You've been with us for 11 years. Is that a question, sir? More along the lines of an observation. Should you not have realized it, you've been the object of considerable observation over the past several months. I'm well aware of that, but if I may say so, I've never been the subject of so many tests. Not just physical, but psychological. There are reasons, Commander. Rather good reasons. What is it you have in mind for me? Or is that still hush-hush? This one is not official yet, or it wasn't until we knew we had the right man for the job. It's not part of the budget we submitted to Congress, but... I think we're about ready for a formal announcement. Of what? You've made 11 separate orbital flights. That's right. You orbited the moon, commanded a lunar landing, you're oldest of the astronauts, and you're also the most experienced and the most knowledgeable. I don't know about that. I do. Certainly if we count those who are still active. May I ask you a personal question? Why? You already know everything about me. Not quite. <clears throat> Why did you never marry? <laughs> well, that's easy. I never found someone who could put up with me. The months spent in training for a mission, the flight time. There's no woman in the world who could live with that. No, I suppose not. Though several of your fellow astronauts have families. They lucked out. I guess I just never met the right one. You dated in college. You were even engaged once. For about 15 minutes. <laughs> Once she found out the way I live, on call, at a moment's notice, well, you might say she came to her senses, very fortunately for her. Mm. When the space agency put me on this project, I was told to keep in mind the scientific problems, of which there are a great many, I can guarantee. I'm sure. But also to be aware of the human factor, and that's where you come in, Commander Stansfield. You're the human factor. May I ask you a question? By all means. How long are you going to keep me in suspense? Not much longer, I promise. You recognize this, don't you? A chart of the solar system. That's right. The sun, the earth down here, our neighbors, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and so forth, and the moons that orbit them. A lot of places I haven't been to yet. What do we know about our neighbors, Commander? More than we knew a few years ago. Oh, yes. Thanks to men like you. Nonetheless, what it boils down to is this. The moon is barren. Mars is a vast, scrubby desert with an unbreathable atmosphere. Venus and Jupiter, both gaseous and poisonous. Pluto and the outer planets are volcanic. In short, our neighbors have only one asset to offer us. They're accessible. They can be reached using current technology. Beyond that, they offer us nothing scientific, social, economic, by any standards. They're the Mount Everest of near space. You go to them because they're there. But the accomplishment is in the climb, and once climbed, there are no more challenges. So, where's the next Mount Everest, Doctor? That may be the wisest question you've ever asked, and the most pertinent. Why do you say that? Take a look at this chart. It's a star system in a galaxy well beyond our reach, to date seen only through the lens of a telescope. We know nothing of it with absolute certainty, except that there is a cluster of six planetary bodies. Where? Here. To the edge of the picture, the small, extremely bright object at the center is a sun, very similar to ours. It's flaming and gaseous and almost exactly the same color temperature. It provides heat and light for these five objects here. The ingredients of a solar system like ours, only a bit smaller. The planets run in roughly the same paths as we do around our own sun. Yes, yes, I see. The, the equivalent of our five inner planets. But the rest, you can tell all that? Our astrophysicists can. The distances bear approximately the same relationship to each other as Mercury, Venus, the Earth, Mars, and Jupiter. And given that relationship, this is the most likely system we've found yet that might support life. Are you telling me we've made contact? Not yet. The distances are too vast. Even if they've sent out an intelligent communication, it would take a very long time for it to reach us, assuming we could pick it up on our frequencies and decipher it. You and I would be dead and gone by then, or they would. There are too many variables. This system... 
does it have a name? Only a number. We've nicknamed it Soul 2 for purposes of identification, but for now, you can call it anything you want. For example, Stansfield's Everest. That's where I'm going. That's where you're going. When? In about a month. The ship is under construction now. It's off the drawing boards, and the keel, so to speak, is being laid. It must be the size of a skyscraper. Not necessary. It'll only carry a crew of one. One? That's because of the weight, the extra equipment on board. What kind of equipment? I'll get to that in a moment. For now, I believe the man who flies her should be right there while she's being built to watch every bolt, every rivet, every screw, every piece of metal and circuitry going into it. And that man is you, Commander. You'll be its pilot and its only occupant. You'll truly be the captain of your fate. Not that it matters at this point, but I want you to know... I like this assignment. I like it very much. That's not surprising, considering your profile. It's precisely why you've been chosen. I've put together a manual of projections and probabilities. I think you ought to see it. I'll read it tonight. There are the usual dangers, the usual unknowns. It was ever thus. No, Commander, it was never thus. How so? In the past, you've had... Meteor storms to contend with. You've had the usual calculated risks of mechanical failure, landing difficulties, ejection troubles, all the rest. Well, you'll still have those compounded. There's another factor here, another problem. Distance. Distance. In time and in space. How far? This cluster is approximately 141 light years away. But... That means the ship would have to... An ordinary ship. This one will have interstellar drive and an anti-gravity device. It'll be the fastest man-made object ever conceived and launched. Its speed will be like... like nothing ever dreamed of before. But in terms of the space you have to conquer, it might just as well be an ant crawling across the Sahara. <sighs> That's a high mountain, isn't it, Dr. Bixler? A very high mountain... The highest, the longest trip in the history of mankind. How long? Your trip there and back will take approximately 35 to 40 years. Well, at least it's a round trip. Consider it carefully, Commander. When you return from this trip, the Earth will have aged almost half a century... Oh, that's... that's something to contemplate, isn't it? I'll be 60, 70 years old. I'll have lived the better part of my life out in space. Alone. You'll have lived the better part of your life, but you'll not have aged. We intend to try something different. Also a risk, also decidedly calculated. That's where the extra equipment comes in. Freezing. An extension of cryonics, but considerably more complicated. It will be suspended animation in its purest form. We've developed a substance from the lymphoid tissue of hibernating animals, several antioxidant absorbents, and a collection of experimental drugs to slow down metabolism. The Earth will age, Commander, but you will not. You'll only be a few weeks older when you return. Sort of like... Sort of like dying... And then coming to life again. After a fashion, coming to life again in the sense that there'll be very few people here you'll know or who'll know you. Life will have changed in many ways, Commander, and you'll have to begin living it all over again as a stranger, as, as an anachronism, if you will. If you'll forgive this degree of candor, it's one assignment I don't envy very much. That's pretty much been the story of my life, Dr. Bixler. Assignments that not very many people would envy. When do I begin? You already have begun. If you're free this afternoon, I'd like to go over the preliminaries. Tomorrow, there's a chartered jet to the Cape where you'll begin your briefing and have a first look at the ship. Unless you care to reconsider. I'll be there. I'm on the payroll, aren't I? When I checked in, it was all the way. Good. That's good, my boy. Glad to have you aboard. A 
And so it began. That brief, unemotional, very matter-of-fact colloquy between scientist and subject. A small cast of two characters. That was the way it should have been. But I remember, I very clearly remember, the entrance of character number three. Will communications team B-8. Communications team B-8. Report to central control. B-8 to central control. Oh, excuse me. Oh, my fault. You've dropped your papers. Here, let me help you. Commander... Stansfield? Excuse me for staring, but I see your ID badge. Why, why you're, you're the one. I don't know whether to thank you for that or report you for insubordination. Forgive me. We've been hearing Stansfield, Stansfield, Stansfield for close to a year. I was beginning to think that you weren't real. Let me give you a hand. A friend in need. That's my job. Picking up papers? Oh, that's my new assignment. Morale officer. I follow people around who look stricken. Do I look stricken? Momentarily nonplussed. I don't think we've met. No, we haven't. That's what I was saying. You stationed permanently here? I'm with NASA, on detached duty. I've always wanted to meet you. And I you. Oh, no, that I don't believe. It's true. I've got ESP. A long time ago, I woke up and an inner voice told me, with some intensity, that I'd meet a woman with a stricken look who drops papers in corridors. Did your ESP give you the name? Hmm, let's see... It's coming to me. The first letter is an S. Sandra. Sandra Horn. How did you... Oh, of course. My name badge. (laughs) I didn't look at it, I swear. (laughs) Sure you didn't. Very subtle. It's been an honor meeting you. Strange. What is? Nothing. Tell me. It's, uh... It's not a line, I promise, but I do feel I've known you. I know. There was a a little girl in fourth grade. She sat in front of me. I used to stick pencils in her red hair. Tell me the truth. That was you, wasn't it? I went to an all-girls school. Oh. I don't suppose... Yes? I don't suppose uh, the National Space Agency could do without your services for, say, a couple of hours this evening. Long enough for a dinner? I think... Despite the fact that I'm invaluable and the whole space program rests on my shoulders, a two- or three-hour period might be carved out. I'm in the book, Commander. Please phone me. I won't phone. I'll pick you up. What kind of food do you like? Any kind. Partial to beef. Also seafood. No shellfish, though. Chinese, Italian, you name it. I'll plan the itinerary and the menu. See you at eight. Arrivederci, lady from the space agency. Eight o'clock, then, astronaut. Arrivederci to you, too. I stood there and watched her walk away. I thought we talked for an hour, not minutes. And I knew everything I needed to know about her, even then. The only time in my life it had ever happened to me. And now I return to these things, these simple things. Now in the darkness, in the cold, the solitude. The stillness without measure. I remember. Music. Colors. And a voice. How did you like the meal? Hmm? The food. Food? Oh, oh, it was wonderful, truly. But you've hardly touched it. Oh, yes, I have. I mean, I had a late lunch. I guess I'm not as hungry as I thought. Well, look at you. You haven't cleaned your plate either, mister. Oh, I was thinking. About what? Do you dance? 
Uh, no, not really. Neither do I. Never learned how. Oh, come on. I missed all the dances at school, even the prom. I don't believe that for one minute. Would I lie to you? I really don't know. You can teach me. What? Just the basic two-step or whatever they call it. You're asking the wrong person. Am I? Besides, they wouldn't let us dance in here. They wouldn't notice. A couple of duffers like us. Quick, don't look. How many people at the next table? I haven't noticed. My point exactly. They don't care about us either. Stand up. Oh, I couldn't. You're looking at me. Sorry. Something wrong? It's just that... A month from now, you'll be off in space. And by the time you come back down again... You want to talk about that now? Only for the following absurd reason. I've known you for exactly three and a half hours. Is that all it's been? That's all. Three and a half hours. A long dinner and a short dance. And already, already... Already what, Sandy? Already, I feel a sense of loss. My life had been in the military. Always first aircraft, then space vehicles. And it had been missions projects and expeditions. There was no time for another kind of life. Intrusions that took the form of a face, a voice, a short month lived by a man and a woman drawing closer and closer together and finally becoming a part of one another. There's so little time for such a thing, for such a small thing. And then what time we had ran out and slipped away. Rechecking fuel supply. Fuel supply? Check. Testing rockets. Mark it from five. Mark. Five, four, three, two, one. Calibrate fuel consumption. Fuel flow at point two five and holding. Check and double check. All systems go. T minus one twenty. Setting countdown, Dr. Bixler. Only two more hours. Where is he? He'll be here. Man, oh man, I sure wish I was him. Do you? Well, why not? That kind of adventure? All the way to another galaxy? Quite a price to pay. Oh, sure, it costs a fortune. But think of it. One man in the whole of history going out into space with... with a key, you could say. A key to unlock all the... the mystery. I'm beginning to think that not all mysteries are out there. One man, and for the right to have his adventure, our adventure, for the ritual of turning that key, he pays for it as no man has ever paid before, with all of his friends, his well-being, his sense of belonging, maybe even his sanity. Everything on Earth that has meaning for him will now be just a memory. And you envy him? I guess he is to be envied. I envy him too. But what I don't envy is his homecoming. Sandy? Hello, Doug. I thought we agreed. I know, but I had to see you. It only makes it harder. I wanted to give you something. A small, unofficial gesture from one of the lesser bureaucrats of our good gray, respectable government. Sandy. Unofficial, and very much apart from protocol. But I couldn't let you leave, Doug. Not without saying goodbye. Not without telling you that I loved you very much. That I shall sorely miss you. That my life, whatever is left of it, will be a strangely meaningless dull and empty place without you to share it. No. Shh, shh, shh. And this last paragraph. I wouldn't say this to you 
If I didn't know you were the kind of man you are, if I thought it would even remotely affect you, or at least what you plan to do, I wouldn't say any of this. But I know you. I know that you're built out of a very strong alloy, and you may bend a little, but you'll never break. It's a very odd thing, Sandy. Very odd. But when I come back, when I touch this ground again, I know the first thought I'll have. I know the first thing it is I'll want to see. The very first, the first thing I'll want to touch. I'll be the little old lady in the lace shawl, the one waving the welcome home sign. So look for me, Doc. Will you look for me on the fringe of the crowd? I'll be. I'll be the one carrying the sign. And how much we had become a part of one another, despite the circumstances of both our lives, despite everything rational. We let ourselves reach into that strange, and mysterious sea within us, called love, and then watch the ripples grow. Sandy, Sandy, where are you now? Sandy, across the void, my dearest. Through the millions of miles of cold and empty space, through the vastness of a naked desert of sky and stars, I feel your warmth, and I love you. I love you, Sandy. Final countdown. Mark it. All systems, one half, three quarters. We have full ignition. Blast off. I move now. I streak across the heavens. I leave behind an Earth that changes even now beyond my closed eyes. This then is the hero's journey, from a warm place of leaves and trees and summers full of dreaming, to a cold orb hanging in a dark sky, and a place I do not know. To return one day with stories to tell my tribe, on the rock they call home. I feel it growing smaller and smaller. And smaller, and time passes inexorably and eternally, and I can do nothing about it, nothing at all. Commander Stansfield, Douglas, scanning vital signs, life functions check, metabolism stable, return mission on course, re-entering Earth's solar system, prepare for approach. Initiate signal transmission. And now it ends where it began. Time without measure, reduced to a single point of light. I see it. The blue seas wrapped in clouds. A flash of green showing through. Where humankind sits on a rock and waits for the word from above. Or perhaps they do not wait. Perhaps they have forgotten. But I have not. I am he who waits, like a rock. Earth, I feel you near me. As this comes in, so much loneliness will go anywhere. And something else, old and yet new, returns to fill the void. I feel you. I feel her. Mission control. Mission control. Come in. What's this? Where? On the trivet. Looks like a craft on the approach. Yeah, I see it. But what kind of craft? Could be a missile. Activate the defense shields. 
Setting coordinates. Locked on. Lasers on standby. This is gonna be easy. Almost too easy. Whoever he is, he's a sitting duck. Wait a minute. Look at the shape of that thing. Some kind of retro design. Hey, bring it up on the helm screen. I can almost make out the numbers. Run a pattern recognition. That'll nail down the model and country of origin. Scanning for recognition. Yes? General Walters, spacecraft re-entry, sir. Satellite of origin? That's just it, sir. It wasn't launched from orbit. Then from where? Unknown. It's spiraling into the atmosphere. Spiraling? Patch me into visual. Yes, sir. Good Lord. What, sir? I've seen this one before. Running a configuration ID, it's definitely one of ours. By the markings, it's a ship called... The Soul Two. The prototype is at the Smithsonian, commanded by... I've got the stats. Somebody named Stansfield. Douglas Stansfield. Yeah, this is a real odd one, sir. A date of departure was 40 years ago. 41 to be exact. You're not going to believe this, but he was a hero of mine when I was a boy. Send in Vogler. Tell him to search everything we've got in the files. Right away, sir. It's downloading now, General. Who is he, anyway? One of the pioneers. Been in space several decades. Really? Presume lost a long time ago. Put it on the screen. Here's a report. He's been out of contact. This is the first communication we've had. The date, the log entries. He was tracked on radar when he left Earth space. But communications must have malfunctioned a few hours after he left the ionosphere. 41 years. And now they come back. Every month, every year, they keep coming back. Like aging birds returning to a nest. For what? That's the question. They went off on missions that became obsolete almost the moment they were out of sight. To blaze trails we've already charted by now. To bring back discoveries that aren't discoveries anymore. And still, they keep coming back. Burnt. Dented. Aged. And they keep coming back. Look at this. What? The footnote. This is a funny one. Let me see. There's an item inserted from a man named Bixler. Bixler? As I recall, he was one of the project people years and years ago. He probably handled the Stansfield mission. It says we're to contact a Miss Sandra Horn. Who's that? Sandra Horn. A friend of Commander Stansfield. And where would we find her, sir? In an old folks' home? According to this, you'll find her in the hibernation room. A young woman of approximately 26 years of age. She must have been very much in love with him. Very devoted. A devotion without precedent. Say a prayer, son. A prayer, sir? That we find her alive. General Walters? Miss Horn, you look very well. Do I? You look just fine, which may sound idiotic. But what do I say to someone who's just had a 40-year sleep? I was told... I was told Commander Stansfield... Commander Stansfield's ship landed six hours ago. I asked to see you first. What about Commander Stansfield? In good health. Naturally, very tired. I want to see him. I must see him. You shall see him. But I had to talk to you. Is... is something the matter? I'll make this as brief as possible. Commander Stansfield had a communications failure. It occurred probably within the first 12 hours of his departure. There was only sporadic contact made during his entire flight. There and back. He reached the other galaxy. He reached it. He landed. He took off. He returned. There was no life where he went. We found that out ourselves 20 years ago. One of the ironies of our progress. We could have saved him the trip. We could have saved him. His anguish. I don't understand. 
His anguish being the following, Miss Horn. Unknown to us here or to my predecessors or theirs, due to the lack of communication, Stansfield arbitrarily removed himself from hibernation six months after leaving Earth. He did this because... because... I know why he did it. God help me. I know why. Over 40 years, Miss Horn. 40 years in the cockpit of a ship. 40 years of... Well... His kind of loneliness must have been something brand new in human experience. For what you both gave up, you deserve far better than this. I wish to God... I wish to God he could have come back to you just as he was when he left. But as it is, I'll leave you alone now. Doc? Dear Doc. You, you remember me, don't you? Remember you? I've spent 40 years remembering you, Sandy. I've spent 40 years painting a picture inside my head, remembering your voice, thinking about your touch. I've spent 40 years surviving for you. But it looks like I made a miscalculation, an error of judgment, you might say, with the best of intentions. And now... Doug, it can still be that way. What you are, what I am, it doesn't make any difference. Oh, I'm afraid it makes a difference, Sandy. Look at you. Forty years of difference. And that's far too much. I'm sorry. I'm so desperately sorry. I know, my dear. I had a lot of years to ponder the possibilities. But I didn't consider this one. Years that I didn't think would ever pass. Years that I sometimes wished wouldn't pass. Oh, Doug. You're as beautiful as ever. Very beautiful. Don't waste it. Go away now, Sandy. You must, please, go home and pick up the pieces of the rest of your life. Go. If that's what you want. It's what I want. Goodbye, my love. Stansfield, if I may say so, you're an incredible man. Really, quite an incredible man. It may be the one distinction I can point to in my entire life. That I knew you. That I knew a man who placed such a premium on love. Truly, truly, Stansfield. Quite a distinction. Goodbye, General. Commander Douglas Stansfield, one of the forgotten pioneers in the Space Age, pushed aside by the flow of progress and the passage of years. Our tale of irony and the ionosphere and the ferocious travesty of fate that could only happen in the Twilight Zone. The Long Morrow, starring Kathy Garver with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were... 
Roderick Peoples, Christian Stolte, Rich Kamenik, Jeff Lupatin, Meg Falcon, Heath Corson, Susan Hart, Carl Amari, Roger Wolski, and Vince Amari. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Morning, Mr. Castle. Hello, Ned. Any mail today? Got it right here. Where's my registered letter? Registered? Oh, I didn't see one. The one that says I won the publisher's house sweepstakes. Oh, oh well, I'll keep an eye out for it. I entered that one myself. Instead, I get only bills. Yeah, the check's in the mail, Mr. Castle. Say, maybe tomorrow, huh? <laughs> maybe. See ya. Another bill, and another, and another. Edna, what about the gas and electric? What? The gas and electric bill. How many months is that? Two months. That's one you'd better pay. That's the one I can't pay. Mr. Castle? How are you, Mrs. Gumley? Uh, it, just, just, just fine, Mr. Castle. Good. Glad to hear it. Uh, how have you been? Oh, can't complain. Been having a lot of rain, haven't we? What? Oh, yes. Quite a bit of rain for this time of year. Well, it's, um, it's, it's good for the flowers. Uh, how's that? Good for the flowers. The, the rain, that is. Yeah. Very good for flowers. Uh, uh, an heirloom today, Mr. Castle. <sighs> an heirloom, Mrs. Gumley. You don't say. Oh, yes, Mr. Castle. Been in my family for years. Has it now? Years and years. It's supposed to be very valuable. Uh, Hand-blown glass is what it is. Mrs. Gumley, it's just a plain old glass wine bottle. Do you know what it's worth, actually? Nothing. Not even a deposit. If you could find the store where it came from, that's what they'd give you. Nothing. I could let it go for a dollar? Mrs. Gumley, if I could spare a dollar, I'd give it to you. Believe me, I would. But things have been rough here. The pawn shop business isn't what it used to be. I'm so in debt myself that... I see. Wait a moment... Yes. One dollar it is, then. I wish it could be more, Mrs. Gumley. I really do. God bless you, Mr. Castle. I could kiss you. Stop that now. It's nothing. You're a wonderful man. Good luck to you. And to you. Better days for all of us. Mr. Castle, it's not an heirloom, you know. I found it in a garbage can. It's just a dirty old cheap glass bottle. Please, please forgive me for lying to you. That's all right, Mrs. Gumley. Who knows? Maybe it'll turn out to be an heirloom. We'll just have to wait and see. Who was that? No one. It sounded like Mrs. Gumley. Then I heard the cash register. What did you buy this time? Edna. Oh, a bottle. Gorgeous. She said it was an heirloom. Is that right? She has to eat, doesn't she? And you don't? That's not the point. Arthur, we're a couple of weeks away from bankruptcy. Don't you think I know that? Then you'd better start rubbing that bottle and pray, Arthur. Pray that a genie appears, because that's about the only hope we have left. Oh, Edna. Edna, please.
Mr. and Mrs. Arthur Castle, suspended in that brief fragment of time before fate comes out of a bottle. Mr. and Mrs. Arthur Castle, gentle and infinitely patient people whose lives have been a hope chest with a rusty lock and a lost set of keys. But in just a moment, that hope chest will be opened and an improbable phantom will try to bedeck the drabness of these two people's failure-laden lives with the gold and precious stones of fulfillment. Mr. and Mrs. Arthur Castle, standing on the outskirts and about to enter the Twilight Zone. And now, back to our story from the Twilight Zone, The Man in the Bottle, starring Ed Begley Jr., with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Here, give me the bottle straight into the trash with it. If you won't do it, I will. Wait, it's worth a couple of cents. A couple of cents, Arthur? A couple of cents? We've got more creditors than we've got cheap watches. You promised me no more handouts. Look, Edna, maybe all that's left for me is to try and find someone who I can feel sorry for. Can you understand that? I need to feel that I'm doing something of value. Maybe a man can be a failure for only so long, and then, and then, and then it catches up with him. Arthur, you're not a failure. Of course I am. Look around, Jedna. In this clutter, you see the legacy of a hundred years. My grandfather owned this shop, and it finally broke his heart. Then my father, and it killed him too. The meanness of it, Edna. The shabbiness of it. The hand-to-mouth of it. This isn't just a hawk shop where you buy the pitiful little residue of other people's failures. It's a shrine to failure. That's what it is. It's a mausoleum, a burial ground for people's hopes. Arthur, please don't talk like that. Edna, what happens to us anyway? What happens to us? Have you ever thought of that? We're not old people, and yet this place is making us old. This should be years ahead of us. Years without having to make do. Scrimping and counting and picking over checkbooks and budgets and final notices and old bills and... Careful, Arthur. You're knocking things over. I don't care about the bottle. I'm trying to explain... (gasps) Arthur, what's all that smoke? I don't know, but it seems to be coming from inside Mrs. Gumley's bottle. How do you do? Where did you come from? From the bottle, of course. The bottle? It fell to the floor, the cork popped out, and here I am, at your service. I'm supposed to buy that. What do you take me for? Rather than go into any lengthy generic explanation of my existence, suffice it to say that I am here, and I am, in fact, a genie. In a business suit, with a derby hat and a walking stick, And you expect me to believe that, that you're a genie? That's quite correct. There's no such thing, except in fairy tales. On the contrary, I am living proof, in a manner of speaking. Arthur, who is this man? You'll have to do better than that, mister. I don't know what you're trying to pull here. Very well, I'll get right to the point. I can offer you four wishes with a guaranteed performance. Four wishes? Aha! You got that wrong. It's supposed to be three. In every book I ever read, it was three wishes. Better get your story straight. That's a myth, I'm afraid. Oh, they may have offered only three in the beginning. But for some time now, four has been the operant number. Some considerable time. It's proven to be the most effective option. Think about it. Too few, and a person may waste the opportunity of a lifetime, so to speak. Too many, and, well, the possibilities can get out of hand. Frivolous, in other words. The opportunities tend to cancel each other out, if you see my point. You've got your answers down, I'll give you that. I think I better sit. Well, Mr. Castle, Mrs. Castle, what do you have in mind? Arthur, I don't understand. What, 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 what's happening here? Don't worry, Edna. The bottom line is he's a con man. He has to be. But I see him. Don't you? I don't know what I see. Could be some kind of hypnotist or something. Remember that guy in television? He made an elephant disappear. Child's play. Smoke and mirrors. You're telling me you're not a magician? Nothing of the sort. I grant four wishes to the owner and then go back inside the bottle for a century and a day. A hundred years. Inside a bottle. Plus one day. A nice touch, don't you agree? Until a summons comes from the next owner. What if there isn't another owner? But, my dear fellow, there must be. 
Consider the span of a man's life. Three score and ten. Isn't that the tradition? So let's say nobody calls you, or it's the wrong day. Ah, you've hit the nail on the head. I've learned to cultivate patience beyond anything you can possibly imagine. All of which means you're extraordinarily lucky today. As am I, in a manner of speaking. <gasps> Maybe he's from the lottery. We didn't play the lottery this week, Edna. Just as well. The odds are quite unrealistic. What I'm offering you transcends any lottery the world has ever known. They're strictly nickel and dime operations in comparison. I have to think this over. Take your time. Interesting shop you have here. Chinese vases, Tiffany lamps, bric-a-brac of every sort. Mostly imitation, of course. No offense. Nonetheless, I have the distinct feeling I've seen some of these items before. How could you if you haven't been out of the bottle in a hundred years? I meant the originals. The originals? How old are you? If I told you, you wouldn't believe me. Hmm, nice silver cigarette case. Faux Victorian, isn't it? My uncle's. He passed it down from his great uncle, who bought it in Liverpool in 1914. <laughs> Is that what he said? How much? Take it. Get back to the subject. What else about the wishes? Oh, yes. Now, I think the business at hand is for you and Mrs. Castle to decide the nature of your four wishes, keeping in mind, of course, that each wish is irrevocable. Once made, it is fulfilled, and once fulfilled, it is a matter of record. It can only be altered by yet another wish. Clear, Mr. Castle? Clear enough. I think we'd better call the police. Why not wish for them? I can bring you Scotland Yard, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or every bobby in the City of London. That won't be necessary. Is it the police you want? No. That's not what we'd wish for. Arthur, are you out of your mind? Go ahead, Mr. Castle. You were saying? Well, if I had a wish... You believe him? Just for the sake of argument, let's say that I wanted that broken glass in the case over there. Let's say I wanted it to be fixed. The glass display case? Unless that's too hard for you. I broke it cleaning up the other day. One whole side is cracked. Is that all? It's too expensive to replace and impossible to glue together. Impossible. Would you like to make it official, Mr. Kessel? Arthur, be careful with this man. You don't know what he's after. Well, Mr. Kessel, is that your wish? Yes, that is my wish. I want the glass in the case to be repaired. Very well, then. Am I dreaming? It's a magic trick. It has to be. No, you're not dreaming, Edna. I see it too. It's like new. How... how did you do that? Next. What? Well, Mr. Castle, you have three wishes left. Three wishes. Three. Edna, three wishes. Anything we want. Think, Edna, think. What, what, what do we want? Why, I don't... I don't know. I asked you to think. I'm frightened. A new shop, Edna. An expensive shop on Fifth Avenue. We could have that just for the asking. But Arthur... Or travel. Take trips. We could see the places we could never afford to visit, like Paris or Rome or, or even the South Seas. We could take a cruise around the world. First class. Surely there's a catch. Or oh, money. A hundred thousand dollars. Two hundred thousand dollars, a million. We wouldn't have to grub anymore. We wouldn't have to sit here and waste our lives away. Arthur, it isn't right. There's something, there's something unholy about it. Clothes, Edna. Expensive clothes, jewels, a beautiful house. No more worries for the rest of our lives. Are you sure? Edna, we don't have to rot away here. We can have anything we want. Anything, Edna. Money. Money? The simplest of all requests, Mr. Castle. Simple? For you, maybe. How much would you like? In what denominations? Edna, how much do we want? I... I don't know. I, I just don't know. A million dollars. That's what we want. A million dollars. In what form? Gold? Silver? Of course, there are market fluctuations in precious metals, so there will naturally be an element of risk. Platinum shows the least movement. Diamonds are relatively stable at the moment. Forget it. Cash only. All negotiable U.S. currency. Very good. Denominations? No fifties or hundreds. Make it five and ten dollar bills. Recent dates and no counterfeits. Where would you like it? 
Savings account or checking? Perhaps a numbered deposit in a Swiss bank. Right here. Here? Where I can see it. On the floor? Don't you worry about that. Just bring it here. I'll take care of the rest. That is your second wish. You understand English, don't you? That's our wish. Coming right up. Oh, just one thing. Aha! Arthur, I told you. Do you mind terribly if I... If what? If I smoke. Is that all? Of course, if you prefer otherwise. I see the no smoking sign on the wall. No, no, go right ahead. <sighs> Very well. Now then, Mr. Castle, where were we? Ah, yes, I was about to say, ask and you shall receive. What's that? Where's it coming from? What is it? It's money. Look at it. A rain of money. Edna, Edna, a million dollars, Edna. <laughs> a million dollars. There you are, Edna. Champagne. <laughs> I think I've had more than enough. I suppose you're right. How can I work if I have a hangover? Well, you could take the day off. Edna, you're a genius. Why didn't I think of that? We both could. Close up the store and... And what? I wouldn't know what to do, would you? Well, let's see now. It's a beautiful day. We could take a walk together in the park. Oh, Arthur, I'd have to get dressed up and... I... I don't have any comfortable shoes. Or we could go to a restaurant. Any restaurant at all. But we've already had lunch. Then we could take in a film downtown or a play, a musical. Do you know how many years it's been since we did that? And leave all this money out like this? I don't think that would be a good idea. So, we're prisoners here. We can't go anywhere, do anything, for fear that someone might steal it from under our noses. What good is it? Oh, Arthur, we can put it in the bank. That's tomorrow. The bank's closed now. Unless... What are you thinking? Call your brother on the telephone. Tell him to come over here. He needs money for his operation, remember? Oh, I like that idea. And while you're at it, call Avritin, the butcher, and Mrs. Tiola, and the checker at the market. And that nice girl at the bank. And the dry cleaner. And here, look in the book. All our old customers, the ones who can't afford to get their valuables out of hock. Call them all, every one. What will I say? Tell them, tell them we need their help. It's a miracle, that's what it is. I couldn't believe it when they called. Where did they get it all? They're such wonderful people. And so generous, too. Hey, now, what's going on here? Hello, Officer McLaurin. The line's halfway down the street. <laughs> yes, it certainly is. Are they having a fire sale in there, or what? It's that nice Mr. Castle and his wife. What about them? <gasps> they're, well, they're redeeming things. What things? All kinds of things, as long as you've got your pawn ticket. Even if you don't, they remember. <laughs> they're redeeming us. That's what they're doing. It's the loveliest gesture I've ever seen. Hi there, Mrs. Gumley. Beautiful day. <laughs> Indeed it is. Your turn, Mrs. Gumley. Go on in. Hold on. Where'd you get that fistful of money? Right inside, officer. From Mr. and Mrs. Castle, bless their souls. What are they doing, running numbers? Nothing like that. Strictly legit. You're telling me they gave it to you? Sure did. Enough to pay off their tab at the butcher shop and then some. Plus the next ten years in advance. And whereabouts did they get this bankroll? Don't ask me. But their ship sure must have come in big time. The horses, was it? Or the lottery? I heard it was the sweepstakes that came in the mail. No, no, it was their cousin. He died and left them a fortune. Well, we'll just have to see about that. They're not breaking any laws. I haven't had my turn yet. You're not going to arrest them, are you? Maybe not. But I'll keep a close eye on the situation. In the meantime, I know someone who might be real interested in all this. Uh, don't you people go blocking the sidewalk now. Here you go, young man. Pay off that mortgage now. I will. And then go have yourself a ball, you and your lovely wife. I, I don't 
get it. Why are you doing this? Do I need a reason? Every time I come in your gas station, you look under the hood. Oh, that's nothing. Check the air and the tires, all of it, without my asking. I say that's worth something. It's worth a lot these days. Well, thanks, Mr. Castle. <laughs> Bye now. <sighs> Who's next? Mrs. Gumley, how are you? Very well, thank you. Here, you take this now. I want you to have it. Oh, so much. Don't you worry about it, Mrs. Gumley. Anything you need, anything at all, you come to us. There's more where that came from. For you, plenty more. Oh, God bless you both. But why are you giving me this money, Mrs. Castle? Why? <laughs> Because you're so bright and cheery every time I'm in the market. Oh, Mrs. Castle, thank you. You put this in the bank now for when you get married. And for you, Mr. Jax? And you too, Mrs. Tiola. You have a nice day now. <laughs> Don't mention it. Buy a round for everybody. On me. Is that all of them? Oh, for now. Put the clothes sign in the window, would you please? Of course, dear. Whew. Now that's what I call a day's work. <laughs> you did wonderfully well, Arthur. I'm so proud of you. You know, Edna, I don't care how we spend the rest. I feel so good right now, seeing all those happy faces. I know. It would be nice to get away for a while, though. I agree. Some time in the sun, nothing fancy. How much do we have left? Look in the box. It's still practically full. We didn't put a dent in it. Your father would be proud. <laughs> Rest his soul. And your grandfather. Tell me your opinion about something, Edna. If you like, dear. I'm wondering, do you suppose I still need to carry on the family business? Well... We don't have a son or daughter. I'd say you've more than done enough, Arthur. All these years. Even if we did have kids, I'd rather leave them money to start their own business. Something with a future. What about your cousin's children? Oh, that would be a wonderful present. And what about you? You've been so patient all these years. What would you like? Well, first, of course, you're going to retire. No ifs, ands, or buts. And then, wherever you'd like to live, Arthur, as long as we're together. <laughs> Of course we'll be together. You think I'm going to take up with a young floozy? Oh, no, no, I don't think that. You wouldn't. It's not in your nature. But you're tired. You need to rest. <laughs> we both do. Rest and live. Yes? Good afternoon, Mr. Castle. Do I know you? Let me see. Harry Joy's son. I don't believe we've met before. Wait. Stu Wintner's nephew. That's it. <laughs> Not quite. Are you from the life insurance company? Because if you are, we've got your payment right here. Just let me count it out for you. In cash. Is that all right? That's not necessary. Or we could write you a check just as soon as we make a deposit. And quite a deposit it will be by the looks of all this. I told you, Arthur, we should have put it away. Let me give you my card. Internal Revenue Service. That's correct. There's a matter of an income tax, Mr. Castle. You just send us the bill and we'll pay it. But send the bill in a hurry, would you please? My wife and I will be taking off for Europe very shortly. Oh, could we? <laughs> Consider it done. Where would you like to go first? The Eiffel Tower, an African safari, waltzing in Vienna, perhaps? <laughs> dancing? We haven't been dancing since... Well, since I don't remember. Dependents? Hmm? Just a few details for the record. Ask away. We have nothing to hide. How many dependents can you claim? The whole neighborhood. They don't count. Wait, wait. What's that figure? The one you just wrote down? Beginning with a sum of $1 million taxed on the basis of a husband and wife using the standard deductions and taking into account unpaid back taxes, approximately $907,000. Oh, that's how much I have left? Good! Fabulous! <laughs> that's how much you owe the government. 
I beg your pardon? In addition, there's a state income tax involved, which, using thumb rule, would come to a rough figure of uh, $35,000. You mean hundreds, don't you? Then there will be a matter of a 5% penalty. For what? If you fail to file a declaration within 30 days of today's date, but I'm sure you won't let that happen, the whole thing will amount to about, uh, roughly, mind you, let's see here, $942,640. Arthur, we've given away a lot of money already. I'll figure out how much. Fill out this form and send it to us with your check. It should be self-explanatory. If you want to use the installment plan, we'll send you a statement after your records have been analyzed. Mr. Castle? Yeah. Yeah. Send us the bill. We'll be seeing you. Good evening to you, Mrs. Castle. I wonder if we can appeal it. Help me, Edna. You take this pile. 76, 77, 78... Oh, Arthur, where's the genie when we need him? Well, how much is there? 910535 $910,540. We gave away almost $60,000. And this goes to taxes, leaving us with this. One $5 bill. That's our entire profit, Edna. Five whole dollars. That was quite a wish, Arthur. Quite a wish. And we haven't even paid the bills yet. If you'll recall, it was my suggestion that you reflect very carefully, Mr. Castle. Very, very carefully. <laughs> now he shows up. Had you made a wish that took into account the taxes involved... Look, you... Plenty of sweet talk and promises and the whole thing. And all the time, you're nothing but a con artist, after all. This time, I want the million dollars, but I want it after... Arthur, no more money. You've got to wish for something else. Oh, something else, then. A new store. A chain of stores. They could burn down one hour after we get them. Success? Be careful, Mr. Castle. Success is a pretty broad term. He's right. You can't wish for success. <gasps> I've got it. How about ten more wishes? Or twenty, or... Very clever, Mrs. Castle, wishing for more wishes. But I'm afraid that isn't permitted. Frankly, I'd be afraid to have you try it for fear of the consequences. What consequences? Why do you have to keep losing your temper? Why can't you think about this thing carefully and, and then come up with well, a... Well, you're no help to me, that's for sure. Here we stand in the middle of this crummy little pawn shop with a whole world out in front of us and anything to wish for that we want. Anything. And you just stay on my back and... Stop it. This doesn't sound like you. Not like the man I married. Not at all. Edna, what's happening to us? What's really going on here? Oddly enough, this is the normal pattern that seems to be generally followed. Great excitement, great emotionalism, and strangely enough, hard to believe though it may be, only a modicum of happiness. Well, you've got cheap customers here. Our price is no longer so high. We're people who haven't had much happiness. People who've carried a crummy hawk shop on their backs all their lives. What, Edna? Tell me, what do we wish for? I don't know, Arthur. I just don't know. What about it? What can I wish for now? What can come to me without tricks? Without tricks? I question the semantics here, Mr. Castle. There are no tricks involved. There are simply normal and understandable outgrowths and conditions that go with any windfall. No matter what you wish for, you must be prepared for the consequences. What sort of consequences? Nothing more than cause and effect. Consider, for example, what happens when you throw a stone into a lake. The stone sends out ripples in the water. After a while, these ripples reach the shore. The bigger the stone, the bigger the ripples. And if the stone is large enough, you'll get a wave of water, even a tidal wave that could sweep you off your feet. It all depends on how much you disturb the way things were to begin with. Now do you see what I mean about consequences? That I need something without consequences. I'm not sure that's entirely possible. Something dead sure, at least. Something anchored, something airtight. I must agree, that would be the ticket. Is there such a thing? Sit down now, you'll give yourself a heart attack. Edna, I think I've got it. I think I know what it is. What, Arthur? 
power, Edna. Power, prerogatives, to be in charge of something, to be a boss, to be a leader with respect and the freedom to live as one likes. We could wish for that. Possible, very possible. President of a corporation, that sort of thing. We could be sued, go bankrupt. Warden of a prison. That's idiotic. Mayor of a city. We could get voted out of office and then what? Wait a minute, wait a minute. I know what, head of a country. Ruler of a whole country, that's it. Who can't be voted out of office. What about it, Jeannie? I want to be the head of a country who can't be voted out of office. Is that your wish? Do you want to be more specific than that? Hold on, hold on. Let me give it to you this way. I want to be the head of a foreign country who can't be voted out of office. But it must be a major country, well known. Not some poverty-stricken third world place. And not in ancient times either, in modern history. How do you define modern? Within my lifetime, and developed. A fully industrialized country with millions of educated people where I'm very popular and can't be voted out of office. No problem. You're sure? Of course I'm sure. I mean, what about the consequences? Consequences, Mr. Castle, I've already told you. You run the risk of consequences no matter what you wish for. Like the ripples in a stream. There's no predicting, at least not with absolute certainty, where they lead. All right, then. Go ahead, Arthur. Wish for that. The thing you said. I want to be the head of a foreign country, just as I've described it. Now it's your turn, Jeannie. Take over. As you wish, Mr. Castle. <laughs> as you wish. <laughs> You'll forgive me, sir. Yes? I have not slept in three nights now, but the situation is as I described. The first Ukrainian army has cut us off from the south. There's no sign of Vink's reserve army. There is no reserve army. We are simply doomed. There is no hope for us. From now on, it is just a mass suicide. Did you hear what I said? They are already in Berlin? What about it, Führer? Führer? What do you want to do? Why do you call me that name? Here is what you asked for. Very quick and very painless, mein Führer. And we have the gasoline for you and Miss Braun. When you're finished... Head of a country. Can't be voted out of office. It's the end of the war and I'm in a bunker and I'm... Hail Hitler! It's almost the end. I've given them the poison. We'll take their bodies out into the courtyard and burn them when it's finished. Have the gasoline ready. I won't take the poison. I wish... I wish I were back where it all started. I wish I were Arthur Castle again. Oh, Arthur, you've broken it. What? Broken what? The bottle Mrs. Gumley brought in. Why? I have, haven't I? Not poison, and an old wine bottle. Let me sweep it up for you. I can do it. It had no value anyway. No, no value at all. I'm here. My final wish. I'm really here now. Where is he? Where is who? You know who I mean. The... Them. And why would he be here? You've had your four wishes, remember? No, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess I'm a four-time loser. What do you expect? I just wish he doesn't come back. I wish... There you go, wishing again. Right. Why should I? Why did I? Look at what we have here, Edna. We have a business that's been in my family for three generations. And each other. We have each other. I'm going to stop wishing for a while. You know, Edna, I can't afford a brand new life. Neither can I. I think I'll just give the old one a new paint job. <laughs> you know something, Arthur? I think that's a very good idea. <laughs> what is it? Look, your first wish, the glass case, it's not broken. It's still repaired. 
<laughs> so we came out ahead after all. Nothing's ever a complete loss, is it? Careful, a Arthur with the broom handle. Well, we were ahead. Now you have more glass to clean up. You know something? I don't mind cleaning up any of it. Not at all. In fact, not at all. A poet named Lowell said it, something to the effect that granting our wish is one of fate's saddest jokes. Lesson to be learned out of a few fragments of broken glass in a trash can. And a word to the wise, to the garbage collectors of the world, to the curio seekers, to the antique buffs, to everyone who would try to coax a miracle from unlikely places. Check the bottle you're taking back for that deposit, because the genie you save might be your own. Case in point, Mr. and Mrs. Arthur Castle, fresh from the briefest of trips into the Twilight Zone. The Man in the Bottle, starring Ed Begley Jr., with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Linda Ryder, David Darlow, Guy Burrill, Rosalind Alexander, Richard Hensel, Rich Komenik, Carl Amari, Diane Trice, Irene Olson, and Richard Shavson. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Who needs a taxi? Over here. There's a cab. Tell him to wait, Wilfred. Quickly, before someone else gets it. Junior, come along. I'm coming. At least carry your mother's suitcase. Her shoulder's bothering her. I got it. Evening, folks. I got your bags. Can you take four? What's that? There are four of us. Sure. Three in the back seat, one in the front. Uh, where's Paula? Don't ask me. I thought she was with you. She's back there talking to somebody. Who? <laughs> a guy. Who do you think? Paula, come over here right now. Yes, Daddy. Hey, can I get your number? Now, I said. I heard you. And who was that? Who's who? That young man you were talking to. A college boy in a fraternity. Come along, Paula. You can't go around talking to absolute strangers. Get in the cab. But he was nice. Oh, you think anything in trousers is nice. Ready, folks? Seems to be very busy tonight. Ah, uh, yes, sir. What's the occasion? Are you serious? Well, if I weren't, I wouldn't waste my breath. I asked you a simple question. Mardi Gras, sir. Oh, no, of all the wretched timing. Mardi Gras! Can we go, Daddy? Oh, please? We most certainly cannot. This is hardly a pleasure trip. What about me? You'll stay with us. But I'm old enough. Not another word, Junior. Come down on business, did you? That's right. Family business. My father-in-law is extremely ill. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, what's the address? 1427 Wistria Lane. Do you know where that is? Sure do. Uh, that's in the Garden District. Some nice places around there. There are indeed. And this is one of the nicest. A very valuable piece of property. I'll bet. Can I ask a question? Ask away, son. What's the drinking age in New Orleans? Junior! I just asked. Um, driver, how do you turn the light on back here? Now what in the world do you need a light for? So I can see myself in the mirror? I have to fix my hair. Will you all please try to control yourselves? No one wants to be here. That's understood. But now that we are, we'll just have to make the best of it. Step on it, driver. We don't have all night. Yes, sir. Um, put on your seatbelts, please. I know a shortcut. Otherwise, we'll never get there. They don't call it Fat Tuesday for nothing. Meet the Harpers. Not your typical American family, perhaps, 
but people who belong together, like birds of a feather. First, there's Wilfred Harper, father and husband, a money-hungry conniving sort with shifty, piggish eyes that reflect the contents of his soul. His wife, Emily, on the fading side of 45, with a petulant, mousy face and a voice to match, a thin-lipped hypochondriac. Then there's Wilfred Jr., with a face devoid of any suggestion of character. He has inherited much of his father's avarice and all of his mother's weakness. The combination gives him a half-hungry, half-cruel look that one usually finds on cornered animals. And his teenage sister, Paula, a vast desert with only one structure on it, a mirror. She is committed to her own appearance and nothing else on earth. These four received a phone call concerning the health of Emily's father, one Jason Foster, who lies dying in his mansion. Soon we'll meet Mr. Foster, a tired ancient who on this particular evening will leave the earth. But before departing, he has a few things to do, some services to perform, some debts to pay, and some justice to mete out. Because this is not only New Orleans at Mardi Gras time, it's also... The Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Masks, starring Stan Freeberg with Stacey Keach as your narrator. How do, Nola? Jeffrey? Give you a hand with that? Oh, thank you kindly. Crowded downtown? Yeah, the biggest Mardi Gras ever. At least that's what it looks like. I almost couldn't get a seat on the streetcar. You got everything, I see. Everything he asked for. How is he? He looks badly. And he's much weaker. Ever so much weaker. Can't say as I'm surprised. He wants to be advised when his relations arrive. Knowing his relations, I'm sure they'll make themselves known. You're right about that. The doctor's still here? Mm Mm-hmm. With him now. I'll get dinner started. You do that, Nola. You do that. Oh, my. A sad and mournful day. Well, Sawbones, how's the pulse? How do you think? Too fast, too weak, too uneven? For what? What do you have in mind? Where were you when they taught bedside manners in medical school? Trying out for the soccer team? Huh? I've been your physician, Jason, for, uh, how long is it now? Forty-two years. First time I attended to you, it was for a head cold. I allowed myself one compassionate cluck, just one, and you threw a lamp at me. That established the pattern right then and there. That's why I've suffered your inept ministrations all these years. Your candor has been a refreshing departure from the modern medical norm... I ask you a straight and simple question, and you give me a straight and simple response. (sighs) What is it, Jason? The oft-asked question of the condemned man. How long? Well, there's really no telling. How long have I, Sam? A week? A day and a half? Huh? Or is there no need to wind my watch to cover the exigencies of the next four hours. My guess is that you may now measure your life in moments. I think it could come at any time. That you've lasted this long, Jason, is a tribute to an inner strength most of us are not privileged to possess. Nonsense! It's a tribute to a streak of recalcitrant, cross-grained, unaccommodating orneriness. And the fact that there are one or two things left for me to do on this earth. That's why I must stay alive, at least until midnight. I hope I see you tomorrow, Doctor. I'm sure you shall, God willing. Right this way, please. Thank you, Jeffrey. And the hat box, Jeffrey, that blue thing. Yes, ma'am. Be particularly careful. It has all my medicines in it. Stand up straight, Junior. You'll get round-shouldered. Why do you still call me Junior, Pop? I'm not a kid anymore. 
I could break you in half if I wanted to. Oh, such talk. Well, <laughs> couldn't I? Now, 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 let's watch our words. And you, Paula, behave like a young lady. All right, Paula. Hello, Emily. Oh, how nice to see you again, Dr. Thorne. You've met my husband. Yes, uh, some years ago, the last time he was here. How are you, Mr. Harper? As well as can be expected under the circumstances. And you, Mrs. Harper? How are you? Bearing up, Doctor. As best I can. This is our son, Wilford Jr., and our daughter, Paula. Hi. Hello. This is your grandfather's doctor, children. Your father's been expecting you. I'm very glad you could make it. Crowded at the airport, was it? Oh, that silly Mardi Gras. Well, really, the traffic is unspeakable. Shouting, screaming, incredibly rude people. It's a wonder we were able to get here at all. As for your father's condition, he's... Oh, yes. How is he? We're all really quite concerned on tenterhooks, you might say. Well, he's extremely ill. How long? Well, a good educated guess would be that it's just a matter of days. Days, you say? Hours, perhaps. Is that right? How simply awful. We've been expecting it, of course. Uh, Jeffrey? Yes, ma'am? Our rooms, are they ready? Yes, ma'am. Uh, they're all prepared. I want to take a shower. Wait for the butler to show the way. Uh, a question for you, doctor? Yes? You may recall, I suffer severe muscle spasms in my shoulder. They're really quite agonizing. Are they? Oh, perhaps you could prescribe something? That quack I've been going to in Boston is supposed to be a specialist, but... He'd better be a specialist. He charges like one. Well, it's a very complicated condition. As a matter of fact, he told me that you don't see cases like mine more than once or twice in a hundred years. Oh, please, Emily. It's true. Let me describe the symptoms. I'll be sitting down, perhaps reading a book, and I'll suddenly get this bolt of pain through my upper arm. It's all I can do to bear it. You can't imagine. Uh, excuse me, Mrs. Harper. I have another call to make this evening. Uh, if you'll forgive me. Take the luggage upstairs, Jeffrey, all of it. Yes, sir, Mr. Harper. And this briefcase, too, if you will. I'll do my best. I'll see you to the door, Doctor. Paula, you and your brother see your mother to her room. Come on, Mom. Oh, give me your arm, Junior. You already got it. I hope you don't mind, darlings, but the pain is... Well, frankly, it's more than I can bear. This way, folks. Old man's in bad shape, huh? As I said, the old man is dying. And there's no chance of a recovery? Not realistically, if that's any comfort to you. Good evening, Mr. Harper. Father? Don't worry, I'm awake. Well, don't just stand there. You may as well come in, all of you. How are you, Emily? Bearing up, Father. Bearing up? Heh, you sound like Job, itemizing his calamities. What is your illness this month? Oh, never mind. I'll... I'll bully through. What are you doing there, Wilfred? Oh, just examining this piece of porcelain. Wedgwood, isn't it? Yes, and quite old. Say hello to your grandfather. Hello. Hello. Yeah, I see Paula has found the mirror. It's my hair. I can't do anything with it. You are four of the most changeless people on Earth. Do you realize that? Huh? Oh, I don't like being ill, if that's what you mean, Father. Don't you? Don't you indeed, Emily. Eh, that's hard to believe. It really is. Why, what do you mean? Considering that in the past 25 years, you've been at death's door so many times, it's a wonder you haven't worn a hole in the mat. <laughs> and you, Wilfred, how's business? Oh, you know, it is... Make a little, lose a little. It's a struggle, but I manage to keep my head above water somehow. Your head above water? Heh, that's a good one. <laughs> I think the only book you've ever read, Wilfred, is a ledger. If someone were to cut you open, they'd find a cash register in place of a heart, a profit and loss column instead of a spine, and liquid assets running through your veins instead of Blood. Really, that's not fair. Really, it is. And you there, Paula, 
Putting on a fresh coat of lipstick before speaking further, I see. Nice to see you, Grandpa. How friendly of you to say so, considering that you haven't looked at me yet. All you've seen is yourself in the mirror, which, in the final analysis, is all you ever see. That's not true. You're being mean, Grandpa. You shouldn't, you know. We've had such a miserable long trip, and Mother hasn't stopped complaining one instant. Oh, you hear that, Father? The younger generation. He jests at scars that never felt a wound. Emily, my dear, I understand that my troubles include hardening of the arteries and a weakening heart. But if you continue playing Sarah Bernhardt, I may well succumb to an intestinal affliction. What does that mean? It means you're in danger of making me sick to my stomach. And young Wilfred Jr. over there, looking as alert as usual. Willie, darling, tell Grandfather how nice it is to see him. It's very nice to see you, Grandfather. Looks like an English bull, talks like a parrot. How gracious and unselfish it was for you all to come and see me. Father dear, wild horses couldn't have kept us from you. Not even my own agony. Well, I hope you survive, Emily. You're to have an excellent dinner this evening. And then I've planned a surprise. But, Grandpa, it's Mardi Gras. I was hoping you'd know of some parties. We're having a party here, Paula. We are? Have you invited any boys? Better than that. We'll have a marvelous time. I've arranged for us all to wear masks. Masks? How drawl, Jason, masks. I swear you people don't just celebrate tradition down here. You succumb to it. I think you'll find that there's absolutely nothing traditional about them. Masks, huh? Well, it might be kind of fun. It shall be, my boy. It shall be. Eh, perhaps not the same degree of satisfaction you receive from torturing small animals as I've seen you do in the past. Oh, come on, Grandpa. I haven't done that in a long time. Willie is doing very well in school now, Father. He made the football team. A chip off the old block, I'm sure. <laughs> well, now, <clears throat> why don't you all prepare for dinner? I think we'll have an interesting evening. As a matter of fact, I guarantee it. As you wish. Will we see you downstairs? Uh, I wouldn't miss it for the world. Come, children, Emily. Everything all right, Mr. Foster? Jeffrey, get the masks and place them in the study, if you will. Those masks? Yes, those masks. You know the ones. Yes, sir. Hmm. A tremendously interesting evening for all. I promise. <laughs> Come away from the window, Paula. But look at all the fun they're having. You heard your father. I think it's disgraceful, the way those... those animals have invaded this part of town. It used to be just in the quarter, but now... I want to go with them. Paula! Well, why not? The most exciting night of the year, and we're stuck in this... this... mausoleum. The whole city is out there dancing, and what do we do? We have a death watch for a crazy old man. Cool it, sis. Close the window right now. There's a draft on my bursitis. Great. What did you do in New Orleans, Paula? Did you go to Mardi Gras? Oh, yeah. We wore funny masks and sat around and stared at each other. Look at those stupid things. Don't touch the masks. I'm sure they're very old and valuable. Everything in this house is valuable. They are if Father bothered to collect them. Without question. Look at the chandelier, the furniture, and the paintings. I've never asked you, Emily. Is that an actual Matisse in the hall? No, it's a Picasso. Oh, is that all? Here you are, Mr. Foster. Thank you, Jeffrey. That will be all. You sure, sir? I can take it from here. Yes, sir. Well, now, my loved ones, was your dinner satisfactory? Sumptuous, Jason. Really, truly excellent. Must have cost a pretty penny. 
Father, do you think it wise for you to be up like this? Wise? Probably not, but necessary, assuredly. Have you, uh, examined your masks? Our masks? <laughs> you must mean they're a gift. Oh, well, in that case, thank you. They're... they're certainly unique, Father. Indeed. They're made by an old Cajun. Actually, made is inaccurate. They're created. Each one separately and individually. <laughs> is that so? I'd be interested in any provenance you can provide. Their history, ritual meaning. You mean so you can resell them? No, of course not. I wouldn't worry about that just yet. We're simply curious. No doubt, no doubt. I'm told that not only are these works of artistic perfection, but they possess certain um, properties. Very unusual properties. Can I look at the magazine? No way, I'm reading it. Children, your grandfather is speaking. They're only worn during the Mardi Gras, and there's a ritual to the wearing. You see, one tries to pick a mask, which is the antithesis of the wearer. How so? Oh, for example, the ugly man might cloak himself in beauty, whereas the shy and retiring put on the facade of boldness. Youth wears age... And age, youth. You get the idea. In other words, it's a masquerade of opposites. Very interesting. <laughs> now, why would anyone do that, Father? Why question it? This is a special evening. And now, dear ones, let's pick our appropriate masks, shall we? <laughs> <sighs> if you say so. You, Wilfred, how do you fancy yourself? I don't understand. Come on, be candid. When you shave in the morning, who looks back at you? Why, I do, of course. I, I don't see... Please, you're... it's a crucial question. What do you see? Really, Jason, I think we're a little old for parlor games. Let me be the judge of that. Indulge an old man. Oh, all right. Give me a self-assessment. Come on, be honest. You're serious? Never more so. Well, I suppose you could say I'm good-natured. Congenial. Ah, now we're getting somewhere. I've always been a congenial man. No matter what the circumstances, I try to take things in stride. Very good, Wilfred. Congenial, friendly, outgoing, even extroverted. In short, amiable. I think so. So it follows that as part of this amiability, this general goodwill, you feel a deep rapport with your fellow man. Hmm? Oh, Yes. Yes, indeed. Now, the opposite of your affability would be... Ah, this face. Here. This one? Surely not. Look at it, Wilfred. Hold it in your hands. Feel the way the wood is carved. The angry, feral lines. The gnawing, rat-like teeth. The opposite of the way you see yourself, remember? Charming. I take your point. Hardly an appealing image, though. Live with it a while. Try it on. Come on. It has great subtlety. The features reflect greed, avarice, cruelty, like a predatory animal. In short, all the character traits that you don't have. An ironic choice, <laughs> wouldn't you say? Quite. And now, the brave lady on the couch. Oh, really, Father? I don't feel well. I'm not up to... Of course you are, my dear darling daughter. You're up to anything. Your courage dictates that you accommodate a relatively brief period of self-sacrifice. It should come naturally to you. How about this one? But it's hideous. Of course it is. Look at it closely, my dear. The face of a sad, sniveling, self-centered coward. Flabby and without character. Fearful eyes, no chin at all. In contrast to your own bravery, your doughty, intrepid strength. Well, I suppose it does serve as a contrast. Next, the one over there, who walks in beauty like the night. What? Pay attention, your grandfather is speaking. If you want to know, I think this whole thing is a bore. 
Paula! Well, it's the truth. Wear this one, just for a short while. All right, but it's horrible. Ah, look closely. The round porcelain features. It's the face of a pig with beady eyes, puffed out jowls, and a shiny pink snout. <laughs> a self-indulgent face that's never satisfied. Not like you, my dear. It has none of your heart, none of your selflessness, none of your your great concern for others at the expense of yourself. Well, if you put it that way. And last but hardly least, the timid one over there, the gentle and quiet Wilfred Junior. Oh, come on, grandfather! But you haven't seen it yet. Well, what's this one supposed to be? Your opposite, my boy, the face of a dull-witted, stupid clown. Thanks. Notice the low brow, the bulbous nose, the slack, oversized mouth, as opposed to your own manful refinement. Your courteous, deferential gentility. Yeah, yeah, I get it. And now we're almost done. What about your mask? This one. <laughs> but, but that's a skeleton. The face of death, because I'm alive. Understand? How we're the very thing that stalks me at this moment. No,、oh, you don't mean that we actually have to wear these hideous things. I believe I explained that. Only for a few hours, I should add, until the unmasking, and that's at midnight. Paula, you'll break it. I don't care. Everybody else can do what they want. I'm not wearing mine. Then I'm not either. I'm afraid, Jason, that we're somewhat at odds here. Not really, Wilfred. The four of you came here for one purpose. To see me off and yell "Bon voyage!" to put coins on my closed eyelids, while with your free hands you start grabbing and looting. Father, that's cruel. On the contrary, that's truth. You came here to reap everything I've sown, to collect everything I've built, to covet everything I possess, and I'll not disappoint you. The will is prepared. Everything is left to the four of you. Everything: money, house, property, holdings, stocks and bonds, all of it, all of it. Jason, you break our hearts when you talk that way. The most touching thing you've ever dredged up, Wilfred, by way of conversation. But I must emphasize this little addendum: one small proviso. You're to wear those masks until exactly midnight. Not a moment more. Not a moment less. What? I don't believe this. Really, Father? Mark my words. If you take them off, if you do, you'll each receive from my estate the equivalent of a ticket back to Boston. And that's it. That's it. That's absolutely, positively all. Never fear. We won't be spoil sports. If this is your pleasure, we'll indulge you. Quite happily, I might add. It's the least we can do. You're joking. It smells old and musty. Who knows where it's been? Here, Emily. Let me help you fasten it to your head. But the germs. Don't be an idiot. Put on the miserable mask. Don't throw away a fortune because of your wretched hypochondria. Oh, ho, ho! All right, Jason. We're doing it. See? And now, I'm putting on mine. How do I look, everyone? Oh, Paula, Willie, do as your father says. What do we do now? Dance, sing, or vote for the ugly prize? <laughs> you win, sis. Man, look at the stout on her. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. And now, dear ones, it's my turn. Now let's all wait for the stroke of midnight, when all things will be revealed. <laughs> Evening, Jeffrey. Nola. How's Mr. Foster doing? He's up and around. He is. Mm-hmm. In his electric wheelchair. 
I took him into the study. <laughs> that man. I reckon he wants to spend time with his relations. Well, they look like they don't want to spend time with him. Let me ask you something. What does he plan to do with those masks? I think he wants to play a game with them. With the masks? Or his people? <laughs> Beats me. He better be real careful. Why's that? He had me buy those masks down in the quarter. Wanted them made special by some witch man who does voodoo and such. I told him, Mr. Foster, don't you go mess around with that stuff. That's the devil's work. Nola, he said, don't you worry. I know what I'm doing. I surely do hope he was right. Me too. Once you go that way, there's no turning back. That's the truth. Help me put away these dishes, Jeffrey. It's getting late. If you say so, Ma. <laughs> At least it's music. Don't you even have a stereo, Grandpa? Sorry to disappoint you, fair one. Well, this is a blast and a half. <laughs> I've already looked at every magazine, every creepy old antique. Not everything, Paula. There's no end of treasures in this room. Like what? These books, for example. How old they are, how rare. <sighs> Their first editions, aren't they, Jason? All of them. All of them. Imagine that. They must have taken you years to collect. A lifetime. Freud, Audubon, William James. Who is this? Lovecraft. I see his autograph in one. The Shadow Over Innsmouth. Very rare. You should read it sometime. About people who aren't what they appear to be. Pretty valuable, I suppose. Extremely. Of course, not as valuable as the oils. Hey, you might be surprised. Although the paintings have been appraised at several million dollars. That much? Mm. <laughs> Father, is it close to 12 yet? Patience, Emily. Good things come to those who wait. I can hardly breathe behind this mask. I'm suffocating. It won't be long now, I promise. Where's the TV? <laughs> you gotta have a TV. Sorry, no cartoons for you tonight. Oh, we don't need entertainment. Why would we? We're rocking out right here in this room. We're getting down, aren't we? Hey, having a ball. We're raising the roof. Party on, everybody. Let's play charades. Spin the bottle. Post office! Eee! Let's go! Let's do it! Let's... Oh, look what you've done. I couldn't help it. Just lost my head, I guess. It was an accident, okay? Oh, I'll clean it up. Eh, the maid will take care of it. But the value, it must be irreplaceable. Eh, not really. Just an early Ming Dynasty vase. Still plenty of them available. I'm taking this thing off my face. I can't stand it one more minute. Paula, don't be a fool. Oh, I don't blame her. I don't blame the child one bit. Nor do I. How could I? We each behave according to our natures. I told you it was an accident. This is cruel, Father. A cruel, heartless torture. I have to agree, Jason. Really, this has gone far enough. We've been in this room for three hours, regarding each other through these grotesque masks. There's a limit, and we've all reached it. I must tell you, as far as I'm concerned, this is nothing more nor less than madness. Junior, what are you doing? <laughs> I've had it too. I am not a bozo. <laughs> oh, please. Father, please let us take them off! Jason, we're waiting. Speak to us. Have you all had your say now? Anything more from you, Paula? Junior? Emily, the flower of my loins? Or you, Wilfred, the benevolent captain of industry? Is there anything else you have to tell me? Speak now or forever hold your peace. <sighs> 
only that I, I'm feeling buried alive. I agree with Dad. I think anybody who would do this is out of his mind. Please, Pop, <laughs> let us take him off. I appeal to you, Jason, from the bottom of my heart, for the sake of my family, for all of our sakes. <sighs> <sighs> Open the window to the street for me, would you? One last time. If you like. <gasps> but my birthday! Shut up, Emily. Ah, the sounds of the night. They come from far and wide to partake of pleasure. A joyous celebration of life. Unlike you, who are without joy. I don't think that's fair. Of course you don't, because you are the object of this particular jape. Listen to them out there. Do you hear whining, complaining, anger? I don't. I hear happiness, simple pleasures, food, drink, the joy of being together, of being alive, as if they know it's fleeting, precious. But those of us in this room, we have a different agenda, don't we? And what of you? What do you get out of it? Satisfaction. A kind of grand culmination. Uh, 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 close the window. What is it? It's what you've been waiting for, I believe. The anointed time when you can all dig deep into the treasury. You're, you're feeling weaker, Father? Ah, at last. A note of hope in your voice, Emily. Why must you say such miserable, cruel things to me? To all of us. What have we ever done to you? Because you are a pitiful excuse for a family. That's why this is the only language you understand. If only we could respond in kind. If only we could open up to you without restraint in the same way you speak to us. If only we could tell you what we think of you. Fine, Wilfred. Excellent. <laughs> the truth at last. You've masked not only your faces, but your minds. Speak what's in you now. You're a twisted old man. Yes! Yes! Tell him, Daddy! You dangle us like puppets. You always have, taunting to get a response. You play with us as a cat does with mice. There is no humiliation you wouldn't subject us to. And for what reason? We've done everything you wanted, always. We've remained at your beck and call. Your slightest whim. Eh, my whim? What have I ever asked you to do before tonight? You visit when you see fit and have nothing to say when you do. <laughs> well, we do now. We sure do. <laughs> You're a stinking old man. <laughs> That's what you are. And it's time you die. Past time. <laughs> Why don't you? <laughs> Even the clown has found his voice, huh? I agree with them. Do you hear me, Father? I agree. It's time you let go of your grip on us. My grip, indeed. I have no grip on you. I tried to hold you once, but none of you respond to love. You, Emily, you respond only to what your petty self-absorption dictates. That's enough, Jason. Wilfred responds only to things that have weight and bulk and value. He feels books with his hands. He doesn't read them. He appraises paintings. He doesn't seek out their truth or their beauty. And Paula there. Paula has lived her life lost in a mirror. The world is nothing to her but a reflection of herself and her brother. Humanity to him is a small animal caught in a trap to be tormented. His pleasure is the giving of pain, and from this he receives the same sense of fulfillment that most human beings get from a kiss or an embrace. <laughs> so unfair, Father. Your caricatures, all of you, even without the masks. And this last note, 
I haven't held any of you here. You were always free to go. What's held you here has been my daughter's weakness, <coughs> my son-in-law's greed, my granddaughter's vanity, <coughs> and my grandson's cruel subhuman sadism. <coughs> <sighs> As soon as the clock chimes twelve, you will all be very rich. It's as good as done. Now you own everything I have owned. You've kept your bargain. You've worn the masks. <laughs> so now enjoy yourselves, my pretties. Live full lives, and may God, <laughs> may God have pity on you. Check his pulse. There is no pulse. At long last, he's dead. <laughs> so, what do we do now? What do you think we do? We take off the masks and celebrate. This nasty thing—it's stuck to my skin. My too. <laughs> Paul Junior, put your fingers under the chin and pull. Watch me. What's the matter with all of you? Your masks are off now. What's Wilfred? Your face, Wilfred. It's not your face anymore. It looks just like the mask. What are you talking about? Look in the mirror and then look at me. No, it, it can't be. But it is. What are we going to do? She's right. He did this. <laughs> that old creep. If he weren't already dead, <laughs> I'd kill him. No. no. Mr. Foster, are you all, Mr. Foster? Mr. Foster, sir! Call the doctor! Nola! Call him now! Where is he? In here. I called you right away, even though I, I knew. Strange mask. Like a death's head. Where are the others? In the room, sir. They practically ran upstairs. Oh, Jason, Jason. I'll take this mask off for you. You won't need it now, old friend. Would you just look at him? His face. So peaceful. Oh, Mr. Foster. Mr. Foster, sir. Don't cry for him, Jeffrey. This is his true face. Not a line on it. Not a care. No horror. No fear. Nothing but peace. I'll call the funeral home. This way, sir. Yes, uh, this is Dr. Sam Miller. I'm at the Foster home. Yes, that's right. Uh, Mr. Foster has passed away. Time of death, 12 midnight. Right, I'll fill out the death certificate. Someone will be here. His family. <laughs> Mardi Gras incident. The dramatist personae being four people who came to celebrate. It might be said that they partied with a vengeance. They now wear the faces of all that was pent up inside them. But unfortunately, they'll wear it on the outside for the rest of their lives. Said lives to be lived from this point on in the shadows. Tonight's tale of men, the macabre, and masks in a section of the Big Easy called... The Twilight Zone. The Masks, starring Stan Freeberg with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Mike Starr, Maggie Carney, Craig Brawley, Elizabeth Lado, Jeff Lupiton, Doug James, Kurt Nabig, Sarah Marks, and Carl Amari.
You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of imagination. That's the signpost up ahead. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Radio station WNYG. We will continue to stay on the air for traffic advisories and other essential news, including weather updates. Hmm, that's the spirit. First, a bulletin from the Office of Civil Defense. Traffic is slow moving north and east out of New York City. The Garden State Parkway, the Merritt Parkway, and the New York State Thruway are reportedly bumper to bumper. Motorists are advised to remain off the highways until further notice. It is now 11.55 Eastern Standard Time. The temperature is 104 degrees. Humidity 91%, barometer steady. Forecast for tomorrow. I got your forecast. More of the same. Oh, hey, Miss Bronson. I hope you don't mind, Norma. Not in the least. Come on in. I can't stay. Of course you can. I always like it in your apartment. <laughs> it's so much cooler. All I have is an old air conditioner and one little fan. That's more than I can say. Ah, well, they don't do much, believe me. Go ahead and leave the door open. We need the circulation. You're painting another picture. Just something to pass the time. Oh, no, you're a real artist. <laughs> I love the colors. Have you sold any lately? Nobody needs art these days, Miss Bronson. Not with all that's happening. Would you like a drink of water? I couldn't. There's a bottle in the fridge. But you need that for yourself. Nonsense. The repairman's trying to fix my refrigerator. You found a repairman? How'd you do that? It wasn't easy. Betty Ayers has a friend in the appliance business. She gave me his home number. It took him hours to get here. Well, at least he made it. It shouldn't take long to fix. If he can do anything with my old machine. I've heard there's a run on spare parts. I can understand why. In any event, I don't want to get in his way. Then you wait here with me. You sure you don't mind? I'll get the glasses and we'll both have some water. Ice water? Well, almost. At least it's cool. You must be parched. You're very kind. Ah, don't be silly. Thank you, Norma. I haven't had anything cold to drink all morning. Who's there? Well, hey, Susie. I'm thirsty. Are you, sweetie? Um, yes. Then come on in. Why, that's the first word I've heard the child say in ages. She just stands and watches. I think she's not right. <laughs> Who is these days? Come here, Susie. Don't be afraid. Would you like some too? Sure you would. Susie? Don't take the lady's water. Oh, it's all right, Miss Schuster. I've got plenty. Nobody has plenty. Mrs. Bronson, is that you in there? We're leaving now. Did you get gas? Yeah, I, I got 12 gallons. I figured it'd at least take us to Buffalo. You're carrying everything with you? Yeah, just what we can fit in these suitcases. Where are you going? We're trying to get to Toronto. My husband has a cousin there. I'm not sure that's wise. The highways are still packed. Bumper to bumper, the radio says. Even with the gas shortage and everything. I know that, but we got to try anyway. Look, we wanted to say goodbye. We've enjoyed living here, Mrs. Bronson. You've been real kind. Let's go, honey. Susie? Finish your water. There. Bye now, Susie. Bye. You be good. And have a safe trip. Good luck. And now we are two. They were the last? The last. The building's empty. 
except for you and me. What happens now? I don't know. I heard on the radio that they'll only turn the water on for an hour a day starting tomorrow. Hmm. They said they'd announce what time. Aren't you going to leave? No, of course not. You'll stay here and paint your pictures no matter what, won't you? <laughs> for a while, I suppose. I'm not sure what I'll do later. Like this new one with all the colors. What is it? Can't you tell? Well, it does look like... Like... It's the sun, Miss Bronson, the sun. Oh, my dear. Why do you keep painting that? I can't help it. But I keep getting this crazy thought, Miss Bronson. This crazy thought that I'll wake up and none of this will have happened. I'll wake up in a cool bed and it'll be night outside. Oh, wouldn't that be lovely? And there'll be a wind. Yes. And branches rustling. Shadows on the sidewalk. A moon. Oh, Norma. <laughs> Traffic noises outside instead of... All this nothing. Automobiles, garbage cans, milk bottles, voices, anything. Isn't it odd? Isn't it odd the things we take for granted while we had them? There was a scientist on the radio this morning. He said that, that it would get a lot hotter. More each day now that we're moving so close to the sun. And that's why we're... And that's why we're... The word that Mrs. Bronson is unable to put into the hot, still, sodden air is doomed. Because all the people you've met have been handed a death sentence. One month ago, the Earth suddenly, inexplicably, almost capriciously, changed its elliptical orbit and in doing so began to follow a path which gradually, moment by moment, day by day, took it closer to the sun. It is twelve o'clock, but the twelve is midnight. There is no more darkness, no more night. And all the little luxuries like air conditioning, refrigerators, the insignificant devices we use to stir the air are now no longer luxuries. They happen to be pitiful and panicky keys to survival. The time is any time. The place is New York City. And this is the eve of the end. Outside, a city has emptied itself of its inhabitants. They have trekked north toward Canada in a hopeless race against a sun which has already begun to overtake them. This is a world of heat, a brilliant white orb that draws closer with every tick of the clock. It is high noon, the hottest day in history, and you're about to spend it in the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story... Midnight Sun, starring Kim Fields, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Would you care for another drink of water, Miss Bronson? I've taken more than my share. Forgive me, Norma. Oh, after all you've done for me, don't you talk that way. Oh, there's the repairman. Hey, you looking for Miss Bronson? She's in here. He's running again, ma'am. Oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> I tell you, I wouldn't sign no guarantee as to how long she'll run, but she shouldn't give you any trouble for a while. Oh, that's such a relief. You don't know. Yeah, I do. I've been to four buildings already today. People treat me like I'm a lifesaver or something. You are. Hey, I'm only doing my job. I don't like to ask, but... Was you going to pay for this in cash? I have a charge card. Well, the, the boss says I should start collecting in cash. Uh, on account of the bank's shutting down and everything. What? Is that true? I didn't hear anything on the newscast. I know they cut back their hours. Y yes, ma'am. Most branches don't open at all anymore. And cash machines? Forget it. The gangs are hauling those away right and left. It's a cash business nowadays. So, uh, we've been working around the clock. 
Have you? Refrigerators breaking down every minute and a half. Everybody and his brother trying to make ice. Then, with the current being shut off every couple hours, it's tough on the machines. You know, the, the compressors. You can't get decent copper tubing to save your life. Look, uh, Miss Bronson, about the bill. How much is it? I gotta charge you a hundred dollars. For fifteen minutes work? For fifteen minutes work. Most outfits are charging double that. Triple even. It's been that way for a month. Ever since... Ever since the thing happened. I don't have any money left, but... What are you doing? This ring is gold. Don't, Miss Bronson. It's worth a lot more than a hundred dollars. It's priceless. Put it away. Go ahead, charge it. I ain't taking a lady's wedding ring. Goodbye, Miss Bronson. Good luck to the both of you. Thank you. I'm in no hurry to get back out there, let me tell you. Look at that sky. I don't think I ever saw a white sky before. Is that what it is now? White? I'm going to try to get my family out tonight. Drive north Canada if we can make it. They say it's cooler there. Not that it makes that much difference. But just kind of, kind of prolonging it. Everybody rushing to fix their refrigerators and air conditioners. It's like somebody drowning in the ocean and trying to get hold of, uh, I don't know, a piece of seaweed. I'm sorry. I didn't know what else to do, so I called you. It's nuts. Just prolonging it. That's all. Lordy. Lordy, it's hot. How do you paint a white sky, Norma? You can't. Not really. Just layer on a lot of paint with a palette knife, swirl it around, mix with some yellow and magnesium, maybe cobalt blue highlights. I'm running out of all of them. I think I got one tube left of each. Then what will you do? Paint the things I used to paint, I suppose. I'd much rather do that anyway. If I can remember. That kind of white you're talking about. It's a color that's not supposed to be. That's what I think. It's not the same as you see in flowers. In things that are alive. I know. It's actually no color. The complete absence. At least on the canvas. With light, it's different. Then it's all the colors of the rainbow. But as if they're on fire. So bright you can't tell them apart. Like, outside. Don't open the curtain. I I'd just as soon not know. I just want to see what it's like now. Before I go out. Oh, no. Please don't. Oh, just to the store. Yeah, I have to. Before things get any worse. What are they saying on the radio? I'll check. Ladies and gentlemen, this is WNYG. Please... Please remain off the highways until further... You hear that, Norm? And now the weather forecast from the Director of Meteorology. The forecast for tomorrow is... The forecast for tomorrow... Sounds like he's losing it, too. Well, just... What did you think? Hot. What is he talking about? I don't care. Who are they kidding with this stuff? Ladies and gentlemen, he's tomorrow nuts. you're going to be able to fry eggs on the sidewalk. Heat up soup in the ocean and get yourself the sunburn of your life just by standing still in the shade. Turn it off. Wait, I want to hear this. <laughs> what Stop you it. You're going what to cause people to panic. What do you mean, don't panic? Who's left to panic? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm, uh, I'm told that my departing from the script might panic you. But my name's not Orson Welles, and this isn't an invasion from Mars or some such. That's it. I'm pulling the plug. Don't you try it. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, but... It's, it's my contention that there aren't 12 of you left in the city who are listening to me anyway. So I'm starting a special contest right now. Anyone within the sound of my voice can tear off a box top. Oh, no. Make that the top of their thermometer. Mail it to me. 
I'll send them my own specially devised booklet on how to stay warm when the sun is out at midnight. Now, maybe I can find a couple of commercials with real pizzazz for you. How about a nice cold beer? Wouldn't that taste just great right now? Let me alone. Fool, stop just, it! Just, do you hear me? Let me alone. Come on! I said, let go of it. You see, honey, you're not the only person who's frightened. What about you? How much longer can you go on? As long as I can. There isn't much choice, is there? So you can keep painting your pictures. Oh, I don't know that I care about that now. But you should. They're a record of how it was. I suppose. But there's no assurance that anyone will be around to see them, is there? Then why do you still paint? <laughs> because I always have. It's the one thing I can do. Even if it doesn't matter to anyone else. I don't know how you keep going. I really don't. Neither do I, Miss Bronson. Neither do I. Norma, is that you, honey? Yes, Miss Bronson. Why, just look at all those groceries. The store was open. Ooh, wide open. I think that's the first time in my life I was sorry I'd been born a woman. <laughs> this was all I was strong enough to carry. There weren't any clerks, Miss Bronson. Just a handful of people taking all they could grab. At least we won't starve. And there are three cans of fruit juice in the bottom of the bag. We'll try one as soon as I turn the fan on. Fruit juice! Oh, Norma, do you think we could open one now? Of course we can open one now. Where's your can opener? In the other drawer. Go ahead while I put the food away. May I? I can do it for you. No, no, let me. Oh, 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 I'm terribly sorry. I'm acting like a, like an animal, aren't I? Like a frightened woman, that's all. You should have seen me in the store, Miss Bronson, running down the aisles. I mean, running. This way and that way, knocking things over, grabbing and throwing away, and then, then grabbing again. It was that bad. Oh, and at that, I think I was the calmest person in the store. One woman just stood in the center of the room and, and cried. Cried like a baby. Kept pleading for someone to help her. Go ahead. It's grapefruit juice. I can't. I can't just live off you, Norma. You'll need this yourself. We're going to have to start living off each other, Miss Bronson. Here's looking at you. Well then, here's looking at you too. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, the current's off again. Every day it stays on for a shorter time. What if, what if it shuts off and doesn't come back on again? It would be like an oven in here, as hot as it is now, as unbearable. It would be so much worse. Norma, it would be so much worse. You mustn't think that way. Norma. Yeah. Paint something different today. All right. Paint something like a pastoral scene with a waterfall and trees bending in the wind. Paint something. Something cool. Not like this. Please. Don't paint the sun anymore. I'll try. I'm working on a new one for you. How about that waterfall? Oh, Norma. I'm sorry. My dear child. I'm so sorry. 
It would be so much better if... If what? If I were to die. So much better for you. Please don't ever say that again. We need each other now. We need each other desperately. Hello? Anybody still up here? Yes, officer. Can I help you? Say, are you the only one in the building? Just me and Miss Smith. Well, have you had your radio on lately? It's on all the time. No, my honey, what station did we hit? It doesn't make any difference. There are only two or three on the air now, and they figure by tomorrow, well, there won't be any. Point is, we've been trying to get a public announcement through to everyone left in the city. What announcement? There isn't going to be a police force tomorrow. We're disbanding. What? Over half of them have gone already. A few of us have volunteered to stay back and tell everyone we could to keep your doors locked. Why? You don't mean... Every wild man crank and maniac around will be roaming the streets. It's not going to be safe, ladies. So keep your doors locked. You got any weapons in there, miss? No. No, I don't. I don't either. I wouldn't know how to shoot a gun. Well, here, here. You better hang on to this. It's a 45, all loaded. Safety's off. Just pull the trigger if you need to. Officer, what's going to happen? Well, don't you know? It's just going to get hotter and hotter. Then maybe a couple of days from now, four or five at the most, it'll be too hot to stand it. Then, well, at least you got the gun. Then you use your own judgment, ladies. Good day. Miss Bronson? Miss Bronson? You all right? I'm all right. It's been so quiet. I, I haven't heard a sound. What time is it? My watch is running slow. About three. Three o'clock? Yeah. In the afternoon. Were you able to sleep? I, I laid down for a while. Mm. Good for you. I tried shutting the curtains to keep the light out. You had them open? I couldn't fight it anymore. It gets so stifling when they're closed. I guess it's psychological, isn't it? I don't think there's much difference between out there and in here. What's outside will be in here soon enough. No reason to hurry. What was that? Something. Something fell. Oh, no. No, it was someone. Didn't you lock the roof door? Yes. No. I don't know. I can't remember. I thought I did. Come with me. Where are we going? To my apartment. They might not bother with this floor. They might see all the empty apartments and think everyone has moved out already. Now, Miss Bronson. Norma! Shh! What are we going to do? Hey! Who's in there? Somebody in there? What should we do? Don't make a sound. Come on out, Tootsie. I know you're in there. Come out and be friendly. Hurry it up, I ain't got all day. You come out, or I'm coming in. Did you hear that? I heard something. That was a gun. A big one. Yeah? What else you got in there? You got a bottle in there by any chance? A real bottle? Vodka? Whiskey? Rum? Anything. I'm not particular. How about a little drink? It's a 45. I'm pointing it at the door right now. Hey, I ain't so bad once you get to know me. Get out. Just get out. 
Leave us alone. Go downstairs to the front door, walk outside, and keep going. Don't look up at this window, and I'll forget about it. Okay, honey. I never argue with a lady who has a gun. He's gone. Of course he is. I'm so glad. I'm gonna put the gun away. Miss Bronson, don't open the door yet. Wait a You can't come in here. I said I have a gun right here. Back off. Crazy dames. It's too hot to play games. Much too hot. You got that drink now? No. Sure you do. I got the gun, see? So I'm asking you one more time, real polite like. You can make it easy on yourself or not. Don't make no difference to me. There's water in the fridge. You might have just said the magic word. It ain't cold. It's all I got. It's all she has. It'll do. Ah. <clears throat> Are you going now? You promised. Well, well. Look at all the pretty pictures. You do these? You got what you wanted. Get out. Picture of an empty street. I know where that is. Right outside. And a big sun in the sky and everyone. But you're good. You paint real good. My... My wife used to paint. Please. Please leave us alone. We didn't do you any harm. Please. Do you want to talk about her? Who? Your wife. If you want to talk, I'll listen. My wife. She was having our baby. We waited a long time. She was in the hospital and then this, this business with the weather happened. Everything went bad. She... Would you mind putting the gun down? She was... She was so fragile. The baby. Just a little thing. She had the tiniest little fingernails you ever saw. And her ears reminded me of seashells. I bet she was beautiful. She was. She couldn't take the heat, though. They tried to keep her cool, but... Then the air went out in the hospital and she couldn't take the heat. Baby didn't live more than an hour, and then... And then she followed her. I'm terribly sorry. I don't know what I'm telling you this for. We all need someone to talk to. It makes it easier. And the way things are now, people don't see their friends anymore. Because... Because it's so hard. So we stay inside and wait. You got that right. That's why I hit the street. I'm not just gonna sit there and wait for it to happen. But you gotta remember one thing. What's that? We don't know what's next. We can't be sure, none of us can. And maybe, just maybe, it's something better. Some things we're not supposed to know. Otherwise there'd be no point in being alive, now would there? What made you so smart anyway? You seem like a decent man. I am. I'm not a housebreaker, I swear to you. I'm a decent guy. It's just the heat. That terrible heat out there, no matter where you go. And all morning long, I've been walking around the streets trying to find some water. I didn't mean to do you any harm, honest. I wouldn't hurt you. I know. I can see that. <laughs> Would you believe it? I was scared of you. <laughs> That's right. I was just as scared of you as you were of me. I'm sorry about your water bottle. I'm off my rocker, I guess. I was just so thirsty. Forgive me, would you? Would you please forgive me? Yeah. 
That means a lot. Where will you go now? I think I'll go home. Here's your gun. I don't want it. I wouldn't have used it anyway. I don't think I would have either. Will you tell me one thing? If I can't. What I want to know is, why don't we just burn up and get it over with? That's all that's left now. Just to have it end. All of it. You okay, Miss Bronson? He's right, you know. About what? About everything. All of it. I want it to be over. You don't know what you're saying. I do, Norma. I do. I want what he wants. Stop it. There's more to life than... Than what? Than waiting for it to end. What? Tell me what? I'm old, Norma. I've lived my life. There's nothing ahead of me. Only what's behind. That's not a decision any of us can make. It's not for us to... I know myself, Norma. And I know how much I hurt. My bones ache all the time now. My legs, my hands. I can't even sleep. I don't want to. Because of the dreams. The nightmares. From now on, it can only get worse. And worse and worse. Until I pray I will not wake up. But it may change. The orbit, the ellipse, it can shift again. And then, who knows? You could have years ahead of you, wonderful years. But we don't. No one does. It's a matter of days now. Hours, that's all. That's all any of us have left. Why must we prolong it? We have to be brave. I'm not strong enough. Then I'll help you. We'll help each other. Will you help me? Of course I will. You know that. We're friends, aren't we? I can do it with your help. We can do it together. Do... Help each other to end it. Miss Bronson. It would be so much easier. Here, here's the gun. Give it to me. Yes, but you have to promise. Let me be the first to go. Would you do it for me? I'm afraid I'm too weak. Then it can be your turn. Give me the gun. Only if you promise. I won't promise to anything of the sort. Put it down. You don't know what you're doing. Yes, I do. If you won't help me, I'll do it myself. I can work it. I watched you and the policeman. It's easy. Just cock the hammer. Miss Bronson, no! <laughs> I said, give it to me. I'm sorry, Norma. So sorry. I don't know what I was thinking. I only know I can't go on like this. There, there. It's all right. All you did was make a little old hole in the wall. See? It went through your new canvas. Oh, Norma, what must you think of me? <laughs> no harm done. I can fix it. I'll help you. It's your picture now anyway. What? I painted it for you. Norma, no. 
It was going to be a gift. You shouldn't have gone to so much trouble. I'll set it right here so you can see it. Do you like it? Oh, I do. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to be careful for a while, though. The paint's still wet. It's beautiful, Norma. You think so? I've seen waterfalls like that. You have? And you have too, I can tell. <laughs> I was working from memory. I'm not sure when or where. There's one just like it near Ithaca, New York. It's the highest waterfall, the highest waterfall in this part of the country. And I... I love the sound of it. <laughs> that clear blue water tumbling over the rocks. The wonderful clear water. You hear it? I'm not sure. Oh, no. It's lovely. Just lovely. Why... Do you know something? Why don't you tell me? We could take a swim. Now. I think you better leave the window closed, Miss Bronson. Let's do that. Oh, can we? Let's take a swim at the bottom of the waterfall. I used to do that when I was a girl. Just sit there and let the water... I'm down on you. Miss Bronson! Miss Bronson! <gasps> Miss Bronson! <laughs> Take them! All the pictures, I want you to have them! Please! Please! They should have dried in this in this heat, but the the paint is the paint is sticky. No, I I don't believe it. It's melting. Gotta gotta close the window and, and keep the heat out. The glass is so hot. Even the even the curtains. Help! Help! Fire! Help! Someone, anybody, please! <laughs> Fire! How is she, Doctor? She's coming out of it now. Should I leave the blankets on her bed? For a while longer. We don't want her to get a chill. I'll turn the heat up as soon as it comes on again. Miss Smith? Miss Smith? Yes? You've been running a very high fever, but I think it's finally broken. F fever? You gave us a start, child. You've been so ill. But you're going to be all right now. Of course. Look in on her every few minutes. Give her something hot to drink if you can. I'll do that. I hope she'll be all right. Just let her sleep as much as she can. I will. I wish I had something left to give her. But the medicine's pretty much all gone now. You've done so much already, just stopping by. I know how hard it was for you to get here. Don't thank me, Miss Bronson. I've hardly done anything. Do you have to leave right away? It's snowing so badly. I'm afraid so. When will you be back to check on her? I'm sorry, but I don't think I'll be back this way again. Oh? I'm going to try to move my family south tomorrow. Oh, dear. Is that wise? Well, a friend of mine has a private plane. Otherwise, I wouldn't risk it. Of course, it's still risky with ice on the wings and all. But we've got enough fuel. If we keep it in the hangar till morning, it should start. They say... They say on the radio when they're broadcasting that... Miami is a little warmer. So they say. You know, sometimes I think we're just prolonging it. That's all we're doing. 
Everybody's running like scared rabbits as far south as they can get. And they say that within a week, everything will be covered with snow down there, too. I only hope the heat comes back on. I can tell it's going to get worse, even here. Especially here. How many are left in the building? Well, the Schusters say they're going to move out if they can get their car running and find some gas. And then we'll be two. Just me and Norma. Radio station WNYG. We will continue to stay on the air for traffic advisories and other essential news, including weather updates. They're back on the air. Turn it up. This is a traffic advisory from the Office of Civil Defense. Motorists are advised to stay off the highways on all routes leading south and west out of New York City. We repeat this advisory, remain off the highways. Also, please conserve heating oil as government reserves are almost depleted. There was a scientist on this morning. He was trying to explain what happened. How, how the Earth changed its orbit and... and started to move away from the sun. He said that, he said that within a week or two, three at the most, there wouldn't be any sun in the sky. That we'd all, we'd all freeze. Just like that. I know. That's what they say. I'll be going now. Don't forget your coat. And your muffler. God be with you. You too, ma'am. Both of you. Miss Bronson. I'm right here, dear. And how are you feeling, Norma? Mm. I had such a terrible dream, Miss Bronson. Oh, now. Mm, it was so... Hot, and there was daylight all the time, and there was a, what do they call it, a midnight sun. There wasn't any night at all, no night at all, nowhere. That was quite a dream. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful? What, dear? I'm just being here, to have darkness and... Coolness. You don't know. You can't imagine. Yes, my dear. My dear, dear Norma. It is. It's wonderful. The poles of fear, the extremes of how the earth might conceivably be doomed. Some say by fire, some say ice. No one knows which, if either, it will be. But the mind remains restless, awake in the night, imagining how it will come. The truth, however, may not be ours to know except in dreams when imagination whispers warnings to us all. And who can say what truths lie in the messages from that much maligned region where there are no road maps to point a way out of endless darkness or endless day. But don't lose any sleep over it, not just yet. It's all a trick of the mind. That vast, uncharted continent explored only by the bravest and most reckless among us. The ones we call seers and artists. For now, this simple exercise in the care and feeding of a nightmare, respectfully submitted by all the dreamers and thermometer watchers in the twilight zone. Midnight Sun, starring Kim Fields, with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling and adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison. Heard in the cast were Taylor Miller, Doug James, Linda Ryder, Lauren Patton, Rich Kamenick, Turk Muller, Lynn Foley, and Guy Burrell. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, 
and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Okay, Pete, let's mark it off. Starting where? The dugout. Run a chalk line in front of the fence all the way to the gate so they can bulldoze it flat. Wait, what's the dugout? Where the team would wait. They'd sit on the bench, shoot the bull. <laughs> Sometimes McGarry would chew my butt good. Oh, I know what a dugout is, but why'd you call it that? I, I don't see any bench. Not now you don't. It used to be right over there, under the bleachers. Near home plate. Okay, I get it. This place used to be a ballpark. Of course, that was before my time. Yeah, I'll bet it was. <laughs> I always thought this was a track for motocross and monster trucks. My old man used to take me before it was a swap meet, I mean. That right. There was just one truck, the Grave Digger. Oh, man, you should have seen it. Big old tires roll right over anything. How old are you, kid? Me, 22. 22? I was out of high school before you were born. You know what? You really missed a lot. Yeah, Pops, back in the day. Hey, you ever see the monster trucks? Afraid I missed it. Ever see the Zephyrs? The what? Only the greatest ball club there ever was. Sure. <laughs> That's why I never heard of them. Yeah, World Series champs, huh? They could have been. Let me tell you. And they almost did. One year in particular. We better get back to work, Corgan. Wait a while, kid. I want to tell you a story. You bring your lunch? Uh, sure, I brought it. In the truck. Then let's take a load off. Good time for a break. It's okay by me. We can sit over there in the pitcher's mouth. Of course, you can't see it anymore, but it was there. Fletch was the regular pitcher. He was a nice guy, but he had an arm like an old lady. Then one day added a blue. Oh, you're not gonna believe this. Oh, one day what? Well, it was, uh, it must have been July. Yeah, that's it. Middle of the season, everybody was talking about the Giants, how good they look, what a lineup, blah, blah, blah. The Zephyrs were stuck in a the toilet. Then one day, McGarry, that was the manager, he called for open tryouts. Why not? Couldn't be any worse than what we had. And that was when he came along. Didn't look like much. But when he wound up, man, what an arm. Who? I'm getting to it. Better start at the beginning. It was a hot one that year. No rain. Down. You're standing in the middle of what used to be a baseball stadium. Now the grandstand is falling apart, the field is covered with weeds, and the men who played here are nothing but ghosts. But believe it or not, this was once home to a major league team known as the Hoboken Zephyrs. Never heard of them? That's not surprising unless you're one of the old-timers. Today it holds only memories and no sound except the wind that stirs in the high grass of the outfield. A wind that on occasion still carries a faint, eerie echo of the crowd that once sat in those bleachers. We're about to travel back in time to a day when the Hoboken Zephyrs were still a part of the National League. And this mausoleum of memories was an honest to Pete attraction. But since it's strictly a story of make-believe, we must begin this way. Once upon a time in New Jersey, a most unusual event happened on the way to the ballpark. In a moment, you'll meet the cause of that event, a left-hander named Casey. Not the most original of monikers, but that's what he was called. So sit back, grab a hot dog and a bag of peanuts, and get ready for the playoffs. Because this particular broadcast is brought to you live from the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, 
The Mighty Casey, starring Paul Dooley, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. All right, new guys, let me see what you got. Give me 50 jumping jacks. Make it 100. Make it 100. Then take a lap around the field. Two laps. You got him, McGarry. Of course, One, if we burn them out two, too fast... They yeah. better learn to hustle or they're out of here. Five, okay, six, Mouth, you say so. Seven, Let me hear you count. Eight, nine, nine, ten, ten, ten eight, eleven, 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 twelve, twelve, twelve thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Uh, Morning, McGarry. Beasley. Four great-looking boys, huh? The one with the black socks with the floor shimes brought a note from his mother. Who are you expecting, the All-Stars? Post a sign for open tryouts in a last-place club that happens to be 31 games out of first place, and this is what shows up. You never know, I guess. Might be some talent out there. Yeah, and you might be Yogi Berra. I can't make something out of nothing. You're the owner of the club. You gotta give me some ball players. Think you'd know what to do with them if I did? 20 games out of fourth place, and the only big average we've got is a manager with the widest mouth in the business. When the Zephyrs win one game, we gotta call it a streak. Buddy boy, when contract time comes around, you don't have to. Sure, you let me go. Who you gonna get? Now think of something. You can always manage the team yourself. Ah, uh, uh, one more time, Fletch. Ugh, try to get it over the plate. The OK monkey, I must have slept funny on my arm last night. How's the team doing? Are you kidding? Last week, Fletch pitched four innings and only gave up six runs. That makes him our most valuable player of the month. Hey! Hey! OK, let's see some sweat out there. New guys, take a lap. Oh, I get it. Dugout. What? Who? Just a minute, I'll ask him. McGarry! Yeah? You want to look at a pitcher? You mean someone besides Fletcher? Now why would I want to do that? Send him down. New boy? Gotta warn you, he's a lefty. Lefty, schmefty. If he's got one arm that works, he's for us. Hey, Monk! Yeah? Fletch can take it easy now. I got a new boy coming in. Catch a few for him? Yeah, sure, Moth. Yeah, okay, Fletch. Go on, shower up. Check. One more lap, let's go. Uh, you got the lineup for tonight? I'm working on it. Who's the starting pitcher? I don't know yet. You don't know? Have to see how it goes. Whoever's hot gets a shot. Make that lukewarm. Oh, my. Chavez, that's enough with the laps. They look like they're gonna pass out. Check. Take five, boys. All right. All right, McGarry, I've seen enough. Yeah, you and me both. What's that? I said I'll see you on the sports page. I'll stop by later. You do that. Ah, uh, Mr. McGarry? Over there. Hey, Mouth, your new man's here. You gotta be kidding. Mr. Uh, Mr. McGarry, is it? Okay. What's the gag? I don't know what you... Come clean, Gramps. Did old man Beasley put you up to it? I'm afraid I, uh... Well, tell him I don't need a water boy. Thanks for coming by. Leave your name at the office. There must be some misunderstanding. I'm here about the pitching position. Right. Hardy har har Oh, I'm not a pitcher, though I've thrown a few baseballs in my time. Of course, that was before the war. Yeah? Which one? The Civil War? You don't look old enough for Valley Forge, but come to think of it, was the winter really as cold as they say? I represent Casey. Oh, Casey. Straight from Mudville, I bet. <laughs> Even got himself an agent. How much do you get? Ten percent of nothing? Here he is now. Him? What is he? A hundred and fifteen pounds soaking wet? Listen, no offense, but if a wind comes up, those ears will start flapping and he'll take off like Dumbo. Say hello, Casey. Nice one, Miller. Oh, pleased to meet you. Hey, watch out. I said watch out, the ball's coming down. Step aside, Casey. Now, boy. I said... Ooh. Ow! Right on the old bean. That must have hurt. You okay, fella? Oh, 
Casey's fine. Just fine. How come he's still standing? Must be out on his feet. I'll call an ambulance. Don't go suing us now. I wouldn't think of it. Casey, as I was saying, this is Mr. McGarry. He's the manager. Hello. Pleased to meet you. Do you want to lie down? Come on in the dugout. Shake hands, Casey. Uh, that's all right. You remember how to shake hands, don't you? Yes, sir. Right hand, Casey. Your right hand. Put her there, pal. Oh, ow! You can let go, Casey. That's right. Release now. Ow! Whoa! My hand! What a grip! Sorry. Casey doesn't know his own strength sometimes. Some arm? Never would have guessed it. Well, let's see what he can do. Mind if I try him out? That's what we're here for. Right, Casey? Correct. Okay. See that guy over there with the great big mitt? Yes, we see him. He's what's known as a catcher. His name is Monk. Ah. Go out there and throw him a few. Thank you, Mr. McCary. This I gotta see. Quite. You his father? Casey? Oh, no. He has no father. An orphan, huh? Mm, not exactly. I guess you'd call me his creator. That a fact? It is, actually. Come from around here, does he? Mm, you might say so. Uh-huh. How old is he? Hmm. Well, that's a little difficult to say. What's difficult about it? It's uh, hard to discuss Casey's age in chronological terms. He's only been in existence for a brief time. What I mean is, he has the mind and physique of roughly a 22-year-old, but in terms of how long he's been here, the answer would be three weeks. Huh? Approximately. Would you mind going over that again? You see, I'm an inventor. <laughs> I made Casey. You made? In my workshop. Well, that's swell, pal. There ain't too many homemade left-handers in the league. You don't understand. I'm serious. Sure you are. Anytime you're ready. Yes, sir. Oh, jeez, Louise. That's his fastball. Uh, try a curve now, Casey. His curve ball. Hey, uh, do that again, if you like. Hey! What was that? <laughs> we don't have a name for it yet. Uh, go ahead now, Casey. Don't hold back. Enough already. Something wrong? Wrong? What? You see him? That kid he picks up where Feller left off. He's got a fastball almost went through my glove. And a curve, and a hook, and a knuckler, or uh, whatever you want to call it. He got control like he uses radar. Oh, it's the best pitcher I ever caught in my life. Thanks, Monk. That's enough for today. I, I swear, I never seen anything like it. He don't even pitch like a human. Precisely. Well, he's still rough, Gramps. He's plenty rough, but uh, I might give him a try. If he can do the same thing when there's a game on. Oh, he can do it. Consistency's not a problem. <clears throat> he's a robot, you know. Yeah, don't say that. Don't ever say the word R-O-B-O-T-T -T around here. We'll just keep that one between us, okay? Did you like my pitching, Mr. McGarry? You might have a little potential, Casey, like I told Mr. Stillman here. Professor. The Professor Stillman. You're awful rough around the edges, but I think maybe we could give you a shot. I like to help young ball players. Now you go on into the locker room and find a uniform that fits. He can wear a uniform, can he? Anything you like. Then go and change and come back, and uh, we'll discuss a little contract. Just the three of us. That seems fair. Very kind of you, Mr. McCary. Don't mention it. Go on now. Say thank you, Casey. Thank you, Casey. Eh, thank you, sir. Come along. You're going to be a real baseball player now, just like I promised you. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. Wonderful.
General Manager's office? Uh, this is McGarry. Now listen, draw up a contract, new pitcher, name of Casey. No, I don't know his last name. Leave that part blank. Just do it. The only thing that's between us and a pennant now is if this guy's battery goes dead or he rusts in the rain. Never mind what I mean. Draw up the contract before he gets away. Good, good afternoon, sports fans. We're coming to you live for the last in a series of home games for the whole bulk and Zephyrs. The Bullets are already on the field, warming up, but <laughs> there's been a delay. The Zephyrs are still in the locker room. Now, we understand they're getting a last-minute pep talk from their manager, the colorful Mouth McGarry, and knowing him, it's an earful. Peanuts, red hot. Well, the Zephyrs are at the bottom of the league this season, which means this is a make-or-break situation. And rumor has it there's a new pitcher on the team, but that's unconfirmed. Ah, yes, a beautiful sunny day. Local fans all here, ready to root, root, root for the home team. Still uh, no sign of the boys from Hoboken. <clears throat> well, this might be a good time for a break uh, before the action starts. We'll try to get word in the locker room, but uh, till then, let's let's go to a commercial. And you're up. 50 seconds. How much longer do I have to fill? Beats me. What's with these losers? Well, if I was on that team, I guess I wouldn't want to show my face either. 45 seconds. Beer here, get your ice cold beer. Somebody get me a beer. I'm dying out here. What am I supposed to do? Play tiddlywinks? It's gonna be another slaughter anyway. Hey. Ask him if he's got anything stronger than beer. You can always read him the stats. There are no stats. If this team was any lower, they'd get stuck in the grass. What am I doing here? Get me another gig. Little League. The weather. I don't care. Just get me out. 20 seconds. The Zephyrs are charging onto the field. Oh, no. The Zephyrs look hungry this afternoon. <laughs> yeah, sure. Oh, who am I kidding? They're not going to show. The game's canceled, you'll see. 10 seconds to air. Oh, those bums, it's the same old story. Fletcher winds up, he throws, and he drops the ball on his foot. They should send out a bunch of chimpanzees. Five, four, three, two. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to more thrilling baseball action. You got the signals down now, kid? Okay, when you're ready to throw, you watch my fingers. See, I'll, I'll give you the hand signals, just like we practice. Remember the one for the fastball? This one. Yes. And a curve? Show him the one for a curveball. Yeah, it's right here. Well, what are we waiting for, Mom? This ain't a training session. This is for real. You're telling me? All right, kid. You got the signals down. Look, the main thing is, walk out there like you own the place. But be cool. Nice and steady. Cool? He means, don't be nervous. Nervous. Yeah, that's right. Whatever you're feeling, don't let it show. Pull your cap down over your eyes like this. You got nerves of steel, you know what I mean? Not steel, exactly. You know what nerves are, Casey. Oh, yes. Neurons, axons, and dendrites. In this case, nerves means ill at ease. As if one of your electrodes were uh, corroded and, um... Nervous, Casey. Like as if it's two out in the ninth and you're one up and you're pitching against Joe DiMaggio. He comes up to the plate, looking intent, eyes straight ahead. That wouldn't make me nervous. No? Why not? I don't know anyone named DiMaggio. <laughs> what? He never heard of... I know what he said. <laughs> He's a great kidder, ain't he? I love this guy. All right, fellas, this is it. Let's get going. It's time, Casey. Yes, sir. Mr. McGarry? Yeah? Are you coming? Yeah. Yeah, I'm coming. Something the matter? I was just, uh, thinking about the Giants. We're not playing the Giants today, are we? No, but I can't wait to knock them off. For that matter, 
I'd love to knock off the Phillies and the Cards, too. Or the Braves in Cincinnati. Or even the Hanksville Bullets. Them especially. Those bums beat us 11 to nothing in spring training. <laughs> I think that will happen. Casey will come through for you, Mr. McGarry. Most definitely. You never told me. What have you got riding on this? What's your angle? With Casey? My interest is purely scientific. I know he's a superman of sorts, but I need to have that proven under test conditions. You mean you can't guarantee he'll work? Oh, I have no doubts. Once I built a home economist to run my house. Marvelous cook. I gained 46 pounds before I had to uh, dismantle her. Now, with a model such as Casey, with his strength and accuracy, I knew he was destined to play baseball. And in order to prove my point, I had to have him pitch in competition. As an acid test, I settled on the absolute worst team I could find. E nothing personal. Nah, of course not. Very nice of you to think of us, Mr. Stillman. Eh, Professor Stillman. Professor, I really appreciate it. No kidding. You can feel excitement in the air as the Zephyrs take to the field. Hey, you bombs, do something. The pressure's on the home team, tensions are high, and there's a groundswell of support as this new pitcher approaches the mound. Well, it's do or die today. Fletcher's on the bench and the new man, uh, the only name I have is Casey, and frankly, he doesn't look like much. But his medal's about to be tested. Uh, to coin a phrase. Go home, kid. Your mother's calling you. The umpire signals for the start of the game. Play ball. The ball is whipped around the infield, and now the second baseman is hand carrying it over to Casey. He rubs it off on his jersey and hands it to him. The pitcher is, uh, yes, he finally takes it. He turns to face the batter, waiting for a signal. Here's the windup. He throws, the batter swings! Steve Rankin! Hey, not bad! I must have missed that one, folks. It looks like the batter missed it, too. It went over the plate so fast, he swung a full 360. Good gravy, was that a fastball? Lucky pitch. Let me see you do that again. Take your best shot. Second pitch. Here's the windup. Whoa, Nelly! Halloran tries to take a bite out of it and misses. He's off his feet. Looks like he threw his back out, twisted around like a pretzel. Good golly, Miss Molly, we got ourselves a pitching machine. In baseball news, here's a cutie for you. Seems there's a rookie in Hoboken who's pitched three straight shutouts. They said it couldn't be done, but with a blistering performance to sew up nine in a row. In a stunning comeback, the Zephyrs zoom to fourth place in the National League as Casey gets ready for number 14. And that makes three more no-hitters for the mighty Casey. The Zephyrs are locked into first place. Questions in the news this morning about the mysterious Casey. Where does he get his superhuman ability? Playoffs temporarily suspended as the Baseball Commission orders an investigation. Today's headline, The Mighty Casey. Is he on steroids? Good day. All right, Casey, if you just relax. What do you mean? He's relaxed. Let's get this over with, Doc. I'm going to sit down in front of you and strike your knee with this little rubber hammer. Why? It's a test, Casey. Nothing to get shook about. You mean shaken? Here we go. <laughs> Casey, watch where you're kicking. Well, I'd say his reflexes are 100%. That it, Doctor? Uh, not quite, Mr. Beasley. Just let me check his pulse and do a blood test. Oh, no. What's the matter? If Casey doesn't pass his physical, there goes the pennant. There goes the series. <laughs> there goes my career. But why are you worried? He doesn't take anything illegal, does he? Absolutely not. You may rely on it. Then... Uh, there's something I haven't told you, Beasley. What? Now to take your pulse. Hey, Doc. You really need to do that? Oh, a mere formality. He seems to be in A1 shape. 
absolute perfection, if I do say so. Quiet for a moment, gentlemen, while I listen through the stethoscope. Oh, boy. Here it comes. Breathe, please. Once more. What's wrong? Nothing. Uh, not a thing. Everything sounds fine. It's just that... Uh, Out with it. What? This... This man doesn't have a pulse. No heartbeat either. Try again. Uh, I already have. This man... This man isn't alive. He can't be. That's pretty funny, Doc. Okay, go ahead and draw your blood sample. We gotta get Casey cleared for the rest of the season. <sighs> I'm afraid that won't be possible. Why don't you wait out in the hall, Stillman? You're starting to get on my nerves. Nerves make up the neurological system in the human body. When a small electrical charge passes from one to another... Enough already! Mr. McGarry, it'll have to come out now. There's no way to avoid it, Doctor. What's this all about, Mouth? Beasley, you ain't gonna like this, but uh, see, I didn't have a choice. It was Casey or nothing. Are you trying to put something over on me? Ah, what a pitcher he was. The only ball player I ever had on the team who didn't eat nothing. Not even a hot dog. Doctor. Is there a problem? I think you should know something before you go any further. Go ahead. Give it to him. <sighs> Casey doesn't have any pulse or heartbeat because he doesn't have any heart. Uh, how's that? He's a robot. A what? You heard the man. A robot, or if you prefer, an android made from lifelike materials to resemble a human being. Are you sure? Oh, I should be. I built him. And he's been pitching for the Hoboken Zephyrs? Doctor, this is the first I've heard of it. Well, under the circumstances, I have no choice but to notify the baseball commissioner. Move over, Casey. I don't feel so good. Doc, uh, you got anything for a splitting headache? McGarry, you gave me your word. Yeah, that the team would win. I didn't say nothing about Yes, you did. You brought me Casey and... and I said I never seen anything like him. Did I lie? Not as such, but you can't run roughshod over the rules. I'm holding you in breach of contract. Me? What did I do? I got you a winner. Know how many tickets we sold? You never had such a season. All right, all right. Knock it off, you two. I'm the commissioner, and I say he's suspended. That's final. On what grounds? He didn't take no illegal substances. He doesn't have to. Everything about him is illegal, from the top of his head to the cleats on his shoes. He's a machine. So? <clears throat> Article 6, Section 2 of the Baseball Code, I quote, A team should consist of nine men. End quote. Men. Understand? Not robots or vacuum cleaners or mix matters. Commissioner, perhaps there's another way of looking at this. For all intents and purposes, he is human. Casey... Would you mind saying a few words? Tell us about yourself. Where should I begin? At the beginning, of course. Yeah, where was he born? All men are born, not to assemble in a machine shop. Go ahead, Casey. What state? I was born in a state of ignorance. There you go. My point exactly. Well, he can talk, can't he? He talks as good as me. That means he's got to be alive. I wouldn't count on it. But he is not human. Easy for you to say. How human do you want him? He's got arms, legs, a face. And ears. But no heart. He doesn't even own one. How can he be human without a heart? Beasley don't have a heart either. He owns 40% of the ball club. Now that's it, gentlemen. He doesn't have a heart. Ergo, he isn't human. And that's a violation of the baseball code. Therefore, he doesn't play. Mr. Commissioner, suppose this. Just for the sake of argument. Supposing I... Gave him a heart. You gave him? Where will you get one? At the local parts store? Hear me out. If that essential is the only thing that renders him different from the norm, I could try an operation. I think I could do it. In fact, I'm sure I could. Supply him with a self-contained mechanical heart, that is. Now you're talking, Prof. How about that, huh? What do you say? Mm, well, it would be very... Uh... 
Irregular. If he were to be given a heart, would medical science classify him as... Uh, what I mean is, could he then be called a... He had the doc fooled even without one. <sighs> All right. With a heart, I'll give him a temporary okay until the league meeting in October. Then we'll have to take it up in session. The other teams will scream bloody murder. I can see DeRocher now. Ah, then it's all settled. Casey gets a heart and accreditation as human, and the Zephyrs take it, Maldi. With pleasure. Hoboken wins the pennant for the first time in 23 years. So, where's Casey? Search me. He's supposed to be here. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Operator. Well, how's Casey? Is he coming? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? The Operator can't get an answer at Stillman's house. Well, maybe he's in the middle of the operation. So, he's in the middle of the operation. What's the matter? He can't use one hand to pick up the phone? We can't wait no longer. I gotta turn in the starting lineup. Corrigan? Yeah, Mouth. You'll pitch tonight. All the rest of you, same as before. Now listen, you guys. That's the enemy out there. That's the New York Giants. And while we're out there playing, a fellow named Casey is lying on a table struggling to make it. And I know. I know that the last words out of his mouth before the knife went into his chest were, go on out there and win one for me. And I'm going to tell you something else, fellas. From now on, from now on, there's going to be a ghost in that dugout. Every time you pick up a bat, look over to where Casey used to sit, because he'll be there in spirit, rooting for us, cheering for us, yelling, go Zephyrs, go. Hello. Oh, hi there, Professor. And I'm going to tell you something else about him. He has heart. Not a real heart, maybe, but that guy is lying there with a great big hole in his chest. He... He... Hello, Mr. McGarry. Hello. Now, as I was saying... Casey? Casey? Hey, hey, how you doing? Hey, welcome back. Hey. All right, all right. Knock it off. Quiet in here. Sorry we're late. Well, you got something to tell me? Go ahead, Casey. Listen, Mr. McGarry. I'm listening. He means his chest. Put your ear against it. Go ahead. Okay. Hear it, sir? I hear it. Casey, you got heart. And look at that smile on his face. That's the one thing I could never get him to do. Smile. How do you feel, boy? I feel... Well, frankly, I feel wonderful. Just wonderful. I feel togetherness with everybody. Then, let's go team! Yeah. Casey starts tonight. The new Casey. Now let's get out there and show them what we're made of. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, this is what we've all been waiting for, the big one. Oh, there's joy in Hoboken tonight, let me tell you. I wouldn't miss this one for the world. One of the greatest comeback streaks in history. Casey takes the pitcher's mound. The umpire signals the start of the game. Casey winds up. He throws. And it's a high fly over the wall and out of the park. That's a home run for the Giants. What a way to start the game. Well, that'll be a big one on the scoreboard. What's he doing? Cool it, guys. Casey's just playing with him, making it more exciting. You know what I mean? If you say so, Mouth. Another run for the Giants. Now it's three to nothing. What's wrong with the mighty Casey? That's what fans want to know. Giants. Looks like Casey's streak is history. Well, well, one minute he's three Bob Fellers rolled into one, and the next minute he's a tanker with nothing. You want to tell me what's going on? <sighs> it's rather complicated. Then you tell me, Casey. 
Let's start by explaining how one pitcher can throw nine balls and give up four singles, two doubles, a triple, and two home runs. I don't know what to say, Mr. McGarry. Shall I tell him? Tell me what? It's because Casey has a heart now. So? He has heart. Big deal. The thing is, Mr. McGarry, I just couldn't strike out those poor fellows. I didn't have it in me to do that, to hurt their feelings. I felt... I felt... He felt compassion. What? That's what he's got now. Compassion. See that smile on his face? Give an individual a heart, Mr. McGarry. Particularly someone like Casey, who hasn't been around long enough to understand things like competitiveness, or drive, or ego. And it's bound to happen. Oh, my aching back. I'm sorry, Mr. McGarry. I just couldn't hurt their careers. Professor Stillman thinks I should go into social work. I'd like to help people. That's what happens to you. Should I tell you what happens to me? I get shipped off to a baseball farm system that consists of one silo and a McCormick Reaper. The only thing we get come spring is a wheat crop. Right now, I'm gonna go have me a drink. Oh, Mr. McGarry. What do you want? I was wondering if I might come with you. What for? Do you mind, Casey? Oh, don't worry about me, sir. You go ahead. Good. Good. Now, Mr. McGarry, I've been doing some thinking. About what? The characteristics necessary to make a great baseball player. I figured out the mechanism for hooks and curves and sliders, and I think Casey is the perfect height. But when it comes to temperament, motivation, attitude, that sort of thing, there may be a better way. Such as? I might be persuaded to build another model, new and improved, who would work out even better. I could have him ready, say, for next year's spring training? Who's gonna pay for it? Oh, I've got the funding, don't worry. But I thought, if we could go over the plans together... What do you got in mind? Let me try you a picture. Geez, that's a heck of a story. Yep. Of course, it didn't work out. The professor didn't have the money. And he wanted certain, well, perks that old man Beasley wouldn't agree to. So it fell apart after that. But for a few weeks there, a bright, shining time it was. We didn't just have heart. We had hope. How do you know so much, Mr. Corrigan? Because I used to play with him when there still was a team called the Zephyrs. No kidding. Come on, we better get back to work. You finish your lunch? Yeah. Then let's go. They're gonna flatten this place to the ground tomorrow. We gotta get it marked off. I guess so. Once upon a time, there was a Major League Baseball team called the Hoboken Zephyrs, who, during the last year of their existence, wound up in last place and shortly thereafter were consigned to oblivion. There is a rumor, unsubstantiated of course, that a manager named McGarry took some of them to the West Coast and wound up with a pennant and a world's championship not long after. This newly revised team had a pretty fair lineup of pitchers with names like Drysdale, Koufax, and Sherry, or so the story goes. So if you're interested in where any of those now famous gentlemen really came from, here's a tip. Just check under B for baseball in the Twilight Zone.
You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. My name is Archibald Beechcraft, and to coin a phrase, welcome to my world. And a wonderful world it is. You might even call it paradise. To tell you the truth, I don't remember exactly how I got here, but I assure you I have no intentions of leaving. No intentions whatsoever. Why should I? Everything I need is here. The sand, the sea, the sky, as blue as a robin's egg, gently swaying palms, and absolutely nothing on the horizon. Nothing. And no one. Do you understand? Not a soul in sight as far as the eye can see. Only the occasional bottle that washes up on the beach. Like this one. Ah, <sighs> They're all the same. With a note inside, some poor soul scribbling a message for help. Whoever reads this, I am stranded on a desert island. Please send a rescue ship at once. <laughs> stranded? A rescue ship? The fool! Doesn't he know he's finally found peace? He's escaped from the crowds, the rat race, from civilization. Obviously an imbecile. Who would want to go back to that world? Cars, subways, buses, and people. Everywhere you look, yammering away, pushing and shoving till you can't breathe, can't think. No thanks. I've had my fill of people. If you don't mind, I'll live out my days like this. Alone. Quite blissfully alone. Except, of course, for Chi-Chi, the perfect companion. Never a word of disagreement. In fact, never a word of any kind. Because, you see, he's a chimpanzee. And a very intelligent one. If I'm hungry, he brings me a banana. When I'm thirsty, he climbs a tree and picks a ripe coconut. Have you ever tasted fresh coconut milk? Oh, you must. It's really quite refreshing. Hold on, Chi-Chi. What's this? A footprint? Well, that means... We're not alone, after all. But how can that be? This is my world! Wait a minute. Whoever made this footprint, do you suppose his name might be... Friday? If so, he'll speak an entirely different language. No communication whatsoever, and plenty of room for both of us. He'll have his half of the island, and I'll have mine. Unless, of course, Friday's a female. You think it's possible? Why, I don't see why not. A lovely native girl in a sarong with big brown eyes like a Walter Keene painting. And a tray of finger sandwiches, poi, that sort of thing. Maybe some Mai Tais. Who can't speak, of course. No, no, why should she? She'll live in her grass hut and I'll live in mine and we'll visit from time to time. An ideal arrangement, I'll give her a lay, a flower lay, whenever the spirit moves me. And when the spirit doesn't move me... Now, where's that coming from? There aren't any telephones on my island. It can't be a telephone booth on the beach. Most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. Yes? Yes, who is it? Who in the... Hello, who's there? Hello? Who? H Hello? Tropical Paradise, Beechcraft speaking. Hello? Hello? Oh. Oh, the alarm clock. I must have been dreaming again. What time is it? Half past six already? This is my world, all right. And welcome to it. A brief, if somewhat jarring, introduction to Mr. Archibald Beechcraft. A child of his time. A product of the population explosion. And an unwilling inheritor of the legacy of progress. He has just begun his daily battle for survival in a world that cares not one whit for his happiness or sanity. But very soon, our hero will begin a one-man rebellion against this impersonal age. And to do so, he will enlist the help of certain unusual aids of the sort found only in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Mind and the Matter, starring Hal Sparks, with Stacy Keach as your narrator.
Morning, Beechcraft. I don't see what's so good about it. How's that? If you'll excuse me, I'm late. <laughs> You're always late. Take it easy. You'll get there. I'm sure I will. And what an unmitigated joy that will be. 91, 92, 93. Stand aside. I don't have to. My mom said I could play. And I said move it. 94, 95, 96, 97. Why do you have to do that here, inside the building? Oh, you made me lose count. Now I have to start all over again. One, two, three, four. Get out of my way, you little wretch. Ma, that man called me a wretch. Hey, watch it, buddy. Sorry. Look where you're going. Beg your pardon. Hey, careful with the briefcase, huh? I, I'm late, you see. Hey, he almost knocked me down. If I miss my train... Red light, Mr. Red Light. But I can't wait for the light to change. If I do miss my train, then, then they'll dock my pay, meager though it may be. And if they do that, well, there's no limit to what they can do. I'm not about to jeopardize my position just because of all the rude, inconsiderate people who are, are ruining this city. Positively ruining. That's my train! Slow down, one at a time. But you see, officer, I absolutely must catch the 732 uptown. Keep your shirt on, pal. Let me through, please. Watch who you're pushing. You don't understand. This is my... Hands off, buddy. One person per token. I don't have a token. Well, then you better get one at the window. But I overslept. I'm late. One at a time, folks. Let's keep moving. Let me on, please. Hey, you stepped on my foot. Move to the back, please. This elevator's full. But I absolutely must get to the 15th floor. Won't you wait for the next one? I can't wait. I'm late as it is. I said this one's full. Surely there's room for one more. Sorry, Beechcraft. If I could just squeeze in. Will you watch the elbow? I do apologize. Going up. There's Mr. Beechcraft. Finally decided to make it, hmm? Better late than never. Morning, Laura. What happened to you? What didn't? If you'd been through what I've been through. Did you punch in? Yes. Mr. Rogers got here 15 minutes ago. I'm sure he did. I told him he went to get coffee. Coffee. That's what I need. Not now. And my blood pressure pills. Wait till the break. Look like you're busy. You mean pretend? I don't have to pretend. Of course, in a reasonable world where a person could work at his own pace with no pressure, no interruptions. Mr. Rogers will be back any minute. I'll bet he will. <sighs> All right. Where did I leave off yesterday? The Campbell file, as I recall. I'm finishing it for you. What? You shouldn't have done that. I'm quite capable. I know you are. I was only trying to help. Thank you, Laura. But if I could be allowed to concentrate without so many distractions, there'd be no problem. Here's your coffee, Miss Petty. Oh, thank you, Henry. You can call me Laura, you know. All right, Laura. I didn't know how you wanted it, so I got cream and sugar. Is that okay? That's fine. Kindly give it back. Hmm? The Campbell file. I'm just about to close it out. Where do you want me to set it? What? The coffee. Just a minute. If you please, Laura. Here you go. Oh, no. Why, you clumsy clod. Gosh, Mr. Beechcraft... I sure am sorry. You spilled it all over my jacket. I guess I didn't see you. That's precisely your problem. Try cold water before the stain sets. I'll get another cup. That's all right, Henry. No harm done. I ought to send you the cleaning bill. Is that Beechcraft? Yes, sir. Looks like he's headed for the washroom. Something the matter? Well, Mr. Rogers, you see, um... He's a little out of sorts this morning. Is he now? Feeling ill, Beechcraft? Hmm? Oh. No, sir. Nothing like that. If you'll forgive an observation, you're not looking too well. I'm all right, Mr. Rogers. You look tired. You know, Beechcraft, keeping yourself fit is not only a personal responsibility. In a larger sense, it's part of your obligation to the firm that employs you. Healthy body, healthy mind, and so forth. I'm not unaware of that. Then why don't you pull yourself together, man? Get enough sleep at night. I try to, sir. Eat regular meals. Lots of fresh vegetables. Greens. Oh, you can't beat those greens for vitamins. 
I'm a sprouts and spinach man myself. Are you? I'd have them for breakfast if I could. Believe me, Beechcraft, the secret is definitely in the greens. It's the color of power. I see. Not drinking, are you, Beechcraft? Touch of the old sauce? I don't drink, Mr. Rogers. Well, if you don't drink and you don't stay out late at night, you must not be watching your diet. From now on, see that you do. If you'd really like to know, Mr. Rogers, if you'd really like to know precisely why I'm so dead tired, try coming to work on the 732 subway train every morning, then jamming into an elevator with a herd of cattle, then trying to work in that... Den of cacophony you call an office. Hey, cold to yourself, Beechcraft. Then, standing in line in that so-called cafeteria during that so-called lunch hour, which is never more than 42 minutes. Oh, that's really good for the digestion. Then getting trampled to death in the subway again at 5.38 every night. Then standing in line with more people at a greasy spoon restaurant followed by another line at a movie or a concert or anywhere else I care to go. But always standing in line, always getting shoved, always getting jostled, always getting pushed around by more people. For goodness sakes, man, take hold. I'll take hold, Mr. Rogers. I'll take hold when I can achieve that milestone, that millennium, that absolute perfection that only comes with solitude. Understand? Solitude. That means no people. You read me, Mr. Rogers? They're the ultimate insult. And my problem is simply that I can't get away from them. At no time, except during the wondrous seven and a half hours I spend in my bed every night. And even then, I hear them outside. Hear what? People, raucous, shrieking, shouting people, herds, droves, legions, hosts, armies, bevies, flocks, and coveys of people, people, people. I don't like that look in your eye, Beechcraft. I don't like it one bit. If I had my way, here's how I'd fix the universe. I'd eliminate them all. I mean, cross them off, get rid of them. Send them packing, destroy them, and then there'd be only one man left. Me. Archibald Beechcraft Esquire. Let me out of here. You're quite mad. Do you know that, Beechcraft? You're either off or en route away from your rocker. Well, if I am, I very much prefer my madness to, to the so-called sanity around me. People, as far as I'm concerned, you can have them. If I had my way, I'd make them all disappear. Every last one. Well, well, well. Old Beechcraft's finally showing some gumption. Just the same, I'd best keep a close eye on him. A very close eye indeed. Baked fish? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Salisbury steak for me. Coming right up. Oh, and an extra roll. Vegetables with that? Uh, broccoli. Sure thing. No mashed potatoes, no french fries, no... I'll, uh, I'll have the succotash today. Club sandwich here. Dessert? How's the tapioca pudding? Lumpy. Uh, I need another fork. This one's dirty. You got it. One club sandwich, coleslaw, no fries, coffee black. There you go. That's it, sir. And that's right, the usual. So I see. Cash or charge? Cash. Get my wallet out of my pocket. There's hardly room to turn around. Here. Don't you have anything smaller? No, I'm afraid not. Your change. Hurry up, will you, buddy? We don't have all day. I'm doing my best. If you'd allow me to put my wallet away. Next, one double macaroni and cheese, salad with ranch. Excuse me. The seat's saved. Well, how about the one next to it? No, he'll be right back. Of course. Of course he will. Hey, Mr. Beechcraft, over here. Thank God. I'm obliged, Henry. Think nothing of it, Mr. Beechcraft. Squeeze right in. That was my plan. Been saving it for you. I was sort of, well, I wanted to make up for this morning. This morning? When I spilled coffee on your coat. I'm really sorry about that. Mm. Mm. Say, Mr. Beechcraft? Mm-hmm. I have a friend. Mm. You don't say. Works in the used bookstore around the corner. I went there before lunch. Whatever for? Oh, I like to read. All kinds of stuff. Do tell. Horror mostly. That's my favorite. Why am I not surprised? Some of those paperbacks are pretty cool, you know. 
There was one about these giant worms that live in the sub-sub basement of an office building. And if you took the elevator down there late at night, these big old white old worm things will be waiting for you. And they must have been really hungry, because... Uh... Please, Henry. I'm eating. Oh, yeah. Anyway, I went over there today, and uh, I saw this. So I sort of got it for you. What is it? Story of a serial killer who wants to depopulate the Earth? Uh, nothing like that. Take a look. I thought you might like it. The mind and the matter. How you can achieve the ultimate power of concentration. Think this is something I need, Henry? It's really rare. There are only a few printed. A little on the occult side, isn't it? Maybe so. But seeing as how you always have so much work to do, my friend is kind of a student of the mind. He swears by this. Says it's the last copy. The publisher was supposed to destroy all of them. For what reason? Too powerful. Tells you how to make people do things. Thing? Would you believe it, Mr. Beechcraft? I've seen him. I've seen my friend cause a woman to do... to do something fantastic. How's that? It's true. He was in a department store, and he saw this woman at the sale table, and he concentrated real hard on one particular thing, and... Mr. Beechcraft, as sure as I'm sitting here in the cafeteria of the United Tool and Dye Company, that woman... You won't believe this. What? Well, that woman picked up a chartreuse and orange scarf, paid for it and everything. She never would have bought it in a million years. Who would? But he made her do it, just like that. It's the truth, I swear. Oh, oh. Will you please try to be more careful? Oops, there goes the coffee again. Sorry, Mr. Beechcraft. Thank you so much for the book, Henry. Now, if you don't mind, I think I'll be leaving. I've had more than my fill. Mr. Beechcraft! Chapter 3! Uh, read that one first! Remember, Chapter 3! Right, Henry. Chapter 3. Initial phenomenon of intense concentration. Focus on a single desired outcome. Then close your eyes. Mental picture. Repeat three times. Ready to go back? Not yet. I have to fix my makeup. Okay. Wait. I think I'll have a soda first. Want one? Nah. Let me see. Orange, root beer, grape. Might as well give it a try. Concentrate. Tropical punch. Pick tropical punch. I just can't make up my mind. It's delicious. Try it. You'll like it. Why'd you pick that one? I don't know. I really don't. I was going to choose lemon lime, but for some reason, my finger pressed Tropical Punch. How's it taste? Might as well find out. Yes! You'll see. It's absolutely delicious. Puts one in the mind of a Mai Tai. I think I'd better read the entire book. Chapter 4. To achieve your heart's desire. Heart's desire, eh? Very interesting. Very interesting indeed. The most important element is concentration. Blot out the quotidian irrelevancies that pollute your day. Quotidian? Nice vocabulary. Mr. Beechcraft? The science of the mind requires absolute adherence to the following rules. Mr. Beechcraft? Uh, what is it, Laura? Did you turn in the Campbell file? Campbell? John R. From this morning. I don't see it. I'll get to it. Now then. The following rules of mental control over the omnipresent phenomenology of the modern environment. I really need the file before Mr. Rogers comes by again. Silence! Could you say I'm reading? Sorry I disturbed you. Oh, Laura, how is your beverage, by the way? Beverage? In the hall, the can of soda. Tropical punch, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Not bad, actually. Reminded me of... a pina colada. Did it now. Delicious, I bet. I'll just get back to my book. Very important book. Very, very important. Distractions which divert 98% of our brain capacity from the more highly evolved regions of the cerebral cortex. Everybody go into the ground floor? Yeah. yeah. The source of the power is located in the pineal gland, or vestigial third eye. You, sir? 
where the power of the all-encompassing life force. Sir, you're going to the first floor too? He's talking to you, buddy. What's the matter, you deaf? What? Of course I'm going to the first floor. Where else would I be going? Watch your fingers. Going down. The more complete the mental picture, the more complete the result. Focus your mind and concentrate to the exclusion of all else. From the lower to the higher chakras, until you feel the power surging. You getting on the train or what? Hmm? Oh, yes, yes. Then move along. All aboard! Mental imaging of the desired result to the exclusion of all else. Ah, now where was I? Chapter 9. The energy generated by pure mind has an electrical coefficient of... Yes. Yes, mm mm-hmm. The numbers are absolutely correct. Unequivocally. That being the case, it stands to reason that the conclusions are correct as well. Why the mind must be the most underrated power in the entire universe. Given the proper concentration, well, there's really no limit to what a man could do. No limit at all. Look at them down there. People. So many. I wonder, if I concentrated hard enough, could I actually get rid of... But why not? Why not? Concentration, that's all it takes. I have the power here, inside my head. Sheer concentration. Concentrate on on getting rid of all those people. I wonder if I could do it in one fell swoop. Or, Or knock them off one by one. Just think of it. Nobody in the elevator, in the office, the cafeteria, or on the street. None! Not in the hall, or on the stairs. Nobody except... Mr. Beechcraft. Mr. Beechcraft. Who is it? You know perfectly well who it is. It's Mrs. Weller. The rent is due, Mr. Beechcraft. Do you hear me? The rent. I'm not going away till you pay, Mr. Beechcraft. Mr. Beechcraft. Close your eyes and repeat the following words three times. Go away. Disappear. Be extinct. The rent, Mr. Beechcraft. Go away. Disappear. Be extinct. The rent! Go away. Disappear. Be extinct. Mr. Beach! Mrs. Weller? Mrs. Weller? Mrs. Weller? Aha! You're gone! Concentration, that's the key. And I have it. <laughs> Today the landlady, tomorrow the world! Good morning, Beechcraft. Is it? I only meant... I know perfectly well what you meant. Why don't you just keep to yourself and mind your own beeswax? Well... I don't know why I bother, Beechcraft. I was only trying to be a good neighbor. I've tried to be a good neighbor for years. And what good does it do me? Why don't Go you keep away. yourself from now Disappear. On? I'll stay in my Be extinct. And you stay in Go yours. away. And never the twain Disappear. Meet, okay? Be that extinct. You because it suits... Aha! I wasn't dreaming! It works! 113. 114. 115. 116. Out of the way, son. Make me. 117. Very well. Go away. Disappear. Be extinct. Go away. Disappear. Be extinct. Hey, give me back my ball. I don't have your ball, young man. Then where did it go? Ma! Silence! Ma, the I'm afraid you leave me no ball. choice. Go away. Disappear. Ma! Be he won't give it extinct. back. He won't. And another one bites the dust. Hey, watch it. Out of the way, jerk. I was here first. Let me through, please. I need to catch the 732. Officer, that man cut in front of me. Hey, you! I said you! Surely you're not addressing me. 
put a token in like everybody else. I don't have a token. So get one. I don't have time to buy tokens. If I miss my train... Step out of the line. What for? I'm writing you up. You're gonna get a big fat fine for cheating the city out of- But it's only a token. I'll mail it to you. I'll deposit two tokens tomorrow morning, but I simply do not have the time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I heard it all before. This one may take some doing. What'd you say? Nothing, officer. Concentrate. Go away, disappear, be extinct. Say, are you cursing me out? Go away, disappear, be extinct. All right, that's it. I'm taking you in for insulting the transit officer. I got a nice pair of bracelets that'll fit you just fine. Go away, disappear, be extinct. You were saying, officer? You were saying? <laughs> All right, 732, let's get ready to rumble. Beechcraft is coming through. What? No line for the elevator this morning? No pushing? No shoving? My, my, that is unusual. Anyone else? No? All right, then. Going up? Morning, everyone. Laura? Ah, you're not here, are you? Slept in, I presume? Like a great many people. Fine with me. I'll just sit down here and get to work without being rushed. Now, where was I? Oh, yes. Jones Stephen. A rather large export to the UK. I'll just see if everything's in order. At my own pace for once. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Better finish this one before Mr. Rogers gets here. If he ever shows up. <laughs> now, let me see. All well and good. Well and good. A major improvement. Only, when I finish this and the other files, what else is there to do? With no one breathing down my neck, how should one occupy his time? Hmm. Isn't it time for lunch yet? I'll just have the salad today. Some soup to start off and crackers. No hurry, mind you. Plenty of time to digest my meal. Where to sit? Why, any table at all? The morning paper. What's new in the world today? White House. Mm. Middle East. Mm -hmm. Federal Reserve Bank. Oh, it's no use. I hate eating alone. And worse than that, I'm bored. If only I had someone to talk to. One person, that's all. Someone quiet, well-mannered, intelligent. Someone like me, in other words. That's it. Concentrate, Beechcraft, concentrate. You called? It worked. Of course it worked. Don't you have any confidence in yourself? Pleased to meet you. The name's Beechcraft. I know. And your name is? Archibald. Call me Archie. You too. I mean, call me Archie as well, if you like. I like it just fine. How's tricks, Arch, old man? Bit on the slow side this morning. Look here, Arch. This isn't working. Wouldn't you agree? Why not? Let's be frank. Too much of a good thing. Well, I wouldn't say so. But you're thinking it. Let's just say I'm temporarily accessible to suggestions about how to occupy my time. Face it, you're bored to tears. Solitude is one thing, but loneliness... Loneliness is quite another. Loneliness. I despise people. Loathe them. And I, Archibald Beechcraft, have done away with them. For good and all, mind you. For good and all. I'm leaving. You haven't finished your lunch. I don't have much of an appetite. Thought about any alternatives? Alternatives to what? To this. It's like an empty movie set in here. I don't even want to think about what it's like outside. Look at yourself. You don't have idea one about how to fill the day. People are bad enough, but inactivity is even worse. You're talking nonsense. I'm content. I'm honestly and truly content for the first time in my life. I have managed to rid myself of the worst scourge there is. The general populace. So what are you going to do? Splurge and buy a can of tropical fruit punch from the soft drink machine? Will that do it for you? If the truth be known, I would like... Well, I would appreciate a little diversion of some kind. Any kind. You mean like a change in the weather? That's it. Perhaps a little unseasonal rain. Or a lot of rain. Let's make it... A tropical storm with thunder and lightning. The works. That should shake things up. All I have to do is concentrate. Hmm. Not that exciting, is it? Maybe we need to add something spectacular. Like an earthquake. You sure you want to do that? Why not? Here goes. You mean there it goes? 
I can imagine what the office looks like right now. My desk! All your files on the floor. I'm gonna take some sorting. Enough! No earthquake and no storm either. Forget it! So now what, Arch, old man? I've had it for the day. I'm gonna take the rest of the afternoon off. Uh Uh-huh. And do what? Stroll down the street? Take a ride on the subway all by your lonesome? Boy, I'll bet the old apartment building's quiet as a tomb. It's starting to get to you, isn't it? The thing of it is, I don't care much for people, but it's difficult not having anyone, present company excluded. I guess it's a trade-off. That's the crux of the problem. Frankly, there isn't a breed of human being that I can stomach. Ever think of a cocker spaniel? I never cared much for animals, either. Most of all, though, I can't stand people. Thanks. Well, except for you, naturally. But that's because you're a higher class of individual. Wait a minute. That's it! That's what? Why didn't I think of it before? People I can stand. That's what I'll do. I'll create people who are just like me. A world full of Archie Beechcrafts. Now that's a thought. You bet your sweet life it is. I'll will it. I'll concentrate, and from now on, everyone will be exactly like me. It's so simple. And when will this new era be ushered in? Tomorrow morning. I'll re-people the Earth. Nothing but my kind of folks. In fact, why wait? How about right now? Fifteenth floor, everybody off. Look at them, like sardines. Rude, thoughtless people. Worthless, every last one. Nobody has any manners nowadays. Late. Thanks to them. Listen to them. They sound just like me. You're not kidding. Take a gander at their faces. They look like us, too. A rather handsome lot, you must admit. Where are they headed? Back to work, I presume. Those who chose not to dine in the cafeteria. A sight for sore eyes, eh, Archie? It certainly is. Now that I've decided to replenish the population in a kinder, gentler mold. This, I gotta see. United Tool and Die, one moment, please. The sun noise, the miserable noise. I'll go out of my ever-loving mind. Keep it down, I'm trying to work. Can't hear myself think. People, 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 is there no respite? Herds, droves, legions, armies, hosts, bevies, coveys of people. Deliver me, please deliver me. Hear that, Arch? I've heard more than enough. You asked for it, you got it. A sty, that's what it is. Nothing but a pigsty. A people sty. Had it? Undeniably. Finally getting through to you, huh? Without a doubt. A lot of me is just as bad as a lot of them. You said it. So, what's to do now? Nothing else to do but put it back the way it was. Just like that? Just like that. Mind over matter. Concentrate. Go away, disappear, be extinct. Go away, disappear, be extinct. Go away, disappear, be extinct. Hello, Mr. Beechcraft. Why, hello, Laura. How nice to see you. What? Oh, nothing. Nothing. It's just good to have you back. I haven't been anywhere. (laughs) No. No, no, of course not. Hi, Mr. Beechcraft. I got your coffee. Uh, Miss Petty, Laura. You didn't have to do that, Henry. Uh, Careful now. Oh! Oh, Oh, Mr. Beechcraft, sir. Please forgive me. You should be more... Forget it, Henry. Nothing serious. It isn't? Not at all. Just another little spill on the old sleeve. I'll take care of it with my handkerchief. Gee, thanks, Mr. Beechcraft, for being so nice about it. Tut-tut, my lad, tut-tut. Something else, Henry? I was just wondering, sir. Yes? That book I gave you? Did you get anything out of it? Not really. Why don't you take it back? You sure? Frankly, it's a lot of pap. Interesting, but totally unbelievable. And now, if you'll excuse me, I think I'll get back to work. Mr. Archibald Beechcraft, a child of his time, a product of the population explosion, and an unwilling inheritor of the legacy of progress, a man who has just found out through trial and error that with all its faults, this may well be the best of all possible worlds, people notwithstanding. Tonight's case in point, 
in the Twilight Zone. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. wrong with you? We are behind schedule. The jungle is too thick, Clemente. Use your machetes, all of you. We have used them. Now they are dull. Then sharpen them. The burros need water. He's right, Ramos. If we lose another animal, we cannot make it. <sighs> Very well. Make camp here. Alto. We rest. How much longer, Alessandro? A few more days, perhaps a week. If this is the right way to the capital. What? You have the map. What does it say? We are here by the mountains. We should go around, through the lowlands. No, that is too far. We must strike the cruise now, before his army comes looking for us. Don't worry, Ramos. We are not worth hunting. You say that to me? I speak the truth. Look around. What do you see? Men of destiny. Oh? And how many are we today? The campesinos support us. They give us food, shelter. That is because we are the ones who march. We are the point of the spear. When we strike, they will follow. But only if we succeed. The jungle is full of rebels. They will come out of their caves to join us. First, we must survive. The way through the mountains is difficult. Cristo and Tamar are loyal. And Garcia. And what of the others? If they go back to their wives, we are alone. A teacher and a dreamer. Your words are strange to my ears, Javier. As if they come from a woman. <laughs> Politics is more than a cause, my friend. It is a strategy. When a bridge is weak, it must fall. Remember the history of our land. The earth is ripe with the blood of other rebellions. We will not fail. There is no shame in it. We can take up arms again when the time is right. This is our moment. Not this year, Ramos. And perhaps not next year either. That is still too soon. But sooner or later, the crops will fail. The people will rise up and we will show them the way. Now, the bellies are full from the harvest. They are not ready. Listen to your fear. You yourself taught me that the people rally behind a leader. A brave leader who knows no fear. Only a fool is without fear. I am not a fool. I am a man. More will come. They will leave their villages and march with us, 10,000 as strong. The Cruz's guard will not fire on us. They are our brothers. And how many brothers do we have here? Eleven? Twelve? Turn back now, my friend. Before it's too late. Too late? Hear me well. Because this, I swear, one week from now, we take the capital. This is Ramos Clemente and his ragtag band of followers. Chief among them, Xavier D'Alessandro, his political advisor and sergeant-at-arms. Clemente is the keeper of a dream. Once he walked behind a mule as it plowed someone else's land, looked up at a hot Central American sun and pledged the impossible. He vowed that he would lead his people against the tyranny that put the ache in their backs, the lines in their faces, the anguish in their eyes. That he would ride at the head of an army into the capital city, cheered along the way by thousands of dreamers, all sharing the hope that General Clemente is the man to give them back their freedom. A noble dream, or an illusion. If the latter, it would be an honest mistake. 
but even honest mistakes have a price. In a moment, Clementi and his lieutenants will encounter something which will turn out to be more than they bargained for. The surprising aftermath of a well-intentioned revolution. They will discover the startling truth as reflected in a very strange mirror, one that was handmade just for them. In the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Mirror, starring Tony Plana with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Do you hear that? See me, General. They are calling for you. They are. They are. Let them see you, Clementi. Yes, from the balcony. Perhaps I should. Just for a minute. Go on, Ramos. This is your palace now. It is your right. Very well. My countrymen, a new day. I promise you the time has come. The president has fallen. Go home to your families now and make ready for tomorrow. You shall have peace, justice, and equality. Do you hear? Viva Clemente. That is me. Viva, viva, viva. <laughs> A toast. Yes. With some of the cruise's precious wine. The glasses. To the revolution. Ah. <laughs> So do you know? Do you know why I laugh? I laugh because there is so much, so much feeling inside of me. I didn't know in the beginning. I didn't know when this moment came how I would react to it. What would I do? Laugh? Cry? Get drunk? I didn't know. What makes a man more drunk? Wine? Or the people shouting his name? Another toast to you. No, my friend, to you, to all of you, I toast my friends. Cristo, the bold one. D'Alessandro, the dedicated one. Tabal, the quiet one. And Garcia, the strong one. To the four lieutenants of the revolution. To the new heads of government. To the new government. Not to the Cruz whose portrait stares down on us from the wall. Now the wall drips with wine, like blood. And so we begin. De Cruz. He is still alive. As you ordered. Bring him here. Let that be the first order of business. Yes, sir. You will have to find another picture for the wall. Yes. One of yourself, perhaps? Oh, oh, no, no, no. Oh, no. We will find something. There. In the corner. What is it? A mirror. Ah. To reflect the new leader. A beautiful frame. Hand-carved. <laughs> General de Cruz had exceptional taste, huh? You should hang it up. Very well. Hmm. I look tired. Old. It has been a long day. Do you know, Alessandro? One year ago, this was the face of a peasant. A beardless, nameless worker of the dirt. Whose fingernails were in mourning and whose clothing stank. And now? Now it is the face of a leader. A chief of state. Yes. It is. 
one year. One year of starving, hiding, stealing weapons, and having the same dream every hour. And from the dream came an army, and from the army came a rebellion. And now I have liberated the masses of other nameless workers of the dirt. I have broken their shackles. And what of him, the one whose portrait you have taken down? The memory of him will soon be forgotten. What is your plan? A trial, D'Alessandro. Of course. A lot of trials. A lot of brick walls and a lot of firing squads. A lot of bloodbaths, you mean? To cleanse us of the past. Are you sure that is the way? It is only fair. Their blood now, in repayment of ours. In here, pig. The general is waiting. Take your hands off me. Now, show respect. You disappoint me, De Cruz. You are not like your portrait. Who are you to judge? I don't recognize him. The man in the picture had arrogance, a full braid on his uniform. Where is he now? I see only an old man in dirty, torn clothes. What do you want of me, Clemente? What I want? Not what I want. What they want. Look, a dictator! To the wall with him! To the wall! To the wall! To the wall! To the wall! You hear? To the wall, they say. But I won't stand you against the wall with a blindfold. That is a cheap death for underlings. Firing squads are for followers, not leaders. No, no. Old man, you are too good for that. You are a special case. You, I will strip naked and cover with honey. I will tie you spread eagled on the ground under the sun, and then I'll let the ants eat you. And every time you scream, I'll drink wine. And every time you beg for mercy, I'll laugh out loud, because I want you to take a long time to die. Want part death for every acre of land you stole. One part death for every morsel of food you took out of a peasant's mouth. And one part death for every voice you stifled by decree. Now, what is your plea? Or will it be a cry for mercy? I will not oblige you, Clemente, with a cry or a plea. You can strip off my flesh, because it is here for you and easily done by any animal. But my manhood, my manhood, you greasy little peon, this is as far from you as the moon. Peon? You dare to call me a peon? Stop! He is to be judged, not tormented. He is the animal. <laughs> and you are not, eh? You are the purists, the idealists, the saviors, the avenging angels. Gentlemen, you will soon be disillusioned. You are me. You are the Cruz. You are Baptista. You are Trujillo, you are Noriega and Duvalier. You are the keepers of the grab bags. You can wave your flags and put up your statues and embrace all the people from the oldest to the youngest. But we are of the same breed. We are the spoilers. We care for no one but ourselves. You insult me, peon. Enough. He presents his case and we are his best witnesses. We corroborate everything he says. You cannot help but do it. You think this room, the people out there, you think these are the fruits of victory? The spoils? No. They are simply a legacy, Clemente. What I pass on to you. Power you shall have, certainly power. Enough to make you giddy. But there are other things in the inheritance. You will find them soon enough. What things? Fear. The chief legacy. Fear of assassination. Fear of disloyalty. Fear of rebellion. Fear of another Clemente hiding in the hills. Fear even of the North Americanos who offer you money and supplies. God help you. God 
pity you. Take him away. On your feet. Guards. I see you have found my mirror. It is mine now. Then it will serve you well. An old woman brought it to me ten years ago when I first took power. She said it was magic. She said, by looking into it, I could see the faces of my assassins. She spoke the truth. That is why I took it down. That's right. Look deep, General Clemente. Find out who your enemies really are. You will see them there, in that mirror. You will see them in the dark corners. You will see them in the crowd. You will see them in your glasses of wine. You will see them everywhere. Out! Where shall we take him? Lock him up in the prison. I will decide what to do. <laughs> assassins, come out, come out wherever you are. Come on, assassins. Come out of the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a joke. A stupid, ignorant joke. Assassins in the mirror. <laughs> yes? How goes it, my friend? Ah, oh, Alessandro. I'm glad you're here. It is dark. The chandelier, let me turn it on. No, please. I need to think. The candles, then? Only one. That is enough. More plans, eh? For the new regime? Come to the windows, D'Alessandro. Look outside. What do you see? Fires in the night. Yes. Many fires. I see the old ways burning to make way for the new. The transition begins. What do you think he meant? Who? De Cruz. When he spoke of dictators. For once he spoke the truth. He is not deluded. He knows his role. But not ours. We will not make the same mistakes. No. But be cautious, my friend. It is easy to slip. Too much blood and the crops will not grow. We will know a season of poverty before the people are reborn. False friends will come to you, offering help. We must make alliances. There is always a price. Their influence, like fish hooks to bind us to them. From our neighbors to the south and the north. From lands across the sea. I will strike a bargain. With those who are so powerful? They will bring ships filled with goods but also gunboats and helicopters and advisors with packs to be signed. Their ways are ruthless. Deal with them, yes, but not as a puppet. I am no man's puppet. Then take care. Take care, Ramos. Choose the path of justice, not of revenge. What? You would have me forgive De Cruz and his army? They who have kept our people under the yoke? Not forgiveness. Banishment. The prison is overflowing. We do not have enough bullets to liquidate them all. So they go to another land and rebuild their army. That is stupid, Javier. They are our enemies. Where will they live? In the mirror? Cristo. Sir. How many prisoners are there? In the capital? About 1,000. Start shooting them. When? Tonight. Yes, sir. Right away. I see. There is no time for trials. But for murder, there's plenty of time? What are you? A chameleon? The ease with which you strip off one color and put on another. You turn my stomach. I thought you were with me. I am. But not with mass murder. Murderers can never be murdered. They can only be eliminated. You clean your house with a reckless hand. Go, Cristo. Give the order. Gladly. 
you should look in that mirror and see what face looks back at you. A magical mirror, he said. A mirror that reflects the faces of my assassins. <laughs> How intriguing. Isn't that intriguing, D'Alessandro? I had no idea that you believed in such... What are you doing? What am I doing? I saw it. Where is it? What? The submachine gun. You need to rest. You have been awake too long. Tomorrow we will go into the fields, the villages, meet with the people. D'Alessandro, the dedicated one, the moralist. I was the arm of the revolution, but he was the heart. What are you talking about? I saw you with a weapon, cradled in your arms, then you cocked it, ready to shoot me in the back. Where are you hiding it? Ramos, listen to me. You're not making sense. A man can believe his own eyes. I saw you in the mirror, with the gun. I should have known. What gun? Ramos, you sound demented. I should have known. Of all of them, it would be you. It would have to be you, D'Alessandro. What are you doing? Yes, a traitor. Let go of me. See him with your own eyes. See the assassin. Do with him what you will. I am not an assassin. I am your lieutenant. Your conscience. No! Garcia, get off the couch and find a bed. Did you hear that? I hear Garcia. He had too much to drink last night. The palace is stocked with the finest brandy. Not that. Outside, in the courtyard. Ah... Uh. The firing squad. We've already killed off hundreds. That sound, better than a swig of brandy. What were you before the rebellion, Cristo? Why do you ask that? Uh, don't tell me. Did you work in a stockyard? You seem to enjoy the butchery. It is a fiesta. Then why do I not hear laughter? The crowd is getting bored, I think. Not bored, sick. We have given them their freedom. Twelve hours of it, and it is such a fine freedom. The right to watch a massacre. Ten executions at least, every five minutes. You would like more? Oh, oh good, good morning, Clemente. We did not give them their freedom, Tabal. What? You said we. It was I who gave it to them. And I'm sure you'll continue to give it to them. Why are they quiet? They scream for justice, and when you give it to them, they become weary. Like an audience in one peso seats at a burlesque. Their entertainment must be varied, costume changes every five minutes, or they lose interest. New bodies every few minutes. But even that is not enough? I know them well. You fill their stomachs and it empties their brains. They have cheap tastes and short memories. Clemente, Clemente. Something to say, Tabal? No, I have papers to check. The figures for De Cruz's treasury. Is there nothing more? Something that sits heavy on you? That, that sits heavy on me. On my ears and on my heart. Why should it? Execution is not a time of joy. But even this is not as bad as the death of a man who was my friend. 
That is a sword in my chest. D'Alessandro? An assassin? And that's the worst lie of all. It was no lie. He was no assassin. What? What's the matter? Uh, what's going on? Oh. Still at it out there, huh? Yes. Until their work is done. Good morning to you, Senor Garcia. How handsome you look in the mirror. What do you see there? <laughs> I see only a tired soldier. A man who needs a change of clothes. Is there a bathtub? Many. Take your pick. Oh, I'll go then. And that is all? You don't see any assassins in that mirror? <laughs> no. I see nothing but my ugly face. Even an assassin might be better. Let me see. No! Leave the mirror alone. Why? You can talk yourself into an illusion. You can make yourself believe anything. Let go of my arm. What is that? Two men. With knives. Tabal. And Garcia. What is it, Ramos? That mirror needs to be cleaned. A trick of the light? Did you think you saw something? No, no, no. I, I, I saw nothing. Sometimes, if you stare at nothing too long, it begins to stare back at you. Tabal, you and Garcia go over to the prison. Yes. Looking on the cruise. Then report back to me. You report what? His health? Do as I tell you. See that he's properly guarded. Yes, sir. You have a message for De Cruz? What sort of message? Should I tell him that he was right about the fear? That there are assassins under the bed and in the shadows and all around the room? Cabal, you have both your freedom and your life. But you have them through my sufferings. Don't throw them away. Of course not, General. Cristo, get me the prison. Sir? On the phone. Here. I'll do it. Hello? Hello? Are you asleep down there? It's General Clemente. That's correct. This is urgent. I want the prison. No, not the office. The front gate. That's right. This is General Clemente. Two men will arrive there in a few minutes. They are spies and should be shot on sight. Their names are Tabal and Garcia. I know who they are and I know what they are. Shoot them. Call me when it is done. Bodies out. Yes, sir. Right away. I think maybe I'm still asleep. I wish you were, and me as well. Did you ever have a dream that. Uh, never mind. Go ahead. Say it. A dream where you try to wake up, but you cannot. You mean a nightmare. And do you wonder? What? Well, if I hadn't joined Clemente, well, I would be home now with my woman, my little ones. I would be in the fields working the crops. I think now that it wasn't so bad. But it was. Half of your vegetables, your livestock, to the state, that is no way to live. No. Still, I do not like this slaughter. Nor do I. I guess it isn't ours to know. What do you mean? Clemente, he has his reasons. I am not an educated man. The ways of politics are hard to understand. Clemente is not educated. But the Alessandro was. Mm, a very smart man. A lieutenant, like us. Closer than that. And now we are three. 
Clemente will need us even more. Garcia, listen to me. Watch your back. Huh? Clemente has not slept in three days. But he sees. Not with his eyes. With his mind. And what he sees is dark and strange. Like a house of many doors and behind each door is... More darkness. And the way into that house is... The mirror. <laughs> what? A piece of glass? The glass reflects what is before it. When Clemente stands and looks, he sees the doorways of his mind. I do not fear an old woman's gift. We are his lieutenants. Yes, like the Alessandro. Come, we will report on the Cruz, and then we must make a plan. Señor Garcia, Señor Tabal. You know our names? But of course. You have come to see the prisoner. You have many prisoners, but only one of interest to the general. Ah, the general. I spoke to him not five minutes ago. Come in. We have been expecting you. Clemente, are they there? Good. Tell me when it is done. The prison? You have any complaints? None. You are sure? Why should I? A pie cut into two pieces is better than one cut into five. A drink of wine? Pie? But we do not speak of pie. Do we? These are the lives of friends. Are you sure? They were very close to me. Very close. You know that. Alessandro, Garcia, Tabal. They were like brothers. Or so it seemed. That is what I don't understand. How is it that they can change so? And even more curious, how can I crush them underfoot? Like ants. And feel nothing. Men cannot be brothers and assassins. No. They must choose. It is to be expected. When a man has power, he has enemies. And now, you have enemies. Enemies, yes. I understand that. But are all my friends to be my enemies? From now on, Ramos, you have no friends. You have only followers and competitors. This is the breakdown of your world. You must live with it. And how do you classify yourself, Cristo? Myself? I am a follower, General. For how long? That is a strange question. For how long will you be a follower? Until some quiet moment when my back is turned? Oh, no. Only until that moment when you prove to me that you cannot lead. Only until the moment when I think that perhaps... Perhaps? What? That perhaps I am stronger than you. You'll be eaten by worms before that moment comes. Besides, if my back is turned to you, I will see you in the mirror. As I do now. What is it? What do you see? Only you. At the desk, holding out a glass of wine. Of course. Here is a glass for you. Now you pour it. Take a drink. It will make you feel better. But you poured it before. I saw you in the mirror. Your eyes are tired. Go ahead. It will help you sleep. It will help me sleep? But for how long, Cristo? How long will I sleep after drinking it? For all eternity? Why did you do that? What did you put in the glass? A powder? You point a gun at me? Only at traitors. But there is no reason. 
I have a desire to live out my life. I am allergic to poison. You have gone crazy. Mark your words carefully, Cristo. Yes? Yes, he is here. When? All right. I'll tell him. That was the gatehouse of the prison. The guards have shot the ball and Garcia. They are both dead. And what shall we do now? Mourn for them? If you wish. They were our friends, weren't they? But then again, they can't be friends and assassins. They must be one or the other. Wasn't that your point? Ramos, there was no poison in the wine. I swear to you, I had nothing like that in mind. Nothing of the sort. You are imagining things. Am I? Look, look, I'll show you. It was an illusion. This is just a mirror, an ordinary mirror, in an old frame. See? It's only glass, polished glass. I'm looking into it. I see myself and you behind me, nothing else. You are raising the gun and pointing it because you've let yourself see things that are not there. You've let yourself... Ramos! Ramos! What have you done? Only what I had to do. A terrible mistake. Now, you will be very lonely. You will be all alone. You have just killed the better man. The better man. General, I heard a shot. Lieutenant Cristo shot himself accidentally. But how? Did you hear what I said? It was an accident. Now get out of here! To the four lieutenants of the revolution. To the new heads of government. To the Alessandro the dedicated. Tabal the quiet. Garcia the strong one. And to Cristo, the bold one. Yes! Someone to see you, sir. Who? The Holy Father. What would a priest want with me? Leave us. General? It's all right. Yes, sir. I'll be outside. General Clemente. I'm Father Thomas. So? You will forgive me, General. But this must be said now. What must be said? The executions. The people are appalled. That is no concern of mine. Is this what we are to expect from the new regime? I have my enemies, Father. That is your answer? You may tell the people that as long as I have enemies, the executions will continue. They will go on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and if this disturbs them, if this disturbs them... Then what? Then let them do something about it. Let them starve in the mountains, as I did. Let them hide in caves. Let them raise an army out of the dirt. If there is one among them strong enough to make a new rebellion, let him try. But let him be prepared for a year of suffering, and let him learn how to lead. General Clemente, the victory is not so sweet, is it? Now you are learning. Instead of the flavor of wine, it has the taste of ashes. I had a dream, Father. I had such a dream. And they were all a part of it. Cristo and Tabal and Garcia... And Alessandro, why did they turn against me? 
You ask me for the answer? Where else can I turn? To this mirror? Look to what is in yourself. But I can't stand this. I can't live this way. I'm frightened. Morning till night, I hold my breath. I look over my shoulder. I keep looking back to see what is there. I will live the rest of my life running from death. Why? Why do I have so many enemies? This is the story of all tyrants, General Clemente. They had but one real enemy, and it is the one they never recognize until it is too late. God be with you. You. I see you looking at me. What do you see? What do you see? Keep an eye on him. What did you say, priest? The general. He's not well. General Clemente is a great man. He might have been. He may be yet. He needs our help. I will remember him in my prayers. God be with you, my son. My general, the blood. Who has done this terrible thing? last assassin, and they never learn. They never seem to learn. Ramos Clemente, a would-be savior in khakis, his brains blown out by an illusion, a mirage dangled before the eyes of all ambitious men, no matter how they begin. The most vulnerable are the dreamers, when they allow fear and paranoia to make them murderers. Which is not to say that ideals are an illusion, only that revolution requires more than songs and slogans. Courage helps, as does character, a touch of luck and something along the lines of superhuman strength, whether it be found here The Mirror, starring Tony Plana with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Tony Sancho, Rick Vargas, Eddie Martinez, Tony Castillo, Ricardo Gutierrez, Ivan Vega, Florentino Mitchell, Arturo Montemayor, and Oliver Adolfi. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, between science and superstition. It lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Welcome to Maple Street, USA, late summer. A safe, tree-lined world away from the big city. A nice, old-fashioned place to raise a family. Good friends, well-kept lawns, and the laughter of children at play. There's Mr. Steve Brand, who just finished washing his shiny new car, with some help from a good neighbor. Hand me the rag, will you, Don? I want to polish this baby before the sun goes down. Sure, sure. Hey, I can get the tires for you. Ah, uh, it's okay. It's almost dark. If you can catch it. Hey, the ice cream man. 
<laughs> Look at that. Ice cream before dinner. Why not? They deserve it. Well, as long as their mothers don't find out. What'll it be, boys? Futsicle. Coming right up. And a rocket popsicle. This one's got your name on it, Tommy. At the sound of the roar and the flash of unearthly light, it will be precisely 6.43, and time for another era to begin in this otherwise perfect neighborhood. Whoa! Look at that! What was that? I don't know! What was it? Must be some kind of new jet. What was that? A meteor? That's what it looked like. I didn't hear any crash, though, did you? No, I, I didn't hear anything except a roar. Steve? What was that? Beats me, honey. Came awful close, didn't it? Too close to home, much too close. What the heck? A police helicopter? Did you see how fast it was going? 6.44 p.m. On a late September evening, the last calm and reflective moments before the monsters came to Maple Street. <laughs> And now, back to our story from the Twilight Zone. The Monsters Are Due on Maple Street, starring Frank John Hughes, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Operator? Operator? Bill, there's something wrong with the phone. What are you doing out there? Trying to start the power mower. In the dark? Well, I wanted to finish the lawn. The motor wouldn't work. Did you plug in the cord? Sure did. Steve, where are you? Right here, honey. I just washed my hair and the blow dryer stopped. Then I put soup in the microwave, but it's still cold. We must have blown a fuse. Can you fix it? I don't think so. Why not? It looks like the whole block. The power's off in our house, too. I can't get anybody on the phone. And the TV went out. Electricity's off. Phone's dead. I tried the radio. But the computer doesn't even work. Who's that? Who is that? I can't tell. It's it's too dark. Uh, hi, neighbor. Oh, hi, Charlie. Who's that behind you? It's just me, Pete Van Horn. Still dark down the street? Yep, all the street lights are out. Uh, where are you going? Uh, I thought I'd check it out. <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah, I'll cut through your backyard, Steve, if you don't mind. Hey, what for? See if they got power over on Floral Street. Sure. Go ahead. You need a flashlight? Nope. I know my way around. Well, good luck. Let us know. All right. Be right back, then. We've got some candles in the house. Maybe I should go get them. Not yet. Give it a few more minutes. Did you see what was on his belt? What? A claw hammer. Oh, he, he always carries that. How come? He's a carpenter. Yeah, but what does he need a hammer for at night? I don't know. For protection? From what? Steve, what's going on? I wish I knew, honey. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. How do you mean? Well, why should the power go off all of a sudden? And the phone lines. Maybe some sort of electrical storm or something. Nah, that don't seem likely. I mean, the sky was just as blue as anything today. No lightning, no thunder, no nothing. How could it be a storm? I can't get a thing on the radio. Not even the portable. So we can't call the power company? Well, why don't we check with the police? How? Well, you could drive downtown to that new car of yours. I suppose I could. <laughs> They'll probably think we're nuts, though. A little power failure, and right away we get all flustered and bent out of shape. It isn't just a power failure, Charlie. If it was, we'd still be able to get a broadcast on the portable. Yeah, very yeah. Well, we ought to do something. I'll run into town, and we'll get this straightened out. Are you sure, Steve? Maybe we should all stay together. Just take a few minutes, and then at least we'll know. Do you want me to come with you? No, you, you wait here. Go in the house if you want and light some candles. matter with the car? I don't understand. It was working fine this afternoon. Out of gas? I just filled up. Well, then it's not getting the spark. Look under the hood. Well, it could be a lot of things. I wouldn't know where to start, especially at night. That could be the distributor cap. But it's new. It's supposed to be under warranty. What's it mean? Mean? All these things happening at once. It doesn't mean anything. It's just a coincidence. Next time I try the car, it'll probably start just fine. I don't know. It's as if, as if everything flat out stopped all of a sudden. Yeah, that's pretty strange if you ask me. 
We better walk downtown. Yeah. How, how many? I mean, some of us should stay here and watch the houses. The two of us can go, Charlie, you and me. Y you think it's the meteor? Well, you know, I really doubt it. I don't see how it could be if that's what it was. A, a meteor couldn't do this. Well, then we'll find out. Turn it over to the authorities. Yeah, yeah, they'll know what to do. They better. That's what we pay them for. Uh, uh, come on, Steve. Mr. Brand. Yes, Tommy? You better not. Better not what? Go into town. Why not? They don't want you to. Who doesn't want us to? Them. Them? Whoever was in that thing that flew over. What? Whoever was in it. I don't think they want us to leave here. <laughs> Fool kid. Wait a minute. What, what do you mean? What, 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 what are you talking about? They don't want us to. That's why they shut everything off. What makes you say that? Now isn't that the craziest thing you ever heard? Tommy, I asked you a question. Whatever gave you that idea? It's always that way. Always? Well, when a ship lands from outer space. <laughs> oh, come on now. It's that way in every story. Which story? All of them. It could be the mothership or or just, you know, a scout. Yeah, you mean uh, one of those smaller spaceships? Oh, sure. Yeah, a flying saucer, something like that. They watch everything we do. Why? I, I miss something. I don't know that either. But they're checking us out. All the way from outer space. Sure, that's where they come from. Don't you know anything? For what reason? Well, for the invasion. <laughs> An invasion from space yet. <laughs> <laughs> Sally, you better get that boy of yours off to bed. He's been reading too many comic books or seeing too many science fiction movies or something. Tommy, come over here and stop that kind of talk. Go with your mother, Tommy. We'll be right back, and you'll see. That wasn't any kind of ship, for crying out loud. That was just a meteor or, or something. I guess it did have something to do with these power failures and the rest of it. Meteors can do strange things. I, I think I read something about it. Oh, sure. You know, like sunspots. That's right. Yeah, that's the kind of thing sunspots do. You know, they raise came with radio reception all over the world. That part's definitely true. And this thing coming so close, why? I mean, there's no telling the sort of stuff it can do. Yeah, you go ahead, Steve. You and Charlie go into town and see if that isn't what's causing it all. All right, then. We're going. Mr. Brand, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. You want us just to stand right here in one spot? You might not be able to get to town. Why not? It was that way in the story. Nobody could leave. Nobody except... Except who? Ah, uh, he's talking about some video game. Hold on, hold on. I want to hear this. Except who, Tommy? Except the people they sent down ahead of them. Well, they look just like people. You'd never know the difference. It wasn't until the ship landed Tommy, that... please, son, please don't talk that way. Right. The kid shouldn't say stuff like that. And we shouldn't stand here listening to him. Why, this is the silliest thing I ever heard. He tells us a comic book plot and we stand around listening like fools. Go ahead, Tommy. I want to hear what you've got to say. The whole thing. What kind of story was this? And, and what about the people they sent ahead? That was the way they got ready for the landing. They sent four people, a mother and a father and two kids, who looked just like humans. But they weren't. Well, I guess that's it then. What we better do is run a check on the neighborhood and see which one of us are really human. How does that sound to everybody? <laughs> <laughs> there must be something better to do than just stand around making bum jokes about it. Well, like what? Well, for instance, I wonder if Floral Street's got the same deal we got. Hey, where's Pete Van Horn? Uh, didn't he get back yet? Can't see a blessed thing. Hey, who's that? It's Les Goodman. See him there across the street? He went out and got in his car just like that. Now, where's he going at a time like this? Looks like he isn't going anywhere. Hey, Les. Can't you get it started? No dice. That sounds like the battery's dead. It shouldn't be. It's charged up. Ah, oh, could be the starter. Oh, this car always works, like clockwork. I get behind the wheel in the morning and it goes. It never fails. Uh, unless it's something electrical. Such as? Who did that? Nobody. It just started. All by itself? But that can't be. Cars don't just start all by themselves. Do they, Steve? Of course not. Not without the keys. I got them right here in my hand. Well, this one did. How come his car just up and started like that? How could it? Yeah, how could it start by itself? He wasn't anywhere near it. And he never did come out to look at that thing that flew over. He wasn't even interested. He was too busy. Busy with what? Why? 
Uh, why didn't he come out with the rest of us to look? He always was an oddball. Him and his whole family. Real oddballs. What do you say we ask him? Yeah, well, yeah, well, well that's a good idea. Wait a minute. Just, just wait a minute. Uh, what for? Let's not turn into a mob here. Listen to me. Let him talk. I don't understand it either. I tried to start it. It wouldn't start. You saw me. All of you saw me. Sure we did. What are you telling us, Les? That there's something going on? I'm not telling you anything. I don't understand it either. I swear, I don't understand anything about tonight. What don't you understand? What's happening? Well, maybe you better tell us the whole story. What story? Well, here's the way I see it. Nothing's working on this street. Nothing. No lights, no power, no radio, no TV. Nothing except one car. And guess whose it is? Yours. Yeah, that's right. Now, don't go jumping to conclusions. We don't have all the facts yet. He's getting back in his car. Well, why shouldn't he? It's his. No, you don't. We need some answers. And we need them now. Hold it right there. You keep your distance, all of you. Go ahead. Let's hear it. So I've got a car that starts by itself. Well, that's a freak thing. I admit it. But does that make me some kind of criminal or something? I don't know why the car works. It just does. <sighs> We're all on a monster kick, Les. Seems that... General impression holes that maybe one family isn't what we think they are. Monsters from out of space or something. You never can be sure. Could have been a spy plane. On Maple Street? Right. How'd they get here? Or were they here all along? Well, that, that, that thing, it, it, it could have been a, a missile. You, you never know. A bomb, you mean? An ICBM? Did you hear it explode? Did you? Well, no. I'll tell you what's going on. You're afraid of anything that's different fifth columnists from the vast beyond. <laughs> Listen to yourselves. You know anybody that might fit that description, Les, on Maple Street? No, I, I sure don't. I don't either. And neither does anybody else. Look at that! At what? It's his porch light. It went on! Yeah, the only one that's on. So who turned it on, huh? Now I suppose that's really supposed to incriminate me. Take it easy. The light goes on and off. Something in the wiring. Big deal. That really seals it, doesn't it? Move back, everybody. Why should we? This is Les's porch. His yard. That doesn't matter anymore. Sure it does. It's his property. I just don't understand this. So I've got a bad switch. You never did before. Look, you all know me. Of course they do. We've lived here for five years, right in this house. Now, where'd you move here from? Will you let him talk? We're no different than any of the rest of you. We're no different at all. Really, uh, this whole thing is just, is just weird. Well, if that's the case, Les Goodman, explain why... Explain what? Why do I have to explain anything to you or anybody else? Never mind. Go ahead. What about it? Explain what? Well... Go on. Just say it. Well, sometimes I go to bed late at night. A couple of times... A couple of times I'd come out on the porch and I'd see Mr. Goodman here in the wee hours of the morning, standing out in front of his house. Then what was he doing? Looking. Looking where? In somebody's window? No. Up at the sky. What? That's right. Looking up at the sky as if... as if he were waiting for something. For a signal? Well, uh, I really couldn't say. Think. What did you see him do? I'd like all of you to leave now. You stay away from us. Or what? You know, really, this is a bad joke. You know what I'm guilty of? I'm guilty of insomnia. Uh, now, what's the penalty for that? Is that a crime now, too? Well, is it? Doesn't anybody have anything to say about that? Let it go. Nobody said... No! Did you hear what I said? I said it was insomnia. They heard. You fools. You scared, frightened rabbits. You're sick. Sick people. Do you know that? All of you. Hey, hey, easy. And you don't know what you're getting into. You don't have any idea. Because let me tell you, let me tell you this thing you're starting, that should be what really frightens you. As God is my witness, you're letting something begin here that could turn into a nightmare you can't stop. Les, I brought you a glass of milk. The refrigerator's off, but it's still cold. Put the candle out. Why? Just do it. What, what are all those people doing across the street? 
Why are they just standing there? I said put the candle out, now. Are they still watching our house? That's right. What do they expect to see? A red monkey. What? I remember a science article I read once. Uh, which article? About an experiment. What made you think of that? It was in a laboratory. They set up a kind of zoo with all these monkeys. They made sure they were comfortable, had plenty to eat, let them go about their business. All different kinds of monkeys. And for a while, they all got along just fine. Les, what does this have to do with and all And one day, the scientists painted one of the monkeys another color. Red or green or something, I don't remember. Just one of them. And you know what happened? All the other monkeys turned on it, and they tore the red monkey apart. Killed it right there on the spot for no reason. Oh, Les, that is a horrible story. No reason, except it was a little bit too different. I suppose that was enough for the monkeys. Do we still have that gun? What? My dad's old service pistol. I had it packed in the attic. I was wondering, uh, do you think it's still there? <gasps> I'm going to wait right here no matter how long it takes. For what, Charlie? It just doesn't seem right keeping watch on them like this. Well, what else are we supposed to do? Now, Charlie, he was right when he said he was one of our neighbors. One of our good neighbors. Think about it. Why, I've known Ethel Goodman ever since they moved in. We go shopping together once a week. We've been friends for... That don't prove a thing. Well, it's worth something. Any guy who spends his time looking up at the sky early in the morning, all alone, <laughs> well, there's something plain wrong with that kind of person. Haven't you ever looked in the sky? And why would I do that? The stars, Charlie. The constellations. I, I had a pair of binoculars when I was a kid. I knew the names of every one. Yeah, when you were a kid. But there's something about that that, well, it ain't legitimate here. Maybe under normal circumstances we could let it go by, but these aren't normal circumstances. What more do you need? Hmm? Do I have to spell it out for you? I guess you do. Look at the street. Our street. Now there's nothing but candles everywhere. It's like, it's like going back to the dark ages or something. Yes, it is. Where are you going, Mr. Brand? To visit an old friend. Les? You don't have to knock. Anybody wants me, I'm right here. Come on, Les. Steve, is that you? Stay right where you are. We don't want any trouble. No trouble, I promise. Not if I have anything to say about it. But this time, if anybody sets foot on my porch, that's what they're going to get. Trouble. Look, Les. I've already explained to you people. You people? Is that who we are now? And I'm not going to explain again. You don't have to explain anything. I don't sleep very well at night. Sometimes I get up and take a walk and I look up at the sky. I keep track of the meteor showers, shooting stars. They come at different times of the year, at odd hours. You can read about it in National Geographic. Don't you know that? Sure I do. That's exactly what he does. He, he always has. I understand. Why, this whole thing, it's been blown out of all proportion. It's ridiculous. I know. It's some kind of madness or something. That's what it is, all right. Some kind of madness. Then what can we do to stop it? At this point, that is the question. You best watch who you're seen with, Steve. Who's that? You ain't exactly above suspicion yourself. Or you, Charlie. Or any of us, it seems, from age eight on up. Come inside, Steve. No. There's no reason to hide. What I'd like to know is, what are we going to do? Just stand around here all night? There's nothing else we can do. Till then, we stand watch. One of them will tip their hand. You'll see. They've got to. There's something you can do, Charlie. Oh, you're telling me what to do? You could go home and keep your mouth shut. Oh, yeah? You could quit strutting around like a self-appointed hanging judge and just climb into bed and forget it. <laughs> you sound real anxious to have that happen, Steve. Oh, I am. In that case, I think we'd better keep a real close eye on you, too. You do that. I think everything might as well come out now. Good idea. Steve... Your wife's done plenty of talking about you lately. She what? About your habits. You're plenty odd too, it sounds like. And when did you talk to my wife? Go ahead. Tell us what she said. Yes, go ahead. What's my wife said? Let's get it all out. Yeah, let's. Why not? Let's pick out every idiosyncrasy about every single man, woman, and child on this street and put them under a microscope like bugs. 
Are you afraid of the truth, buddy? You think you know what the truth is? If you got nothing to hide... Then why don't we go all the way and set up some kind of kangaroo court? How about a firing squad at dawn, Charlie, so we can get rid of all the suspects? Narrow them down, make it easier for you. And for you too, Don, old buddy. Hey, look, there's no need getting so upset, Steve. Then why are you? Well, it's just that, well... I'm... Well, what? Myra's talked about how there's been plenty of nights when you spend hours and hours down in your basement working on some kind of radio equipment or something. Oh, for the love of... Got a regular electronics lab down there, she says. Well, none of us have ever seen that radio, now have we? Or whatever it is. How come you never told us about it? Yeah, go ahead, Steve. What kind of radio set are you working on? Shortwave or something else? I've never seen it, and neither has anyone else around here. It's a hobby, for God's sake. Who do you talk to on that radio? And who talks to you? What kind of messages you sending, huh? And receiving. I'm surprised at you, Charlie. How come you're so dense all of a sudden? What does that mean? Who do I talk to? Well, who do you think? I talk to monsters from out of space. There, there, he admitted it. I talk to three-headed green men who fly over in what look like meteors. That is, when I'm not talking to other enemies, other aliens. Steve, Steve, please. Go back in the house, honey. It's a ham radio, that's all. I bought him a book on it for his birthday. It's just an amateur radio set. A lot of people have them. It's good for keeping in touch with friends all over the world. Oh, yeah? What friends? In which country? Does it matter? It matters a lot. I can show it to you. Would that make you feel better? It's right down in the basement. Show them nothing. If they want to look inside our house, let them go get a search warrant. Look. You can't afford to... Charlie, don't tell me what I can afford. Stop telling me who's dangerous and who's safe and who's a menace. Come inside now. And the rest of you, you're with them too, aren't you? You're standing here all set to crucify, all set to find a scapegoat, all desperate to point your fingers at your neighbor. Well, now look, friends. The only thing that's going to happen is that we'll all end up eating each other alive. Get your hand off me, Charlie. That's not the only thing that can happen to us. <gasps> What's that? Tommy, get inside and lock the door. It's the monster. It's the monster. No, Tommy. We may need this. A shotgun? Give me that. Don't try to take it away from me. Put it down. We can't even see who it is yet. It, it could be anybody. It don't look like anybody. At least not from around here. It looks tall. Real tall and dark and... That's because the street lights are off. Well, whoever it is, it can go right back where it came from. Oh, it's an it now. Not a who. Uh, give me the gun. But you don't know who... Stand aside if you're not going to help. Good Lord, will anybody take the time to think? We've done enough thinking. Will you people wise up? Even if it is what you say it is, what good would a gun do against, against something like that? Some sort of enemy? Something you don't even have a name for yet? Something that... Ah, uh, no more words, Steve. You're going to talk us into a grave. Whatever's out there in the street, you'd let walk right over us, wouldn't you? Well, some of us won't. Some of us are man enough to stand up for what we believe in. What do you believe? Quiet! Here he comes! You got him, Charlie! One shot! Pretty good, huh? Take a look. No! Take a look. Take a good, long look and see what you've done, you murderers. It's Pete Van Horn! I, I, I thought he was going to go over to the next block to see if the power was on. You killed him, Charlie. You shot him dead. But, but I didn't know who it was. I sure didn't. He, he comes walking out of the shadows like that. How am I supposed to know who he was? Then why did you shoot? Steve, you know why. Uh, tell him, huh? How was I supposed to know he wasn't one of the monsters or something? You make me sick to my stomach. Dad, we're all scared of the same thing. I was trying to protect my home and my neighborhood, that's all, like anybody would. Look, all of you, that's what I was trying to do. Hey, you're the one, not me. You did it. I didn't know it was one of us. I swear I didn't know. <gasps> Look over there. What is it? A light just went on. Where? In that upstairs bedroom. Which one? Charlie. Charlie. The light just went on. Where? In your house. I don't know nothing about that. 
Why did your lights just go on? Yeah, what about it, Charlie? Oh, back off. Hey, how come you're the only one with lights on now? Yes. Why don't you tell us? It's something I'd certainly like to know. To be honest, I'm curious. Hey, come on. You were so quick to kill, Charlie. It was an accident. And you were so quick to tell us who we had to be careful of. Well, come to think of it, maybe you had to kill. Had to? Maybe Pete there was trying to tell us something. <laughs> what do you mean? Maybe he found out something and came back to tell us who there was amongst us we should watch out for. No, no, it's nothing like that. I don't know why the lights are on. I swear I don't. Look, somebody's pulling a gag or something. A gag? A gag, Charlie? There's a dead man on the sidewalk and you killed him. Does this look like a gag to you? No, no, please! I'll get him! Charlie, over here in the house. It must have been Charlie. We gotta get him. Well, we'll take care of him. Charlie, the glass, you're cut. Get behind me. I'll get a bandage. I don't need it. Quick, they're coming. No, all of you, listen. Listen to what? Why should we? You said plenty already. I swear to you, I swear it isn't me. Then who is it? But I... I know who it is. I do! Sure you do. I know who the monster is here. Who is it? I know who it is. It doesn't belong. I give you my word. I know. What are you waiting for, then? Oh, please, Les, come away. Not yet. What are you waiting for? A flash of red? What are you talking about? The monkeys, Les. Remember, you told me about it. The monkeys. I want to hear this. Go in the house and wait for me. I'll go in the house. But I may not be there when you come home. If you just hear me out. Come on, Charlie, come on. Who is it, Charlie? Tell us. All right, quit stalling. Let's hear it. It's... Go ahead. Give us a name. It's... It's... It's the kid. It's Tommy. He's the one. No. How can it be? It has to be. Mom? That's crazy. Crazy. He's a child. He's my little boy. But he knew. He was the only one who knew. He told us all about it, every little detail. Well, how did he know? How could he have known? Can you tell us that, Sally? Yeah, that's right. How could he? Make the kid talk. What about Goodman's car, though? Well, it was Charlie who killed old man Horn. Nobody could argue with that. Just shut him up. But it was the kid who knew what was going to happen the whole time. He was the one who knew. Have you all gone crazy? Stop it, every one of you, now! You better shut up, Brad. Or what? This! Charlie has to be the one. He's just lying to save his own skin. It all adds up now. Where's my shotgun? I'll get the hammer off old man Horn. Maybe Les Goodman is the one. His car started. Let's wreck it before he gets away. What about Brand's radio? He's the one who called him. Smash the radio. Les! Give me the hammer. Something. I got a 22. Stop. 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 Steve, we gotta get out of here. Too late. It's, it's too late. Get Steve and Charlie. They're working together. You better listen to me. It's our only chance. Where's the kid? No, you stay away from us. Mom! Let's go, Tommy. Stay with me. We're going home now. Hey, he's getting away. Leave us be. I can get a shot. You missed. Give me that thing. I gotta aim. Here. What's that? Where? The light over there in that house. It just went on. That's Bob Weaver's place. And it isn't the kid. That isn't the Weaver's house. It's Don Martin's place. I tell you, it's the kid. It's Charlie. He's the one. Hold on, there's lights in the house next door to it going off and on. And that one. And that one. Which one is it? It's all of them. It can't be everybody. It is. Look. Waking on and off. Up and down the block like a Christmas tree about to blow. <laughs> Telephones and throw them in the darkness for a few Earth hours. A few minutes and observe the pattern. This pattern is always the same. 
with subtle variations. They pick the most dangerous enemy they can find. Their own kind. All we need to do is watch and wait. And I take it this place, this Maple Street, is not unique. Well, by no means. Their world is full of Maple Streets. And we'll go from one to another to another. And let them destroy themselves. One by one by one. Time to return to the ship. For now. Tell the fleet we're ready. <laughs> if we even need them. Tools of conquest do not necessarily come with bombs and missiles, with explosions and fallout and invading armies. The most dangerous weapons are simply thoughts, attitudes, prejudices, to be found only in the minds of men. For the record, prejudice can kill and suspicion can destroy, and a thoughtless, frightened search for a scapegoat has a fallout and a contamination all its own. For the children, our children, and those yet to be born. And the vast universal pity of it is that such things cannot be safely confined to the Twilight Zone. Monsters Are Due on Maple Street, starring Frank John Hughes with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Adam Tangway, Mike Aljadef, Tony Castillo, Laura Russell, Linda Ryder, Turk Muller, Rick Komenik, Peggy Roeder, Heather Ann Preet, Sammy Giampapa, Anthony Giampapa, Jeff Lubiton, Don Longo, Carl Amari, Roger Wolski, and Doug James. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. do is play video games on your computer hey I'm in between assignments when I got something to do I'll do it yeah well your next assignment is probably going to somebody else if you spent more time looking at your calendar than that stupid game you know you're missing the editor's briefing <sighs> fine thank you I guess I know politicians. Politicians never point fingers at voters. If anything goes wrong, it's either their opponent's fault or sunspots. Do me a favor. Find another source to support it. Sorry I'm late, Tom. Ugh, Alex. You're always late. Get a plane ticket to San Francisco and rent a car. There's a research lab about three hours up the coast. Something right up your alley. Nanotechnology. Yeah, if it's too small to see, it must be Alex. <laughs> Very funny. Maybe folks can find some new nano humor before I get back. Speaking of which, why am I going to Northern California? There's a guy named Thompson, a researcher, has a PhD in inorganic chemistry. Rumor has it he's found a way to use microscopic robots to clean up oil spills. If it's true, any company with the technology will make billions. Never heard of him. No one has. That's our job. You do know that. That's not my point. I mean, joke all you want about nanotech, but I know more about it than anyone in this building. This guy's off the radar. Yeah, and it gets better. It's starting to look like his venture capital is coming from a consortium of Middle Eastern banks. That means there's big oil money behind this guy, 
And it's possible he may have really pulled this off. That explains his secrecy. Big Oil doesn't like publicity. I didn't say this would be easy. He works out of a private lab off Highway 1. He's right on the ocean. Oh, sweet deal. Look, I don't care what you do in your spare time, but find out something about this guy and what he's up to. I don't suppose knocking on the door and saying, hi, I'm a reporter, what are you up to, is going to work? <laughs> mm, no, no, no. Your usual investigative reporting approach is probably not going to work. That's why we got you hired to work as a graduate assistant on his project. I'm doing what? His lab is crawling with graduate students. We created a fake resume for you and got you hired. You start in three days, so you better get packed. How long am I supposed to work there? Till you have the story. Now, get out of here. What if he asked me to do something scientific? How do I fake that? He won't. He treats his assistants like dirt. I should feel right at home. He won't ask you anything, and he sure won't tell you anything. You're gonna have to do this the old-fashioned way. Now, go catch a plane. Why didn't I stick with restaurant reviews? Meet Alex Harrington, a hack reporter with little talent whose career is defined by things as small as his ability. He's a man in search of the big story, and he's about to find it under the microscope that always shows the truth. A truth that can only be found between a shoreline of dreams and that deep blue ocean of fate known as the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone. And our story, The Nanobots, starring David Pasquese, with Stacey Keach as your narrator. That's good enough for now. Alex, can you shut off the agitation? Yeah, right. Uh, it's this switch, isn't it? Yes. Sorry. What, uh, what's in there today? A blend of motor oil, axle grease, and kerosene. Ah, the sludge du jour. Very funny. Tim, ready for release? All ready. Okay, let him go. Commence release now. Why do they make that sound? We don't know. They just do. It usually starts after they start eating. And what exactly are they eating? We're not real sure, but if it's got petroleum in it, they eat it. No one seems to know much about anything around here. You're right, Alex. And for the record, you seem to be the most clueless man in the building. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna take a little break. Beautiful view, isn't it? Oh, sorry, I uh, didn't see you coming. Yeah, I could stare at the ocean for hours. Uh, Excuse me, can I bum a smoke off of you? You smoke? I wouldn't have expected that. I thought all of you environmentalists were against things like cigarettes. Yeah, well, don't tell anybody. (coughs) I thought so. You're not really a smoker, are you? I guess not. I just, um, I just wanted to talk to you. Hey, you don't have to start smoking to talk to me. You don't seem to be real happy here at the lab? Hey, with the exception of this little balcony where I can steal the smoke, well, there's not a lot going on around here. I like it up here, too. You know, this used to be a naval observatory. It was built in the 30s. Oceanographers used to come up here and study wave action, riptides, and current. And now it's the designated smoking area. Actually, smoking isn't allowed anywhere on the property. Ah, Welcome to California. (coughs) Some of the other grad students are wondering if you're going to stay on. I mean, you really seem dissatisfied about things. Yeah, well, after four weeks, I was hoping I would have made a little progress. Sorry about messing up those statistics. It's never really been a strong suit for me. That's okay. (coughs) How long have you been working with Dr. Thompson? About a year now. Every graduate student wants to work with him. It's a chance to make a difference. Is that why you came to work for him? Yeah, something like that. 
Let me ask you something. Does he ever tell anyone anything about what's going on? Eventually. I mean, eventually he's had to tell all of us a little bit about what he wants to do, and we've been able to understand pretty well the incredible potential for his technology. All we knew coming in was that he was working on a revolutionary new way to save the environment. And that was good enough for you to sign on? Hey, graduate students rarely get any information about their assistantships. Did they tell you something more? No, I guess not. In fact, I know less than you do. Can you fill me in? Look, I'll tell you everything I know on one condition. I'm listening. Well, it's why I wanted to talk to you. Do you want to join us? Hey, in case you haven't noticed, I joined you a month ago. That's not what I mean. There's a group of us. We know what's going on here, and we've decided to take action. So you want to blow the lid off this operation? What are you talking about? All right, maybe I should slow down. What kind of action are you looking for? Okay. <coughs> maybe you should lose the cigarette. Uh, right. Um, I'll, I'll just hold it. Look. Dr. Thompson's a specialist in something called nanotechnology. It's small, microscopic robots that perform certain functions on a molecular level. Believe me, I'm familiar with it. Sorry, of course. That's why we're all here. Anyway, he successfully developed microscopic robots that will consume oil in the ocean from oil spills. That much I figured out. You got any idea how they work? Yeah, I've seen them in action. They look like tiny metal spiders with a tube that extends from the center of their body. Creepy in an elegant sort of way. They're powered by the hydrogen and oxygen in water, and they attack petroleum-based materials and transform them into inert, harmless carbon dust. Then they feed on the carbon to reproduce themselves. Every nanobot reproduces itself by a factor of two and then... Those two move on to repeat the process. Yikes, that means they reproduce exponentially. Yeah, toss a handful of them on an oil spill and in no time there are billions of them cleaning it up. So what action exactly are you and your group going to take? Dr. Thompson keeps delaying the project. Instead of applying for federal approval and implementation, he wants to shorten the lifetime of the bots. He wants to limit their functionality to a few hours but he won't tell us why. So he's trying to dumb them down. Doesn't sound all that profitable. Actually, it's quite the opposite. He keeps saying it's not about profit, but we've figured it out. He's backed by some shady characters. We've seen them at the lab a few times. We think they're connected to oil companies and it's all about the money. Who exactly is we? I can't say other than it's a small group of us. We've been working together for a while and we don't like what we see. So you sit around, have a few beers, and diss the doc? That could affect your grade. It's not about graduate school anymore. It's about justice. It's about the crime of big business. They make money polluting the oceans, and now they're going to make money cleaning it up. Typical big business, big government, big corporations. If Dr. Thompson can make the bots only last a few hours, they could corner the market and maintain exclusive access to the technology and total control. But if the nanobots were allowed to reproduce without limit, well, then it would be a sustainable resource that no one could really own or control. Well, you know, there is something to be said for return on investment. It's not like all this equipment, buildings, and staff are free. This isn't about money. This is about saving the oceans. I don't know how to tell you this, kid, but there's a lot more wrong with this planet than just oil spills. Yeah, but this is not just about oil spills. His nanobots don't just consume petroleum, but petroleum byproducts. What did you just do? I flicked my cigarette off the cliff. Hey, don't worry about a fire. That's the ocean down there. That's just the point. That's the ocean. You're no different than the rest of them. Do you realize the importance of that current down there? A current that comes down from the Sea of Japan, it circles the entire Pacific Ocean, and it's formed an eddy between Hawaii and the west coast of North America. You get worked up pretty easy, don't you? Hey, calm down. It's just a cigarette butt, and that's a big ocean. A big ocean with a big current that's going to take the petroleum-based fiber in your cigarette filter to a large and growing continent of garbage at the center of that eddy in the Pacific. You know, I heard about that. A magazine did a piece on it. Miles and miles wide and 300 meters deep, 
An island of garbage, a floating raft of plastic bottles, old fishing nets, thick slicks of oil, and probably more than a few of your cigarette butts. So one more is not going to hurt, right? No. In fact, look, I'll flick the cigarette out there too. That's not going to hurt either. Not today, not anymore, not after what's going to happen in the next few hours. Why is it I don't like the sound of that? You will. In fact, it'll make you wish you had joined us. What exactly did you want me to join? Right now, there's a group headed for that garbage continent. They took the lab's research boat in the middle of the night, and they're less than half a day away from Garbage Island, just a few hours away from a new world, a clean ocean, and a solution that won't be controlled by robber barons and oil men. What did you do? The nanobots are about to have their first meal. Don't get too close. If we get tangled up in some of those old fishing nets, we'll never get out of here. Sure we will. Once the bots get to work, this raft of plastic trash will be gone. Look at the size of this thing. You can't even see the other side of it. How should we do this? Well, we've got the nanobots in these three test tubes, and if we throw them out on the plastic, the tubes will break and the bots will get to work. But what if the test tubes don't break? I mean, that's a big raft of plastic out there. It's not like we're throwing these things on rocks. Yeah, I didn't think of that. All right, you know what? Open the tubes, and they'll spill out when they land. Let's do this. Okay, you ready? Yeah. All right, on three. One... Two, three! Oh, one of them broke for sure. It doesn't even matter. All you need is one of those things to hit the water and find some plastic and it'll start duplicating. Is anything happening? I don't think it's working. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Do you hear what I hear? Yeah! Go, bugs, go! Look! There's a hole starting to grow right where I threw my test tube. And there's another one over there. The plastic's just dissolving away. Hey, guys, let's crank up the engines and get out of here. <laughs> Mission accomplished. Yeah. So, Mr. Harrington, you've decided to leave the lab. It's not going to look good on your resume, you know? You know, Dr. Thompson, this is going to do more for my resume than you could imagine. You see, I'm not a graduate student. That comes as no surprise. I always thought you were a little old for this position. Besides, your performance here has been miserable. So, what are you? A government mole? Someone from the Pentagon sent to spy on my progress? Actually... I'm a reporter. A reporter? How quaint. I'll have you arrested. You falsified your application. You faked your credentials. You signed a security agreement. You lied and you just admitted it. You don't know who you're dealing with here. If the answer is big oil in your group of Middle Eastern venture capitalists, I'm all over it. Sir, you are a moron. You have no idea what's happening here. That makes both of us. You see... 
There's something you should know. Something I found out about your lab and the activities of some of your graduate students. Doc, what you're doing here is quite dangerous, if not reckless. What I'm doing here is strictly controlled, and it's nothing more than developing microscopic, mindless little machines. Machines with a voracious appetite for petroleum-based products. A thimbleful of my nanobots could have cleaned up the oil spill from the Exxon Valdez in a matter of hours. What I'm doing here will protect us from danger, not create it. So what's the catch? I mean, if this is such a miracle invention, how come you're trying so hard to shorten their life cycle? Would that level of control make them more profitable for you and your investors, Herr Doctor? Mr. Harrington, before I have you arrested, I'll let you in on a little secret. Control of these nanobots is not about financial gain. It's about responsibility and the danger this kind of technology could represent. It's the indiscriminate nature of the little beasts. They'll do a great job on an oil slick, but once that's gone, they could turn their attention elsewhere, such as the fuel tanks of a ship. Wait a minute, they can't tell the difference? How could they? They're microscopic, oil-eating insect machines. You want them to have a brain as well? Maybe in 30 to 50 years, but we're just beginning here. I think you've got a problem, Doc. Oh, I know. But in a few years, I think we'll be able to shorten the life of the bots so they only live for a few hours. That way, we clear the area and cut them loose. When they finish the job, they die. The control will be built in. Control that everyone can manage. That's what this is all about. The nanobots you developed and are testing right now, how long does this current batch live? Potentially forever. That's my biggest problem right now. I wouldn't be so sure. Do, uh, do your graduate students know about this? Some do, some don't. I only tell them what they need to know. You see, Mr. Harrington, this is a Pentagon project. This is about national security, not big oil. My assistants only know what they need to know. Anything beyond that is top secret. And you are about to be placed under arrest. Well, secret or no, I want some answers. Of which you will get none. Now, if you'll excuse me, Mr. Harrington, I'm going to call security. Okay, you do that. But there's one question you're going to have to answer whether you like it or not. And the question is? If I told you some of your graduate students are on a boat and about to release your oil-eating nanobots into the Pacific Ocean, what would your response be? Drifting without power. 
Wait a minute. Look at the ocean. Is that the sea bottom we're looking at? Good God. The water is more than a thousand feet deep in this location. And you can see the bottom. It looks like your little inventions work. Something's not right. The clarity of the water, I don't understand it. CG Mace, we have a ship in distress. Pilot, what did you say? On below. Your research vessel's taking on water. We're gonna have to go in for a rescue. How many did you say were on board? Three. Three young men. It's going down fast. It looks like they scuttled the boat. I don't think they like you, Doc. It's not about me, and they didn't scuttle the boat. It's about the nanobots. Look! The hull of the boat is disintegrating. What's going on? This is exactly what I feared. The hull of the boat is fiberglass, a petroleum derivative. The nanobots don't know the difference. They consumed the plastic garbage until the island was gone, and now they've turned their attention to the fiberglass hull of the boat. That's gonna put a real dent in the boating industry. Mace, this is CG-14. The ship has sunk, and the three people on board are in the water. CG-14, initiate rescue. Roger that. Oh my god, what's happening down there? Oh wait. Mace, CG-14. The boat sank, and the three survivors... They just disappeared. We can see no survivors. The boat went down fast. It must have sucked them down with it. The water's so clear. Oh my god. This can't be happening. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special report. The United States Coast Guard has announced that thousands of distress calls have been received across the Pacific Rim in the last 48 hours. According to the Department of Homeland Security, the alert status in the United States is code red, as a combined Navy, Coast Guard, and international effort has been assembled to deal with the crisis. Latest reports indicate that numerous ships, yachts, and pleasure craft have sunk unexpectedly and abruptly along the entire Pacific coastline. All watercraft are being ordered to stay in port, with the exception of naval vessels involved in the search and rescue efforts. Stay tuned for further reports. So that's the official story? No explanation, no information, just don't go in the water? What do you want us to tell people? Isn't there enough panic for you media types to roll around in? Media types? We're the bad guys? I think you're the one who's got some explaining to do, sir. I have nothing to explain to you. Well, maybe not me, but it looks like you got a small army of graduate students looking for some answers. Is it true? What Tim told us? Is it true? Tim, is he here? Where is he? He's gone. He stole a boat from the marina. He's going out to find his friends. Before he left, he told us what they did. Is that what the news reports are all about? Is that why the lab is surrounded by military police? Military police have surrounded the lab? What's going on here? No one can leave this facility. There are additional researchers en route. We're all going back to work. Work without sleep until we can find a way to stop the nanobots. Until then, we're locked down. You're not including me in this little party, are you? Especially you. We'll accomplish nothing with the additional chaos you'll create. What about Tim? He took off in a fiberglass cigarette boat. Ha! Good man. He doesn't smoke, but he found his cigarette. Mary, Tim is dead. The boat he's traveling in will no doubt encounter a great tide of nanobots, and he too will sink into the deep. Justice, if you ask me. He's the ringleader who caused all of these problems. So, on that happy note, I'm going up to your observation deck to have a smoke. Unless you have a problem with that, Dr. Thompson? Smoke yourself to death. The sooner the better. Will do. And as for all of you, Godspeed and good luck. We'll divide into teams. No one works alone. Progress will be reported on an hourly basis. Excuse me, can I bum a smoke off you? Hello, Tim. 
I heard you were dead. Sounds like Mary did her job. She's one of us, you know. I figured if Thompson thought I was dead, I'd have a better chance. It's one way of looking at it, but a better chance at what? Sounds like you and your friends have done enough. Getting away. Oh, nice. You and your beer-drinking buddies cause thousands of boats to sink, and all you want to do is get away. Yeah, that's saving the earth for you. We didn't know. Thompson told us nothing. We thought the same thing you did, that he was trying to make a world-saving technology. And then we found out it was nothing more than a profit center for the companies and governments destroying the earth. That may be true, but I gotta tell you, Timmy, there's a big target on your back these days. That's why I'm getting out of here. You staying or coming with me? So you're just gonna run away? Do you know what happened to your friends out there? They're dead, you know. I heard the boat sank. There's more to it than that, Timmy boy. Your nanobots can't seem to tell the difference between a plastic bottle and the plastic hull of a boat. If it means the end of plastic on the planet, who cares? You know, you need to work on that attitude. They knew what they were doing was dangerous. Oh, really? Did you tell them that before they left? Did you tell them they might find themselves in the water a thousand or so miles out in the ocean? Why didn't you save them? Was that their punishment? Punishment? You want to hear about punishment? Listen, you hear that out there? That's the sound of billions of your little bugs out in the ocean. But hey, what are they eating? There's no oil slick, no boats out there, but the sound of them. More and more eating and duplicating. Your friends didn't drown out there, Tim, and we didn't abandon them. We watched. Watched as a gray stain in the water enveloped them. Your tiny little spiders consumed your friends alive right before our eyes until there was nothing left but clear water down to a thousand feet. That's not possible. You left them to die. You talked them into it. You're the guy with the big ideas. You sent them out there and they were eaten alive by your little nanobot friends. I didn't know. I didn't know. Thompson never tells us anything. We tested them in the lab. All they ever consumed was petroleum-based products. They only consumed what you fed them. You had them in sealed glass tanks and tested for what you wanted to see. Too bad you didn't stick your hand in there just once. Things might be a little different now. Things don't sound like they're getting any better. We gotta get out of here. We? Aren't you confusing me with your co-conspirators down there in the lab? You stay if you want, but you're gonna die. Look. What the hell? The nanobots. They're crawling up on land. They're consuming the plant life and the bacteria in the sand on the beaches. Anything organic, anything that's carbon-based, they don't know the difference. Tim, we, we have to get out of here. Let's go. No, we can't go that way. They've invaded the lab. You! You! What are you doing here? Marie! What? Close the hatch. Maybe we can keep those things off the deck. Do you realize what you've all done? Look! They're, they're spreading! Those people! The soldiers! The bots are all over them! They're approaching the foundation of the lab! Thompson, how do we get out of here? Unless you can fly, Mr. Harrington. I'm afraid you have no options. They won't get up here. They can't. Can they? No. The foundation and walls of the building are composed of stone, concrete, and steel. They need carbon and water to spread. So it's over. No, Mr. Harrington. I'm afraid it's just beginning. Do you see that creek over there? They're moving upstream. Like the veins and arteries in an organism. Consuming every carbon-based life form in their path across every continent. Out. We have to get out of here. We can't stay here. When Mr. Harrington sprouts wings, maybe he'll take you with him. Thompson, what are we supposed to do here? We wait, Mr. Harrington. You see, all humans are carbon-based life forms. It's not petroleum the bots are after. It's the carbon and the oil. That's the trigger. That's what I was trying to solve. But none of you could wait. So now we wait here. Wait until they move on. Or they die. Yes, that's also an option. Of course, given the fact that they have a life expectancy measured in tens of thousands of long years, that would be a very long wait.
The planet must be saved, and a small group has found the answer. An answer that has left them all with one simple question to ponder. Will we find solutions to our problems or create greater problems with our solutions? No one can tell except for a desperate collection of people standing alone in that land of unintended consequences known as the Twilight Zone. The Nanobots, starring David Pasquese with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was written for The Twilight Zone by Steve Newby. Heard in the cast were Christian Stolte, David Darlow, Joby Cerny, Lisa Wolf, Doug James, Bree Swartz, Steve Newby, and Carl Amari. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Here we have the famous temptress from ancient Egypt, Cleopatra. Her beauty almost brought about the destruction of Caesar, Mark Anthony, and the Roman Empire. And now, if you will follow me, the last group of figures in our little wax museum, the piece de resistance, if I may say so, the most infamous black-hearted killers of all time. This is not for the faint of heart, so <laughs> if there are any who would prefer to stay behind... I don't like this place. Come on, honey. They're made out of wax. But... No? Very well, then. Feast your eyes upon... Jack the Ripper, Henri Landrieu, and the dreaded Burke and Hare. It's Burke who's smothering the poor lady with a pillow, while Mr. Hare assists by holding her feet to the bed. And last but not least, in the sailor's garb, Albert Hicks, about to sink his gleaming axe into the skull of his hapless victim, one Martin Sinescu. Move in, please. They look so real. Closer. Closer. But not too close. <laughs> Allow me to introduce Mr. Sinescu, the curator of Murderer's Row. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry if I startled you. Uh, I, I thought he was one of the dummies. Oh, nothing to be afraid of. Perhaps not, young man. But who can tell? What evil lurks in the heart of the man standing next to you? Go ahead, Martin. Introduce your friends. With pleasure. Albert W. Hicks. Mate on the oyster smack E.A. Johnson. A gentleman. Yet one day, in 1860, off the Atlantic coast, he murdered everyone in his crew with an axe exactly like this one. Why did he go mad? I'm afraid we'll never know. Not to mention Burke and Hare, two more monsters of their time. But do they look like monsters? What torment drove them so late in life to behave like ghouls? You see here how they suffocated their victims. A technique called burking. 
think of the agonies they endured. Which one's he talking about? Search me. Both of them, sir. All of them. Surely it's dreadful to be murdered, as our victim here would tell you, if she could talk. But to commit murder, to take a life with your own hands, again and again, and not be able to stop yourself. Can you begin to imagine the horror? Nope, but uh, why don't you tell us about it? <laughs> I wish I could. But somewhere in the world, now, at this very moment, there is someone who can. Yeah? Who? Well, no one knows yet. But if his torment is great enough, and he kills as these poor creatures did, then future generations will know, for he will end up here, immortalized in wax, remembered as you and I will never be, like Henri Landru, so filled with love and hate. He loved nearly 300 women in his lifetime, spinsters and lonely widows. He too must have felt agony as he strangled the life out of them. A master of the garret, identical to the one you see in his hands. That looks like some kind of cord. That is a piece of string. Let me see that. Get away from there. Get away from there. I was only... Mr. Sinescu is right. The figures are not to be touched. They are too rare and valuable. <laughs> Besides, the museum can't be held responsible for what might happen to you. And here, another soul in torment, the Ripper himself. Of all the faces in London's Whitechapel district, which was his? And why did he feel driven to kill those pathetic drabs with one sweep of his knife? Identical to the blade you see before you. Step closer, young lady. What? Go on. It's only a prop. Lean forward. There. That's quite all right. Look deep into his eyes and remember them so you'll never fall prey to such a man yourself. A man who carried a long, sharp weapon which he slashed across women's throats like this. That knife, it swung at me. It almost... A spring in the arm. Pretty good trick. A trick, yes. But one that serves to remind us how near death is to all of us. When we look at Hicks, at Burke, and Hare, at Landru and the Ripper, we see what appear to be ordinary men. What devils push them to their bloody fate? We can only guess. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Mr. Sinescu. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our tour of Ferguson's Museum. Exit to your right, please. Mr. Martin Sinescu, a gentleman and the curator of Murderer's Row in Ferguson's Wax Museum. He looks after these replicas with care and dedication, and he ponders why ordinary men are driven to commit mass murder. What Mr. Sinescu does not know is that the groundwork has already been laid for a special kind of madness, a torment found only in the twilight zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, The New Exhibit, starring Joe B. Cerny with Stacy Keach as your narrator. There now, Mr. Landrew. Collar turned up just so. Mm. Easy to see why you're a real lady killer. We have to do something about that soon. <clears throat> uh, Martin? Y yes, Mr. Ferguson? I'd um, like to talk to you. All right. I'll be through here in a moment. That can wait. Uh, what I have to say to you is rather important. You know, sir, I, I think Landrew needs a new suit. This one is ten years old and shows it. Something wrong, Mr. Ferguson? Well, yes, and, and no. I, I think we'd better discuss it in my office. 
All right, if you like, sir. Mm. Is it something I've done or haven't done? No, no, nothing like that. Uh, sit down. Uh, very well. Martin, I'm abandoning the museum. Ab abandoning? I'm afraid so. Uh, is this a joke, sir? No. But, but you can't. You mustn't, sir. I know how you feel, Martin, but there isn't any choice. I, I don't understand. I've been offered a large sum of money for this property. Some people want to build a supermarket here. A supermarket? When I first opened the museum 30 years ago, I never dreamed I'd see this day. But the day is here, Martin, and we will just have to face it. Thirty years, sir. No, no, for heaven's sake, don't make it more difficult than it is. I'm sorry. I hate this, Martin. You're the best employee a man could have. The way you've run the Murderer's Row exhibit, why, I, I don't think you ever missed a day's work. No, never. How many more days? None. This was the last. They start wrecking the building next week. What about the wax figures? I haven't decided yet. <gasps> Sir, we can open another museum. We'll move everything somewhere else. I'm not as young as I once was. I could use a rest. But, sir, I'll, I'll do all the work. You won't have to lift a finger. I appreciate that, Martin, but it would be foolish. Foolish? Foolish? Why? We have become passé. People aren't interested in wax museums anymore. Look at the numbers. It's all here. Our attendance figures, our profits, but mostly our losses. This year has been the poorest of all. There's even a news story about the closing of the Grand Guignol. Surely not. The handwriting's on the wall. Seriously, what do we offer? The great lovers of history? The discovery room? Scientists? That isn't why people came here. That isn't why at all. What they really came to see was your murderer's row. We've always known that, but they've been coming in decreasing numbers. And do you know why? Because the evening news offers them fears we could never match. The wars, the atrocities, the perversions, they've all ruined our chamber of horrors. People are blasé. They think they've outgrown the need to be frightened. They already live in fear day in, day out. It's the world, Martin, and the world has changed. No, it would be foolish to open another museum. Maybe it's the location or, or the exhibits. Remember how people came after we installed the Ripper's arm with the knife and the spring mechanism? That was years ago. They're simply not interested anymore. But what's going to happen to them? Landru and Hicks and the others? If I could sell them, I would. But there is no market for wax figures. Mr. Ferguson... You're not thinking of destroying them, are you? I mean, they were meant to live forever. Martin, I tell you, I don't know what I'm going to do. You're forgetting something. Come with me. Martin. Look at Landru. His eyes. Don't you see the shy, frightened little choir boy he once was? The bookkeeper who so longed for freedom. Of, of course, but... Even the cheek feels real, like flesh with pores and the mouth. Isn't it about to say something? Oh, Landru was an elegant man, full of tenderness. It's right here in the lips. The way... What are you trying to say? Mr. Ferguson... You seem to have forgotten that these figures are the work of the great Henry Gilmond, the only ones he created outside of Europe. I haven't forgotten. There was genius in everything he did. They're not just so much candle wax. It's as though they were alive. I'm afraid it doesn't make any difference now. I don't think I could stand it if these figures were destroyed. It would be... it would be like losing five close friends. I won't destroy them, Martin. I give you my word. But where would I store them? You know how vulnerable they are to changes in temperature. I could take them. You? Yes. What would you do with them? I wouldn't put them in an ugly warehouse. I'll tell you that. They need constant care. 
I'll put them in my basement. That's ridiculous. Think about it. What would Emma say to having the figures of five famous murderers in her basement? Oh, she wouldn't mind. She rarely goes in the basement. It's my space. She'll understand. I'll put air conditioning down there and a heater for colder days. Oh, you'll see. I'll take care of them, just as I always have. You haven't eaten your breakfast. I'm not hungry. They should have arrived by now. They'll get here when they get here. Now, how long do we have to store them? Not long. What time is it? You asked me that five minutes ago. Oh, maybe something happened. It's not like moving furniture, you know. They should have let me ride in the truck. What if they dropped one of the crates? There they are now. Just relax. You Monsonescu? Yes, are, are, are they all right? The boxes? They okay. They didn't break, right? Nope. No bumps? No bumps. What do you want? Look, uh, carry them to the rear of the house and, and down to the basement. Uh, careful, carefully. Take your time. Whoa, wait a minute, how much time will it take? I don't know, an hour maybe. You gotta pay by the hour, you know. Sign here. With pleasure, and, and please, hurry. You see? All here, safe and sound. Easy! Please, please, don't jiggle them! Will you stop worrying? It's getting warm. What? I say, it's getting warm outside. They're very delicate. They can't stand more than 80 degrees. I didn't think they were so big. They're not. The boxes are big. The actual figures are not any bigger than you or I. See? Landrew's in the first one. The next is Jack the Ripper. Oh, Emma, I, I, I'm so sorry I got mad. But it's going to be like opening Christmas presents. Mr. Sinesco? Yes? Miller's Appliances. Got your air conditioner in the van. Where do you want it? Oh, good. I'm glad you're here. Look, put it there. There. The basement window. Oh, please. Please hurry. I'll do my best. Thank you. You bought an air conditioner? I had to. They can't stand the heat. How much did it cost? Don't worry about that. Well, I am worried about it. Please. Leave me alone. Just leave me alone with my friends, all right? Now, if you don't mind, I have to go downstairs. Feels cool enough. Now then, gentlemen, Bloody Jack, Jack the Ripper. How are you today? None the worse for wear, I see. Oh my. Cape's a bit shabby, though. Martin, are you down there? Yes, dear. Positively threadbare. Martin! Yes? Are you fussing with the Ripper's cape again? No. Yes. No, no. Uh, it's his hat. His hat is going to need cleaning and blocking before long. I in fact, all their clothes could stand it. It's been almost a year since Mr. Ferguson let me do that. Martin. Emma, li listen to me. The truth is, these men need clothes. But the Ripper here, oh, his are the worst. Part of his coat back's come undone, and, and... Martin! What is it, dear? We're not buying them any clothes. Oh, Emma. Emma, listen. It's not just buying. It's tailoring to fit their bodies. I, I don't care, Martin. Oh, you don't mean that. Yes, I do. No, you don't. Honestly, Martin, you pay more attention to, to those murderers than you ever did to me. Oh, Emma, listen, that's not true. You practically live down there. 
Emma. They're a trust, a sacred trust. These figures were made by Guillemont. They're masterpieces. All right, so they're masterpieces. But you told me it would only be for a few days. Now, they've been here for weeks. I've been nice about it, Martin. You can't say I haven't. How long is this going to go on? I'm sorry, dear. I, really, I, I didn't lie. I, I thought they'd be here only a little while. I really did. But, well, I, I can't find anybody to finance the museum. How can you find anyone if you spend all your time down there? Well, I phone, but... But everyone I talk to never even has heard of Henry Guillemont. Can you imagine that? I, I, what's that? The electric bill. You see how much this air conditioner is costing us, running around the clock? Well, you know how hot it's been. Oh, oh my. That is high, isn't it? I'd like to know how we can go on paying it. Martin, there's no more money in the bank. I know. You mustn't worry. I I promise you, I'll, I'll think of something. There must be somebody somewhere. Mr. Ferguson. No. Why not? You've told me he loves these things as much as you do. Besides, isn't it up to him to take care of them? Emma, I don't know anyone in the world I respect as much as Mr. Ferguson. And I would never trust these figures to him. I couldn't be sure they were cared for properly. I don't even think I could sleep if, if I... So we're stuck with them. Stuck. Emma, it's an honor, a privilege. For you, maybe. But how do you think I feel? I am afraid to go into the basement because of, the, of these monstrosities. I mean, I just about get a heart attack, Martin. The way they stand there and stare at me, they're frightening. <laughs> they're supposed to be frightening. Live with them as long as I have, and you'll come to love them. <gasps> love them? One day, they cease to be strangers to you, and you want to say good morning to them and ask them how they pass the night. And when that happens, Emma, I tell you, Emma? Emma! Emma, where are you going, Emma? <laughs> so, I just don't know what to do. I mean, we can't borrow any more against the house. That's true. There's no chance for a refi without proof of income. <laughs> And then today, when the electric bill came, I realized we've been spending a fortune just to keep the basement cool. You should have told me about this. I know, but I didn't want to bother you. I'm also your brother, remember? Oh, Dave. If only one of those people would loan him the money to open the museum, everything would be all right. Now, Emma, listen to me. Nobody's going to put money into a crazy scheme like that. Old Ferguson knew what he was doing when he sold out, and he was smart getting Martin to take care of those dummies. I shouldn't complain. It's just that you know how much he loved his job, and it was such a shock losing it. Do you want me to help? I didn't come here to ask you for a handout. Don't be silly. We're family. And believe it or not, I've always kind of liked the guy. But what's happening now... It sounds like he could use a few hours with a shrink. I can give you the name of a good one. Oh, Dave, he'd never go. Exactly. So what we've got to do is get Martin away from those things. Does he have them all? Only a few. How come? Ferguson had two or three hundred, didn't he? Yes, but these are special. Some man in Europe made them. Well, they can't be too special if they're not worth anything. They are to him. It's the first time that anything has come between us. I hate those murderers. I'll stop by and talk to him. It won't do any good. Then you talk to him, Emma. But not the way you have before. Lay it on him. Tell him it's those stupid dummies or you. And if that doesn't work, well, there is another way. What? 
air conditioners break down. Emma? Emma? Is that you? Where have you been? Do you care? I know you're angry, but what can I do? I have to keep the figures in perfect condition. I can't let them go, or... Where did you get those groceries? I thought you said we didn't have any money left. Dave gave me some cash. Oh, no. Oh, my, oh, my, oh, my. You told your brother. Martin, we can't go on living like this. I'll borrow some money from Mr. Ferguson. Borrowing isn't going to solve anything. Now, Martin, I know what those figures mean to you, but... But what, Emma? What? I simply will not have them in this house one minute longer. Martin, once they're away from here, you'll be a different man. You'll see. You've lived with wax dummies so long, you've forgotten how to be a human being. No, I haven't. What kind of friend do you think I am? I cannot desert them now, not after all these years. They need me. They'd be lost. Martin, they're not alive. They don't need anybody. I want you to see a doctor. What? A doctor? Yes, just once. What do I need a doctor for? Because, Martin, there's something the matter with you. You haven't been yourself lately. Oh. Well, who have I been then? Well, I'm not sure. Somebody I've never known. But Martin, staying down in the basement all day and talking to those things, honey, it's not natural. I know it's not natural, but it's my job. I'm not the only husband who brings his work home with him. This was your brother's idea, wasn't it? Well, you go back and tell him to mind his own business. So it's hard to know where it's heading. Chances are we're in for another ride tomorrow. And that concludes our broadcast day. This channel will return to the air at 6 a.m. with the early report. Until then, we bid Are you asleep? Good night. God forgive me. It's time for the air conditioner to break. Oh, it's so dark down here and cold. Well, it won't be for much longer. Oh, where's the fuse box? Let's see. Which one is for the air conditioner? I should have brought a flashlight. I can't see a thing. Here it is. Good. What? Who's there? What's happening? Basement? What are you doing? Emma. I asked you not to go down in the basement alone, Emma. I don't want you touching the figures. You leave them to me. Emma. Oh, where's the light switch? Ah, that's better. Emma! 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 Oh, good Lord, what happened? Your throat. For 
the love of Emma. Who, who, who could have, who could have? Oh, you. The Ripper's knife, the blood. Oh, it's so I hate to bury you down here, Emma. I know how much you hate the basement, but I don't have any money. I know I should report it to the police. Who would believe me if I told them you had your throat cut by Jack the Ripper? You just bumped into the Ripper in the dark and his spring arm went off. It was an accident. Besides, if I go to prison, who will take care of the figures? It's better this way. <clears throat> they didn't like you, you know. You said some very unkind things about them, and, and they heard you. You have to be careful around Jack. He has such a temper. I should have warned you. <clears throat> Now for the cement. Oh, poor Emma. But it's too late to tell her anything now. Yes, man. Come back later. <sighs> All right. Hi, Mr. Snesku. I gotta read the meter. Hey, careful of the cement, it's wet. Oh yeah, doing a little patching, huh? Floor must have been pretty bad. Yes, uh, it was cracking. I had to do the same thing. These old houses, holy mackerel! Something the matter? Woo, for a minute there, I thought they were real. How'd you ever get statues like that? Yes, well, they're wax, actually. From the museum, I'm taking care of them. <laughs> Boy, they're the most realistic things I ever saw. You sure they ain't alive? Well, not altogether. Well, you could have fooled me. Should be a fine thing come Halloween. Something like this will really throw a scare into people. <laughs> man, oh man. Even close up, they... What's this? What? Uh, whoever made these thought of everything. Even put blood on a knife. Well, I gotta go. You've got quite a layout here. Hey, tell me something. Yes? Don't they ever give you the creeps? Not when you know them as well as I do. <laughs> You're a real joker, Mr. Sinescu. Wait till I tell the wife about this. Hey, do you think it'll be all right if I bring her over for a look? No. Um, well, I mean, we're going to be gone. I don't know when we're going to be back. Oh, okay. Well, I'll see you next month. Fine. to keep the outside door permanently locked. <sighs> Jack, I'm surprised at you. I really am. How did you manage all those murders without being caught by Scotland Yard? Any killer knows you can't leave blood on the murder weapon. And I don't mean to make a joke, Mr. Ripper. It's a dead giveaway. Life's good as new. Now, now behave yourself. Emma? Oh no, it's her brother. Martin, you in there? Emma? Martin? Where are you? Good luck. 
the basement door. Martin, if you're in there, open up. Now. Martin, are you in the basement? Yes. Yeah, yes. Uh, is that you, Dave? I'm down here. Open the door, will you? I, I, I can't. Why not? I'm painting the stairs. Look, um, uh, give me, give me a second. I'll, I'll go out the cellar door and come in the kitchen. Okay. Where's Emma? Ah, uh, she went out to get some air. Just as well. Mind if I sit down? Why? What do you want? You sit down too. Dave, look, I, 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 I don't have time. I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of something. Now, just tell me what you want. Emma came to see me yesterday. I'm very embarrassed. She told me about it. She did, huh? Well, uh, that'll make it easier. Perhaps. Oh, you two have an argument? Yes. But look, uh, everything is settled now. Glad to hear it. She was pretty upset when she talked to me. I know. You didn't treat her square when you brought those dummies home. That's been changed. Huh. Well, now, I guess I had you pegged wrong. You got rid of them. Yes. <laughs> Must have been pretty hot in here last night, huh? What? For a bunch of wax dummies. Hey, what's that humming noise? I don't hear anything. It sounds like it's coming from the basement. No, is that the air conditioner? I don't know what you're talking about. What are you driving at? Why is this door locked? I told you, the steps are wet from paint. I don't smell any paint. And why is the air conditioner still going if you got rid of the dummies? Well, I thought it might help the paint dry. Yeah? I thought it might get rid of the fumes. Is that all right? This is my house, isn't it? I think you locked it because you don't want me going down there. You better open up. Are you threatening me in my own house? You didn't get rid of those things at all. Where's Emma? Look. I am tired of answering questions. I've had a busy day. I'll thank you to leave now. All right. I don't want to cause trouble for Emma, so I'll go. But have Emma call me when she gets back, here. I will. to bed now. Sweet dreams. Good night. Huh. Locked up tight as a drum, huh? And what's so important down there he didn't want me to see? Ugh. Window's too dirty to see in. So, I guess I'll just have to force it open. Ooh, air conditioner's on all right. Cold as a tomb down here. It's so dark. Oh, let me light a match. <gasps> oh, a dummy in a sailor suit with an axe. Oh, Martin, old boy, you need help. You really do. Ugh, when you look at these two, plug ugly. And two more big ones. Ooh, some knife. Looks real. What the heck? Oh, a shovel? Fresh cement? What is he trying to cover up? Ah, blasted match. Who's there? Who's there? Wait. What the? Where's the axe? 
What's going on? Who's here? Hicks. Where's your axe? Dave. Dave. Oh no. Mr. Hicks. When I took your axe away from you, and put it up in the rafters where you couldn't reach it. I tried to make sure that nothing like this could happen. How did you get it down from there? Why did you take it off the rafter? Martin? Martin! Mr. Ferguson? Mr. Ferguson! Martin, let me in, would you please? Just a moment. Hello, sir. Hello, Martin. Waking you is like raising Lazarus. Don't you answer your doorbell anymore? I, uh, I, I, I was sleeping. Uh, actually, I, I overslept. <laughs> I was, uh, doing a lot of cleanup work in the basement. Hmm. Well, it's nice and cool down there with the air conditioning anyway, right? Yes, sir. How's Murderer's Row? Oh, uh, fine. Fine in, uh, in rare form. Good, let's go see. I would have come two days ago when you first called, but things hadn't been finalized yet. What things? Uh, <clears throat> I must say, you've kept them up well. But I, I have done my best. We get along so well. You don't know what a relief it is to see you. They've been threatening to cut off the electricity because I haven't paid the bill. Think what would happen to the figures. Well, you won't have to worry about that anymore. Oh, mm. I, I knew I could count on you, sir. Thank you. But it, it isn't... Just the electricity. Look at the Ripper's coat. It needs to be fixed. The threads are falling out. Look at all of their clothes. Maybe, maybe it's too humid down here after all. You won't have to worry about that either. Oh, I was going to have Emma repair this little rip in the sleeve, but... You have a remarkable wife. Thank you. There aren't many women who would have put up with an exhibit like this in their basement. She got used to it. You're looking a bit grubby. Have you been sleeping down here? Uh, yes. Oh, I, I, I wanted to show you. I came across an item in this book last night. Martin? I, I, I forgot I even had this. It's got a letter in it written by Landru himself. Martin, listen I'll, to me. I'll read it. But for you whose very walk is beautiful, whose sweet eyes and smile make a just claim to happiness, whither am I bound, my dear little friend, under your tender leadership? Oh, isn't, isn't, isn't that touching? It's the one Landru wrote to Fernand Segre. Ha! Ah, you know it then. He also strangled her as he did all the others. Martin, are you all right? Yes. Well, that, that isn't, that isn't so. I'm, I'm, I'm not all right. Some strange things have been happening. Strange? Yes. You see, my house guests haven't exactly been behaving themselves. Who? Oh, come on now. It's true. I swear, you have no idea what they've been up to. Martin, you've been so close to these figures for the past three months, you're beginning to imagine things. Oh, no. Oh, no, it was not my imagination. Well, that's neither here nor there now. I can't... I can't keep it from you any longer. 
what, sir? The best news in the world. Martin, old friend, when I told you nobody would ever want them, I was being pessimistic. The fact is, somebody does, but not just anybody. The Marchand Museum. Did you hear me? Marchands in Brussels. Aren't you pleased? You won't have to take care of them anymore. I want to take care of them. I know you do, and I appreciate what you've done. But it's all signed. You don't mean that you've sold them? Yes, and for what I'm getting, there will be substantial compensation to you for the years you've put in. But my museum? I was going to buy them. You know you could never do that. Say you have another buyer. I'll get the money somehow. Please, Mr. Ferguson, they're all I have left. Martin, time moves on. There's no longer any need for our specialty. I thought with the closing of the Grand Guignol in Paris that things must be the same in Europe. But Marchand's is actually expanding. They were delighted to make an offer. The transaction was consummated only this morning. But what am I going to do without the figures? I'd die without them. Oh, come on now, man. You'll get over it. Why don't you go upstairs and prepare us a cup of tea or something while I take some measurements? The Marchand people want the exact dimensions. <sighs> All right, Mr. Ferguson. If you're sure that that's how you want it. I'm sure. Very well. Very well. Let's see now. Hicks. Six feet, one inch. And broken hair. Hello there, Landrew. Still holding your waxed cord, I see. Be with you in a second. Now then, Mr. Hare, five feet, ten inches. What? What? of tea. Mr. Ferguson, I don't remember whether you take cream and... Mr. Ferguson? Mr. Ferguson! Your throat! The cord! Why? Did you strangle Mr. Ferguson? And the rest of you? I know you didn't have any part in this, but you didn't stop it either. Landrew, you have gone too far. <gasps> Years. <laughs> you wanted for nothing. I washed you. I cleaned your clothes. I waxed your shoes. <sighs> the air was always the right temperature because I made it so. I defended your deeds against the thousands who came to see you. And when Mr. Ferguson sold the museum, who spoke up for you? Who wanted you? And now what have you done to repay me? Murdered Mr. Ferguson? He was a good man. The books were right. You are monsters through and through and for that I am going to 
punish you. Do you know what I'm gonna do? Do you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna take my saw and I am gonna cut you into little pieces. Then I'm gonna turn up the heat and let you melt into pools of wax. It's no more than you deserve. Who's gonna be first? You, Landru? Because it was you who murdered Mr. Ferguson. It was not I, Martin Sinesco, who strangled your friend. It was you. No. It was you. You killed him while I was upstairs making tea. No, maid, it was always you. With my blade, you murdered your wife. You killed her while I was asleep. You used my axe to kill your wife's brother. Get away from me, Hicks. Get away from me. You are the murderer. Perk, stay back. You are the murderer. You killed them all. You, you, you lie. You're monsters. Not so, Martin Sinescu. No. <gasps> And here is the latest addition to Marchand's Wax Museum. Murderer's Row. Complete with its newest cast member, Martin Lombard Senescu. A remarkable and most versatile man. Who knows what thoughts went through his mind as he dug the grave for his wife, Emma, whom he killed with a knife. His brother-in-law, David, whose skull was split with an axe. And his friend and employer for 30 years, Mr. Ernest Ferguson. We'll never know. We can only guess what fierce devils tortured Seneski's soul and drove him to his destiny. But he has taken his place with the infamous and depraved. Next to Albert X, Burke and Air, Landru, and Jack the Ripper himself. This way, please. The new exhibit became very popular at Marchand's, an instant hit. But of all the figures modeled so lovingly in wax, none was ever regarded with more dread than an American named Martin Lombard Senescu. There was something about the eyes, people said, dazed, vacant, as if he had seen too much and come to understand it a moment too late. But they shouldn't have been surprised. It's the look one often gets after a quick walk through the Twilight Zone. Exhibit, starring Joby Cerny with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and Joby Cerny, and written for the Twilight Zone by Jerry Soule and Charles Beaumont. Heard in the cast were Jim McCants, Nancy Baird, Richard Hensel, Nick Sandys, Tom McElroy, Christian Stolte, Damian Arnold, Roderick Peoples, Craig Harris, Martin Aestrom. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design and custom Foley effects for the Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Michael Slabach, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com.